What's up, guys? It's yo boy Omni Sensei back with Reborn in Naruto as a Bido Ichiha. Part 6. If you enjoy my content, consider subscribing to the channel. Like the video, share, and leave a comment. This really helps with the algorithm. Remember to check out the author of this fantastic fanfic. Link in the description. Also, I have set up a Patreon account, consider joining to support the channel and for more exclusive content. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. Right after the match with Guy and Kenshi, the audience was in an uproar of cheer, while the shinobis that were present were impressed by the battle. It wasn't a battle per se, because right after Guy opened his gates it was basically a one-sided beatdown. Kanoha really has some talents this year don't they? The lightning daimyo said, getting a nod from the others. Unlike the lightning cage, he came here to watch the exams. He has two goals in mind, one was just to enjoy his stay in a forging land, but the other was a bit different the land of Kumagakur was ruled by the monarchy system. It was never a problem, but recently the shinobis from there were getting ideas of merging the cage with the daimyos. It meant disaster for the lightning daimyo. Even though he knew the trachage wouldn't take these kinds of steps now, but what about in the future that's why he also came here to find talents. And it seems that Kanika was filled with those. Another war would start soon, and seeing this he thought it would be better for him to stay natural with Kanoha. But his chain of thought was broken by someone. Here is an it would be wonderful if he can be groomed to be the one of the next 12 bodyguards. It was the fire daimyo who spoke, and he did so ever casually. And that made the lightning daimyo, the old man was stealing his catch. Come on, old man don't hog all the talents for your guards I was thinking of getting him under me. The fire daimyo chuckled, not minding the lightning daimyo's dot. I might not be in this world by the time he gets appointed, but my son would thank me for it he said, and I dare say that the rakage might not approve of it, the lightning daimyo snorted, like I needed his approval. Minato was getting cold feet watching the daimyo douch over his student. Guy might be on his team for a short while, but he cared for him just like his other students. Hiruzen didn't say anything in this matter, it was quite common for him. And he would be a fool to give a talent like Guy or Rin, to be one of the daimyo's lackey. But he was interested in what the lightning daimyo said about the rakage. There was some bad blood between them, surely he could take advantage of that matter. And he knew just the guy for it. The last match was between Ku and Dadara, and it was kind of boring. The explosion release user not putting up that much of a challenge to the son of the Tsuchikic. The boy didn't even have to use any of his special jutsus against him. Heck it Water M wasn't even a real battle, as it was obvious that Dadara let him win. Abito wondered why he didn't quite like the Uzumaki sisters but he didn't care that much. Abito was a bit disappointed that he didn't see any dust release jutsus. Abito knew for a fact that Anoki had taught his son this Keke Tota, but it seemed that he was saving it for the last. Now these contestants will go on to the next stage of the exam. The announcer said, as the screen showed the four remaining contestants. Abito, Rin, Guy and lastly Mew. You will be given five minutes break before the match starts. The announcer said, as it showed the matchups. Abito vs Mew Rin vs Guy, and the first match was going to start with his. Abito grinned, he didn't know that he would get so many boons in the exams, first was Pakura. And if he played his cards right, he could still get the rest of the gravity jutsus, and lately the dust release jutsu. He already has the elements necessary for it. He wasn't going to lie, one of the coolest things of the Naruto world was dust release or particle release. And he was damn excited to copy that shot with his Sharingan. It was a one-hit kill move, of course he would want it. The five monitors were up, and Abito and his opponent made it to the stage. While the Achiha had a carefree expression, Mew had a serious one. And like always as Abito entered the stage, the crowd erupted in an uproar, of course Abito didn't forget to wave his hand as he entered. He did have an image to hold. A lot of the Achiha clan members were here to watch the match. It was the clan's first time that one of them was chosen to represent Kanoha. After Madara deserted the village, the seeds of distrust were sown. But now things were at a turning point. And even though Abito looked carefree, he was a bit nervous. He didn't want to mess things up. 
Not that he would let those emotions show in his face. The two shinobis stood across each other as they got ready for battle. I haven't forgotten your favor Ku said, he was the first one to break the silence as he cracked his knuckles. I will be sure to return it. Huh. Do I know you Abito said, scratching the back of his neck. Before he made a recognizing face, huh. I remember aren't you the guy that I one shoted? He said his face twisted in a nasty grin. I mean it's hard to remember every other guy that seemed to tick the stone shinobi off oh did I hurt your feelings, what are you going to do about it, Abito said getting under his opponent's skin even before the fight started. Complain to your daddy cage well after I'm done with you, you will start calling me daddy, why you, but before he could do anything the announcer stopped it. Even he was trying to hold back his laughter and the sum of the audience didn't hold it. Laughing at the boy. Some of the daimyos doing the same, much to the annoyance of the Tsuchikich. Though the old cage felt a shame that his son getting riled up so easily. The first round of the semi-finals will now begin. Are the contestants ready both sides nodded. Then let the match begin, the moment he said that the stone shinobi moved from his place, appearing right above Abito, bringing his feet down from above. Only to meet the empty air, as his feet landed on the ground creating a crater. Well, someone is eager Abito mused as he stood a couple of feet away from the spot. Ku didn't say anything, and quickly threw multiple shurikens at Abito's direction. The Achiha didn't react that much, and coolly walked forward calmly dodging the bladed weapons thrown at him. Come on bring out the big guns with that his figure became a blur, appearing right in front of Ku, kicking the boy in the gut, making him fly up in air. But one could see chakra cable connecting him to Abito, and Ku found himself tied up by the cable. Fire style? Dragon fire jutsu. The chakra wire connected them, made for a good conductor for the fire jutsu. As it made its way to Ku. Blazing flames right at his target. The stone shinobi was eyes winded from the last attack, and seeing a follow up he panicked, and quickly cut of the wire before casting his own jutsu. A simple wind style jutsu to push him away from the trajectory of the flames. He quickly cast the lightweight rock jutsu to make himself float. He already had some sweat from that sudden attack, while Abito just stood at the ground relaxed and amused. Boy come down this instance, don't make me go up there, MR. Abito said, clearly amused, and he had his Sharingan active under his shade to steal off the jutsus. It was hard for other people to see if he had his dejutsu active or not, due to the glasses he wore. It also made the enemy confused at the same time. Ku was going to say, but he was cut off by what Abito did next. Earth style? Lightweight rock technique. And the stone shinobi was flabbergasted as he floated up in air, standing right in front of Abito. Nice jutsu by the way. The Achiha said. How did you copy my jutsu Ku said. How how could he Ku obviously knew the Sharingan could copy jutsus. But that was for easier ones. Not all jutsus could be copied, even if that wasn't a Kekei Genkai. Oh, you mean our jutsu. Tougher jutsus that needed a lot of practice couldn't be copied by the Sharingan. His father and even their second cage used this jutsu in the battlefield, and there was never an Achiha that could copy it. Anoki had a similar reaction. Of course, Abito had already copied the jutsu before, and practiced it for a while to get a hang of it. But others didn't know that. While Ku and Anoki were dumbfounded, the Achihas in the stadium looked at Abito with pride, some even activated their own Sharingan to copy the flight jutsu. But his thought process was cut off when, Abito suddenly moved in air. It was as if he kicked of the air, like solid ground and appeared right before Ku, and engaged in a rough jutsu battle. Of course, this is because Abito wanted to try something out. The stone shinobi was careful to not look him in the eye. But there were other sources which the Achiha could use to gain an advantage. And that was his sound release Jinjutsu and his fear toxins. After getting direct training under the old Bat Lady, his control over the effects over his fear toxins increased dramatically. Now he could make his fear toxin have full control over the victim's emotions. Or even target one emotion in particular. As the previous fight with the Mist Shinobus had made Abito saw a flaw in the technique. And with that he came up with an idea. What if he could make his fear toxin target anger or other emotions, rather than only fear? It was a side effect of fear toxin, but what if he could make it primary? Both fear and anger makes people make rash decisions. But one could suppress his fear. 
and most skilled shinobis could. Same could be said for anger. But in his opinion he thought controlling anger would be harder, and victims will suspect less that they were in some kind of outside influence. So he discovered a way to do just that. And in the short Tejutsu fight, he easily produced some of his tweaked vision of fear toxins from his palm before hitting him in the face. Making it take effect. He didn't want the poor boy to shit his plants in fear in front of the audience. As his trump card might be outed that way. So this will do for now. Ku on the other hand was obviously getting overwhelmed and retreated and cast another jutsu. Earth style? Rock bullet jutsu. With that, he spat out several bullet-like rocks toward the Achiha. And much to Ku's irritation, Abito copied the jutsu, countering it. Ku didn't back off either, casting a wind jutsu that Abito also copied. Abito didn't even give Ku a chance. Copying and countering any jutsus the stone shinobi thrown at him, while he reviled his large arsenal of jutsus. Using his clan's famous fire release, enlarging the effects with his wind jutsus. It all made it very hard for the stone shinobi to keep up. Not to mention that Abito also used a few showy lightning and water style jutsus while he was at it. And sure enough, his showcase of using the five elemental jutsus brought awe and cheer from the audience. Even though, it didn't affect the stone shinobi that much, other than being overwhelmed with the sheer number of jutsus. It had other effects. It was all to rile up the audience. As they cheered for Abito. It was obvious to the shinobis in the crowd that Abito was putting on a show while fighting a powerful stone shinobi. Even though to the audience the stone shinobi looked ridiculously weak, but to the trained shinobi, they knew better. Ku was no ordinary shinobi, no he was much better than any average genin. Heck, there was no doubt that he was jonin level. But Abito was just better. And Anoki fled deep shame that his son was being toyed with by another kid that was even younger than his own kid. Even Hiruzen and Minato was surprised at how easily he was dealing with the stone kid. Ku was skillful there wasn't any doubt about it, the kid could give a run to your average Jonin. Yet Abito dealing with his just fine. Why you stop stealing my juts as you leave bastard Ku braked in frustration. His anger getting the better of him. Not knowing that he was getting riled up also because of the side effects of Abito's fear toxin. Abito stopped and blinked, oh thank you for the compliment. He said, in a mocking way. But you should know I can do anything you can, and do it better unless of course, you use something that I can't. Ku's mind raged with fury. The effects of his fear toxin and the continuous taunts getting the better of him. Oh you will wish you didn't say that. With that, the stone shinobi hovered a bit above Abito, making a few hand signs before clapping her hands and pushing her open palms forward. Particle style. Atomic dismantling jutsu. A bright white light appeared in front of the stone shinobi's hands, before it made a square-like structure, expending suddenly in lengths towards Abito. The Achiha felt the danger radiating from the attack and didn't stand still. Thanks to his active Sharingan he was able to get a deep look into how the complex jutsu worked. He quickly charged up a Rasengan throwing it towards the expanding the square. As it detonated into a small blast, his Rasengan clearly getting engulfed into the particle release attack. But it was enough for Abito to get away from the danger zone. Above Ku was panting a bit after using the particle style. Unlike his father, he didn't have a mature chakra pool large enough to use the particle style in succession. Even just one attack took a quiet out of him. The boy came down standing above one of the erected stone pillars in the arena. Looking down at his opponent. Well, is that all you have Abito shouted from below as he charged up a Rasengan while one of his clones stood to his side, gliding his hands over the energy ball. Cause, I ain't finished. Ku wasn't worried, seeing the attack. He had dealt with Abito's Rasengan before. But it wasn't the same attack. Not that he could do anything, other than stand there. He needed to recover his chakra, and Abito's attack didn't worry him on bit. Wind chakra started gathering around the normal Rasengan. Until it is completely mixed with it, creating a dangerous ball of condensed chakra and the sound coming from it was vibrating the air. Now, let's see if you can eat this swine style. Rasen Shuriken. Impossible, Jureya said, spitting his drink and seeing the amazing work on display. H he managed to do something that even Minato couldn't. Not believing his eyes. Arachimaru on his side looked at the power on display with interest. There was a slight glint in his eyes. 
so the brat still can surprise me. The snake san and chuckled internally. On the other hand, the shinobis in the audience, epically those were from the Achiha clan or the Hyuga clan, had activated their dejutsus to get a good look at the jutsu. And they were awed by what they said. The synergy in chakra was amazing, and not to mention the radiating danger from it. It was a pure display of chakra control. Some of the Achihas wanted to copy the jutsu of Minato before. But now seeing this one of their clan members not only use the jutsu, but improve it. They were quite surprised. A particular young Achiha was looking at the display of power with awe. Shisui couldn't believe what he was seeing, even without his dejutsu he could feel the power radiating from it. Kakashi on his side, also felt his blood boil with excitement. Abito had suppressed him. But he wasn't going to stay behind. Above the stadium, an old man and a young blonde looked at Abito with pride on their face. While old Cage was proud at the future generation. The Namikaze was excited that his student had done what he couldn't. He was dumbfounded that Abito had managed to do it. With a clone that was the answer. Minato found the glaring flaw of adding nature transformation into his jutsu. That was it was way hard for him to do it alone. And of course, he was surprised that someone found the answer. And it was his student no less. There was of course underlying jealousy there, but he promised himself that he would find a way to add chakra nature to the Rasengan, his own way. He wouldn't be left behind. Though Minato was really impressed with Abito's outside way of thinking. Not knowing it wasn't the Achiha who came up with the solution. Wine style? Rasen shuriken. The howls of wind blew as the chakra ball neared Ku. It seemed as if a storm was compressed in the jutsu. So the stone shinobi didn't hold back and quickly used his own jutsu. Particle style? Atomic dismantling jutsu. Abito threw the ball of wind chakra infused Rasengan at Ku, while the stone shinobi stood above the stone pillar using his own jutsu. Of course, Abito didn't need to use this jutsu. And he wasn't doing this to only show off either. He wanted to get a detailed view of particle style, and seeing it one time with his Sharingan was not enough. Even with a few of his clones mixing in the audience to get the jutsus from different angles. That's why Abito wanted Ku to use the jutsu again good thing he did. The two jutsus clashed in between, creating a loud explosion with white energy expanding and destroying anything it touched. Abito and Ku quickly backed up from their position to avoid getting hit by the white blast. It created a massive gust of wind that blew around the stadium, making the audience cover their eyes, except a few Dejutsu users. Who were already half-blind due to the explosion being a stunt grain to their eyes. Some of them were clearly in pain there. When the dust cleared, they could finally see the destruction. And it was devastating, taking a large chunk of the stadium from the middle. People were awed at the display of power. How did that type of power make sense in the hands of mere genins? The few shinobis wondered. While the daimyos were quite excited to see the grand display of power there. Some even putting on sunglasses not miss anything. The wind daimyo in particular was quite surprised that someone from Konoha could use that level of wind jutsu. Not to mention that he was just a child. Abito stood in a corner of the stadium, dusting his clothes casually. While Ku was panting in the air. The fight wasn't finished yet, but just then Abito picked up a baseball-sized rock and threw it at the stone shinobi. Hitting the boy in the jaw, breaking some of teeth, and knocking the kid out. Before he could do anything, as he fell into the stadium floor. The fall damage also taking a toll. But the body of a shinobi was strong enough to handle that. The audience was again dumbfounded on how the match ended. It was completely anticlimactic. But Abito didn't see any other way to finish the match. He couldn't kill the kid, cause of Minato's warning. Also, the fact that in future Konoha might work with the other nations to fight Madara. And killing the son of a cage would do no good in that interaction. Abito coughed loudly, looking at the announcer, politely motioning two of his hands toward his unconscious opponent. A stone shinobi well done, with his pride crushed as a side dish. Ih Abito Ichiha has won the match. And he goes to the finals. The announcer said, snapping out of the daze. The voice of the announcer made the audience get out of their own daze and cheering the young Ichiha on. The crowd roared in cheer seeing the battle. Every one of the villages felt pride in seeing the small Ichiha take the win. Especially the Ichiha clan members that came to watch the match. Even though some of their members got temporarily blinded in the process. 
They all made Abido up to be the next Madara Ichiha. One that wouldn't snap hopefully. Abido made it backstage after basking in the glory of his victory. He was doing this to put on a show. It wasn't like he was an attention whore or anything. As the Achiha made it backstage, it soon became clear that an awkward situation had occurred. Both of his teammates had gone to the semi-finals and would face each other. Yeah. It was awkward. Abido tried his best to ease up the mood. But both his teammates seemed to a bit hesitant. And not to mention the fact that one of them will face Abido in the finals. Yeah, it was quite awkward. I really feel sorry for you guys Kakashi said, musing at the situation. How did he always appear at the worst time? Sucks to be you hey, that's mean Rin said, frowning. But the boy shrugged. It was kinda getting awkward for him as well. As he was standing the corner for a couple of minutes to make his entry. You speak as if you can beat my move Abido said, raising an eyebrow. Kakashi shook his head, of course there's a reason why I'm a Chunin, and you are not. He said, clearly humble about the situation. Also you need your clones for your jutsu that's just lame. Dude you are an Inuzuka ripoff who uses a dog blade. You're just jealous that you don't have a cool doggy like mine. The boy retorted. Rin sighed, getting annoyed by their squabble. Both of you stop. And Kakashi behave. And he sure did. Guy chuckled a bit before it transformed into a full-blown laugh. It making all the four shinobus laugh as well. After some time all of them stopped and Abido spoke. Hey, whatever happens let's not forget why we are doing this Abido said with determination. He continued. For our friends. To protect the people we care about. Abido said. We gain strength not to for the sake of it, but to save our loved ones form danger. Always remember that. All the other three nodded. Especially the future opponents. Rin and Guy. Sure both wanted to prove themselves. But it wasn't the main reason. They sought out strength to protect their loved ones. With that, all three of them made a promise to themselves that whatever happened, they would remain as they are. Guy and Rin stood facing each other. Each braced themselves for the fight that was about to begin. Though they seemed to be a bit red on the face, as if embarrassed. Well the reason was simple, up in the stadium. Two people were having a cheering competition. One was a similar green spandex wearing man, might die. Cheering his son on, with a large poster. Also known as the strongest jutsu user. Yes, it did happen. After training under Might Dai for so many years, he made a proposal to the Hokage directly to evaluate the ranking for Might Dai. At that time, Hiruzen humored the boy. And tested Dai out on Tajutsu, but was very much impressed by the man's performance. And so Might Dai was promoted directly to Jonin based of Tajutsu alone. And as the man loved living the village instead of going on missions. It seemed he liked teaching more and fighting like a martial artist, rather than killing opponents using sneaky tactics. He became a teacher in the academy not long after. There was even a branch of specialization in Tajutsu now, due to it. No one doubted his strength. Not when Hiruzen personally evaluated his rank. And now he was cheering his son with the passion of youth burning bright. Embarrassing the boy in the process. While the other was Kashina was cheering her student on, with her own flags. Made of chakra paper and fuinjutsu ink. And seeing each support the opposite, brought about a certain competition in between them. The second round of the semi-finals will now begin. Are the contestants ready the announcer said, while both parties nodded. Let the match begin. With that the announcer disappeared, leaving the two Kanoha Shinobas behind. But unlike the previous fight, both of them didn't move immediately. They stood still for a while, aying each other. Let's give our all, Rin. Guy said, taking his Tajutsu stand. He was prepared for the fight. To conserve energy for the next fight, he didn't even wear the weights. He would go all out and try to end the match soon as possible. The girl nodded. Before her figure became like water, dropping to the floor. Guy blinked when he mumbled, looking around. And when he found Rin's figure, he was a bit late. Rin was crouched down and had already placed not one but two storage scrolls on the ground. And with a poof large amount of water erupted out of the storage seals, flooding the arena. As the uncontrolled water came out of the scroll, Rin didn't waste time to go through hand signs for a simple water controlling jutsu. Water style. Demolish wave. Guy wasn't standing still either, the moment he saw Rin, he ran towards her with great speed. 
but the water stopped him a bit before he jumped over it and kicked the air with his gepo, heading towards Rin's location. But before he could, he suddenly felt danger from beneath him. And quickly dodged to the side as a couple of water spears erected out of the flooding water attacking guy. The boy had to go up even above the air with his air walk to not get hit. But when he was above, he still couldn't see where Rin was. The clever girl had hit himself using the water. Guy quickly stood at one of the erected stone pillar to see where she was. But what he didn't expect was the rock pillar to suddenly shake before it started falling to the water in an angle. It was the same for all the stone pillars as they fell into the water. Guy didn't go down, choosing to stay in air with his air walk. The water had changed to a green color from its natural blue. And he suspected it was acid water. And sure enough, he saw a giant clam resurface from the water with Rin standing about it. Though, for some reason, she didn't seem to be wet. Guy moved immediately towards Rin's location, kicking his target, only to meet air as he passed through the water. The boy wasn't careful, and it seemed like he hit a water clone version of Rin and her summon. He was freaked out that he might be touching acid water. But other than feeling a bit dizzy he didn't feel anything burning. Strange. But the boy didn't pay attention to that and looked around, only to see multiple Rin and clams in different locations. You know in a head-on fight you will win. One of the Rin said. But that's if I fight head-on. Another Rin said. And with that, all of them used the same water whip technique and started aiming for Guy. The spandex-wearing boy was getting overwhelmed and was frantically searching for his opponent. His headache was getting worse. Only then did he get an idea of what was going on. The water wasn't acid water like the previous fight, no, it might have some kind of sleeping agent mixed with it. That was making the boy's head spin a bit. And it was getting worse. The relentless attacks for all the Rin clones made it hard for Guy to find the real one. While the water that was splashing on his skin was making him sleepy. It seems that I can't hold back. Guy muttered, holding himself in the air, with Geppo. But he was rather thrilled in what his teammate was doing. It was cunning. But it was no time to get impressed with the girl. Gate of opening, gate of healing and gate of life open chakra erupted from Guy's body as his pupils disappeared, his hair standing up and bulging veins all over their body. With the newfound power, it seemed easy to resist the effect of a sleeping agent. He used Geppo to launch himself in air and started spinning like a ball. Rank Yaku. The boy called out. Rank Yaku is a powerful projectile technique. One of the techniques that Guy had learned the concept from Abido. And perfected. As Guy spun, he kicked the air at very high speeds and strength, which results in a sharp compressed blade of wind, raining down on the water pool below. Rin was white-eyed, as he quickly hit herself inside her summon. While the other clones disappeared. But even with that, the powerful generated wind blade was enough to damage the clam enough to form a crack. And with a poof, the clam was gone. The summon beasts depending on loyalty wouldn't leave its master even if it died. Or it would disappear just by getting a bit hurt. And Rin couldn't bond with her summon in a short moment and so her summon left her. Making her vulnerable. But Guy seeing it stopped his onslaught and started heading towards Rin with him powering back down. He was still trying to conserve his strength for the next round. Rin, panicked, she needed to do something. And fast. And an idea hit her. She quickly ran through hand signs. Water vine jutsu. Guy was suddenly struck mid-air by multiple water vines, which some of them he avoided. But unfortunately, he couldn't avoid all of them, but he wasn't scared. He just needed to get out and find Rin, and the fight would be over. But wind style? Great wind breakthrough. Rin said, as the cold wind hit the water where Guy was trapped in. Freezing its solid ice as it made its way toward their target. He Tejutsu user was white-eyed and had to open his gates at the last moment to get out before he was frozen solid. Guy quickly speed towards Rin and punched the girl in the gut, knocking her out. But he caught his teammate before she could fall. He wasn't going to lie, that fight was one of the most trickiest. And he had to use a significant portion of his strength to fight her. But that made him respect the girl even more. When the announcer declared the winner, many of the audience cheered seeing the odd tojutsu in display. While some of them booed Guy for hitting a girl. It seemed that waking up, Rin would find her own fan base. While this was happening, two people looked at Rin with glints in their eyes. 
The Mizukage didn't like the girl having the clam summon, now she was using an off-handed version of the Yuki clan jutsu. He would need to look into the matter and eliminate the sprout before it could grow into a full tree. His attendant Meitarumi also thought the same. Abito on the other hand was super amazed at what Rin had done. She gave quite a challenge to the Tajutsu user. Also, he was quite impressed that she managed to do that with holding back. She didn't use her clam to change the water to acid water like before. Only using a sleeping agent. Granted the sleeping agent was quite strong. He had to give her credit for that. She might even take Ashina's spot in future as the strongest Kanoichi in the future, with how she was progressing. Minato also felt proud for both of his students. The performance of Guy was within his expectation. Even though he mentored the boy for a short while, he knew about Guy's capabilities. But Rin on the other hand was different. Clearly, she performed way better than he expected. And he was proud of that. She might lack the brute strength, but she can cover that up with her ingenuity. Anoki on the other hand was quite pissed about the matter that kids in Kanoha could fly. How did that happen? Flying in Stone Village was considered one of the pinnacle of ninjutsu, and here kids seemed to do that. He understood the Achiha, cause of their freaky eyes. He was of the same bloodline of Madara, what else did he expect? But now a civilian kid with no background was using a flying technique based on pure tajutsu. How did that work? He was utterly dumbfounded in the strength that Kanoha Jenins were showing. Not to mention they will be a threat to his village later. He felt a headache already. When Rin woke up, she gasped. And quickly came to regret it, her stomach hurt like it was on fire. But why oh then she remembered that she had lost to her teammate. The girl sighed. So, she wasn't there yet. She wasn't being ungrateful or anything, the improvements she had made were astonishing. And she loved it. But there was still that eerie feeling that she could never catch up to her teammates. Stop overthinking things. A voice said, sighing. It was Kakashi, who just closed his book to get a look over his teammate. And you did amazing your powers could even give me a run for my money. And I am not joking the girl blinked, when did he get here? But as he heard the boy talk, she could only nod. She was strong but needed to get more stronger, maybe then she could yes, of course, then she wouldn't have to worry about being left behind. Also Abito and Guy wished you a fast recovery. Even though one of them was at the fault for it. The mask shinobi chuckled. Guy even thanked you for not using acid water on him, he seemed a bit scared of the acid for some reason. And Abito also said you were quite smart for figuring out a variation of the ice release. Rin's cheeks burned. Wow. She wasn't used to getting this much praise. But it was just a rip of version of ice release, nowhere near good as the original one meh, details honestly, it was pretty cool. No one would actually think that a normal water prison jutsu could become a nice prison one. They would be shattered before they know it. Kakashi chuckled at his own joke. While Rin had to agree he had a point. Shikinda didn't have the concept of mixing of elements there. After Abito gave her the scrolls, it had a theory on how a fake version of ice release could be created. And so she tried it, and fortunately, it worked. Though, he needed to practice the jutsu more if she wanted to use it in combat. She knew why all three of her teammates were stronger. They had been training since birth. Guy and Abito trained since they were little. Not to mention who their teacher were. One was taught by the Kagami of the Crow no less, while the other was trained by a Tajutsu expert. It was the same for Kakashi, he was trained by Sakumo. But she just started her training with Kashina. And if given time, she was sure she would catch up to her teammates. No, she will suppress them. And now you are inner monologuing about overcoming your said teammates by working too hard, Kakashi said with a flat expression. Before his lips curled up, breaking into a laughter. With that the girl's cheeks burned. Why was he still here just to tease her? But why but it was then the room shook a bit. Um what was that? Rin said, but she didn't need the answer when she felt the energy signature. Kakashi frowned, so they aren't holding back hope the stadium holds up the boy muttered, before going back to reading his books. And no, you won't be getting out of the room. You have internal bleeding, and you exhausted your chakra so don't even think anything. Uh come on. She said, as she was stopped before she could get out of bed and sneak away. Glaring angrily at the silver-haired boy, though she did felt a bit good that someone was taking care of her. It felt good for some reason. 
Oh, Rin, there you are it was Kashina, who was smiling brightly at her student. Back in the stadium, the final match was announced. As both friends and rivals faced each other. The stadium was in awe even before the fight started. Even the daimyos were quite excited for the fight. Though Minato had brought special anvas into the room for some extra protection. He had a hunch that it might be needed. The Mizukage and the Tsuchikage felt a bit awkward about the situation. Their fighters getting eliminated in a humiliating way. And they called Konoha a peace-loving nation. Even though most of the times they had the same contribution in starting the war. The Tsuchikage in particular was very angry at the Acheha. And also quite tense about how he may progress in the future. He might become the next Madara with how things were going. And he would have to step in and stop it before it went that way. The Mizukage felt a similar way regards to Rin. As she had shown skills that could even put the water jutsu prodigies in his village to shame. He would need to take care of her as well. And not to mention the green spandex wearing boy who was able to beat her. Even Arachimaru and Jurero were quite interested. They had intuition on who would win, but they knew it wouldn't be that easy. Kagami also sat in between the Achiha clan. He had to make a quick errand for Lady Mito, catching a blonde in the run. But now that was sorted out, he could finally enjoy the match. And he was quite excited about the match. The same thing couldn't be said for Mike Dai though. His both students were fighting. And for this one, he would support no one. Abito was just like his son, so he couldn't favor Guy over him. That wouldn't be right. Also, he felt passionate about the youthfulness of the competition. Both of his students turned out to be outstanding. And he loved it. He wished both of them good luck as the match started. Are the contestants ready? Both of them nodded, smiling at each other. Both taking the same fighting stance. Then let the final match of the Chunin exam begin. This time the announcer couldn't even fully get away from the stage as both of the genins punched at each other. Their fists meet each other's fists, creating a small explosion. While Guy was wearing his chakra-enhanced brass knuckles, Abito was wearing his armament gloves. Both of their smiles turned into a competitive grins. No need to hold back. This was on. And so the fight of the year begins. As the stadium stood still in awe and anticipation, the only sounds that could be heard were from fists crashing into each other. First, the fight started slow, with basic tojutsu. But it soon advanced. Guy used his knuckle busters punch, while the Achiha returned it just as furiously with his armament gloves. Sparks and wind blew as both of them punched each other. Avoiding, defending or even countering. All the audience were in awe at the display of strength that the kids were generating. When Guy used his nunchucks, Abito used his flamed kunai. Though now that a few minutes past the fight was getting serious. Though it soon was realized that it was basically unneeded. As both of them trained with each other for so long, knew about each other fighting style. Both prodigies in combat were having a hard time facing each other. Let's now hold back, friend. Guy said, fourth gate of pain and fifth gate of limit open. Now you stand no chance. As he had previously opened three gates beforehand. Ha hey, I know the same trick. Abito smirked, making Guy's eyes widen as the Achiha opened his fourth and fifth gates. Chaotic chakra leaked out of him, as well as both of them looked at each other. Guy smirked after he got over the shock, he knew this match wouldn't be easy. So he was ready for it. Both fighters stood there in silence for a while the audience stood a bit bewildered at their sudden transformation. Was that some kind of power up their answers quickly came to a conclusion when both of them moved. Their fists meet mid-air. Boom. An explosion occurred as both of them fought. Punch and kick sending wind and dust flying everywhere into the arena. Their speed was amazing. The audience could barely keep up. While some of the shinobi from Hyuga and the Achiha clan reluctantly activated their eyes to observe the battle. It was an even match. While Abito had many tricks, trying to learn it all. Guy had honed in on his tojutsu skill, and just with that, he could keep up the Achiha. So now both were kind of in a stalemate. With Guy's quick thinking and getting taken advantage in a previous fight with Rin. He didn't allow the Achiha to even weave a single-handed seal. Of course, Abito could use Rasengan, but the match was too fast to use it. And with Guy being the opponent, Abito had to think things through before using any moves. Using the Rasengan would be a waste now. He needed an opening for that. 
And that wasn't all, the arena might be big for a match. But the stadium fighting ground was still small than an open field. Making it hard for the Achiha to gain distance to cast any powerful jutsus. So there was no ninjutsu. The son of the Might family was using the graphical advantage to its fullest. And with fighting Abito for so long, Guy also became quite immune to his sound-based Jinjutsu. And could quickly break off from it. And of course, Guy didn't make the mistake of making eye contact. So that option was cut off as well. Abito still had his fear toxin. Except it didn't work on Guy. The Achea seemed to made a conclusion that with the gates active, he gained a minor immunity of his fear toxin. It did make sense, when the eight gates were active, even potent poisons became useless. The rush of blood and chakra flow eliminated any foreign substance from getting into the system. Which wasn't hard to believe. The Yuki elite Jonin was also able to brush of his fear-based Jinjutsu with sheer determination. So his fear toxins only worked on weak opponents than himself. Or weakened opponents that couldn't reset it. He also had his clones. But showing them in front of other cages or even Danzo was a no-no for him. It was his trump card for him, if he needed to put some skeletons in his closet. So it all came down to Tajutsu. Abito wasn't challenged but it. No he still had confidence in beating Guy. Except for when he pulled out the sixth gate. Gate of view open. Oh, shit. The Achiha thought. Are you sure you want to use that Abito said, a bit distressed. He could also use the sixth gate, but just by looking at Guy's control. He knew it wouldn't work. Also, the fight with Mist for the Chudoku clan was only a month ago. And his body wasn't optimal for using the sixth gate again. It would wreck his body. It wasn't like this was Jinjutsu world, where he could break his body apart for a single match. And he didn't want to wreck his body right now. Also, both of the Konoha Shinobas could hear Mike die from the corner of the stadium, shouting at Guy for using the sixth gate. This was something you should not use so casually. And Guy was only 10, so the strain on his body was massive. More so for the underdeveloped body. Even with your control, you won't be able to hold that state for long, Abito said, smirking, sweating a bit. Guy smirked back. Let's see how long I can last, and with that guy gave chase, Abito was on the run, defending, and running away. It would be suicidal to fight guy like this, he was like a raging bull. Even though technically guy should have greater speed in the sixth gate than Abito. It wasn't the case. Guy knew Saru and Geppo, like the Achiha. But unlike Abito, he hadn't mastered the body flicker jutsu. Not to mention Abito's advanced version of body flicker jutsu where he uses the concept of Saru and Geppo along with it. So Abito was finding it hard, but it wasn't impossible to avoid Guy's attacks. The fight was getting so quick that he wasn't even able to produce any armament rods, let alone cast any ninjutsu. Guy seeing Abito play the defense game was getting frustrated. Abito was right, his sixth gate wasn't going to last forever. And so he needed to finish this quickly. Let's see you run this guy said, kicking the air as he got on top of the arena. He placed his right leg up before he started spinning like a wheel in air. Generating flames. Flaming tempest kick. Let's see you run this guy said, kicking the air as he got on top of the arena. He placed his right leg up before he started spinning like a wheel in the air. Generating flames. Flaming tempest kick. Hundreds of wind blades rained down on the Acha as he looked at it dumbfoundedly. Abito was white-eyed. How the fuck was he going to avoid a flaming shower? The answer is he can't. But with Guy being quite far from Abito, the Achiha was able to quickly go through hand signs. He didn't want to use this, as this was one of his trump cards, but he needed to get this win. Though, he wouldn't love the after effects of the Jutsu. Sonic Roar. He said, as vines and necks popped up, as he shouted out the wind chakra with all of his strength. The use of the fifth gate making the sound ninjutsu stronger. While some of the flaming tempest kicks landed on the ground, some were pushed back to Guy, who was still in the air. Getting hit by the force of Abito's sound ninjutsu, which had caught flames due to the flaming kicks. The Achiha knelt down, coughing blood, his lungs hurt, his throat burned, and his vocal cord was broken. He quickly performed some medical ninjutsu to numb the pain. And he looked for his opponent. Guy was planted into the arena gallery, while his ears bled and his head spun. He was still getting up. Fuck. Time for round two. 
Abito got up, ignoring the pain. The last round of the Chunin exam comes to conclusion. The announcer said. No it was Minato who said that, the announcer seemed to have been out of days. So the Namikas had taken the mick off of him. Both Guy and Abito looked at Minato with confusion. But that's when they remembered that if any participant escaped the ring or was knocked out of it. The other would get the victory. The winner of the Chunin by elimination is Ichiha Abito. Minato said, please, I would like to inform the people that. There is no need to panic. Panic? Abito looked around the stadium. Only to see a few people still in it. Others were quickly exiting it. Both of the Kanohe Genins could see that their fights had made quite the distractions. Creating cracks large in the stadium, while every glass was shattered in the stadium. And there was a large hole in the upper floors because of Abito's sonic roar. Luckily it was just an empty location and there was no civilian there. The only few people that was still in the stadium were the shinobis that were trying to clam the civilians down. The Hokage had to call on an emergency situation to call off the match. But it seemed that it wasn't needed. As Abito got the win, by rules. Hey, come on. This win doesn't count. He said, even though the voice came out broken and very low. Yes, it's not youthful. The remaining people in the stadium glared at Abito and Guy, shutting him off. Back in the upper floor of the stadium. The daimyos were in panic when the glass shattered and the ground began to quack. But it was a good thing that Anbus were there to shield all of the VIP guests. Monsters Kanoha is farming monsters. The stone daimyo said, falling of his chair. But he soon realized that he was in front of people. The daimyo tried to compose himself, getting up. Anoki, W we should leave, almost all of the daimyos were scared, though, some of them were also interested in the prospect of hiring these shinobis in the future, to do their bidding. Especially the lightning daimyo and the sand daimyo. As all of them started to leave. While Hiruzen was getting a headache trying to calm the situation down. Danzo was amused by it. The kids made the daimyos felt fear. Good. Now they would think twice about funding any war in the future. Kagami felt the situation comedic. Seeing the old fools run. His mind having similar thoughts. It was good that Kanoha was seen as a peaceful nation to the world. But today's dumbfounding display of Kanoha's so-called Genin's power should remind the world that they were just as fierce. The Achiha clan along with all the Shinobi clan that had come to watch the exams had to put on damage control. Though they were prideful about the power at the display. It was one of their own that caused it. So the Achiha police was merely helping the poor civilians to clam down. Shisui was bouncing up and down the whole match. His passion made him quickly sign up to Mike Dai's training. Not knowing what the boy got himself into. Kana Achiha that had just returned to the village, away from her usual border guard duty, was quite amazed at Abito's power. Of course over the years even with her going through rough missions as a shinobi, she was quite the looker. Her raven black hair and pale skin gained a lot of attention. Though one could see similarities in her and Makoto, being a sister and all. So that's your true power, huh? She mumbled to herself. After what happened in her childhood, she had developed quite a crush on the younger boy. But with time it faded away as she climbed up the rank of Jonan. She found other priorities but today seeing such power from the same boy. Some of those feelings had resurfaced. She knew that she had to push herself forward and overcome Abito if she wants to be acknowledged by the said boy. In a twisted Achiha way, she had come to the conclusion that if she wanted to gain his interest, being a strong woman will do. And so the beauty in black thought of the summoning contract that she was offered a while ago. Maybe she should take it if she wants to suppress him. No no what am I thinking? She chuckled to herself. Carrying herself with elegance, she commanded the Anbus under her to take action. Even though Kana Achiha liked being here, he was quite annoyed at Abito. He and his opponent had wrecked the place. Their battle not only cracked the arena in multiple places. It also made the whole village think that an attack from outside was happening. Now they had a lot of civilians to calm down. Well, at least it was better than her usual border duty. Where most of the people panicking would end up dead. But while this was happening, a certain Achiha saw Abito's fight and was quite sour about the situation. He felt flustered and jealously. And as prodigy himself, he would suppress Abito. Back in the main event, even though Guy and Abito seemed fine. 
They were clearly not, as both of them collapsed suddenly now that the exam was announced over. And quickly tossed into the medical chamber. Soon Aid felt like a little girl as she sat in front of a table. Steam coming out of her green tea. The fiery blonde of Kanoha looked quite decoil at the moment. There was a reason why. As a white-haired lady sat elegantly, she seemed quite old, as once her pretty red hair had turned white due to aging. Which was quite unusual for an Uzumaki. But that was the price you have to pay if you wanted to live after being a former Jinchuriki. Now Tsunade, can you tell me why you seemed to run when I sent messengers to come to have small chat with me? With your dear grandma? Mito Yuzumaki said, her voice gentle. Yet it had an authoritative nature to her, the old timer clearly having her strength left. The blonde gulped, I it wasn't like that, grandma whom am I hearing excuses? The old lady said, sighing. I only wanted to speak with you. But you run I had no option to call Kagami to send you here, why you didn't have to do that? Mito raised an eyebrow, her face softened. Well, what can I do if my one of my close one keeps avoiding me? Do you know how many letters I have sent for you to come back to the village? The blonde girl seemed to get small, as the grandma scolded her. Ignoring me for so many years I won't be living forever you know? And I need to meet my only granddaughter that's alive. She said, shaking her head. Anyway, you are on house arrest, for seven days. The old Yuzumaki said, humming. Or should I say, village arrest after that you can leave. But, but I don't want to stay here. Child you are being selfish. The old Yuzumaki glared, look at young Shizum, after you have taken her in she's been with you, a drunk blonde. She barely has any social life. You might die unmarried in your state. And after Dan, it's unfortunate but at least give the girl some chance. Tsunade opened her mouth to say, something, but nothing came out. Her grandmother was right. She was being selfish, and only thinking about herself, drowning herself in sorrow, wasn't the answer. But it was the easy way out, yet she would take it any day over being in this village. Being in this village brought back memories, the sweet, the bitter. And also the horrifying ones. Ones where she saw the lifeless body of not only her lover, but also her baby brother. I I don't want to say here, grandma. She said, her voice low. Though the old lady heard it just fine. I'm sorry dear, but you are stuck here in the village for at least a week. She says, as she grabbed her granddaughter's hand, placing a seal on it. Now if you try to leave, Kagami will be informed and take you back to the village in case you lose your way. Tsunade slumped down. And they told her she was stub run. Wonder who she got that from. Mito herself didn't like being so harsh on her only granddaughter, but it was tough love in a way. She wanted the blonde senju to stay. For permanent if that ever happened. And maybe keeping her a few days would let Jiraiya or even Hiruzen to convince Tsunade to stay in the village. She was hoping for that. Find Tsunade said, standing up, after finishing the tea with a quick sip. If you want to find me, just look at a gambling house or bar yes, about that. Mito cut her off. Tsunade was wide-eyed. No you wouldn't. Mito to her horror nodded. You aren't allowed to ingest any of those intoxicants while you are here. She then pointed at the seal, I made the seal, so that any toxins that make you gain instability would be solved instantly. S so I can't even get drunk. Yes, but only for 7 days. Tsunade sends you side. Why did she ever come back to the village? But she couldn't do anything right now. Might as well, get to the Kanoha hospital and catch up with some old colleagues. And she was sure she will find Shizun there. Abito ran through hand signs, all three of them. Particle style. Atomic dismantling jutsu, he clapped his hands bringing them forward, as a small silver shine came in front of his hand, growing bigger. The Achiha smiled with sweat coming from his head, but before he could do anything, the jutsu collapsed on itself and created a small explosion, knocking Abito back a few steps. The boy was on his knees, panting. Why does this always happen he grumbled. Impressive and you managed to figure it out by yourself. A voice came from his side. It was none other than Hiruzen, in his training gear. They were somewhere in a barren wasteland. Yes, but something is wrong with the jutsu I could have probably figured it out, but it's better to get some help from an actual expert, rather than grind my way through it, with flaws in the techniques. Abito said, standing back up, now that he recovered his chakra. Hiruzen nodded, and didn't ask further.
Ibito was still a kid, and yet his contribution to the village was quite a lot. He was an Ichiha that unlocked his Sharingan to protect others. With him being here, he could also get the particle release for himself as well. But knowing the small Ichiha, he was likely doing it for that reason to begin with. Ibito was very selfless, and from his perspective, he had a blazing will of fire in his heart. He hoped a talent like him could be nurtured and hoped that he wouldn't fail him like Dan. From what Hiruzen could gather, Abito was quite opposed to the idea of being a Hokage. Something about paperwork and what now? Now that he thought about it, he also wanted to resign the hat a couple of times because of the damn paperwork. Though, the young boy also said that he wanted one of his clan members to become a Hokage. Not that he would mind, with Kagami and Abito in the future, they could obviously keep the clan in line. Though after further noticing, he could see only a few of the Achiha elders being power-hungry, while the rest of the population was peaceful with how things were. Overambitiousness could be really bad sometimes. And unlike Danzo, he saw a lot of benefits if there was ever an Achiha Hokage. Maybe then all the animosity between them in the village. It's a good thing you still ask for help when you face walls. Kagami said, smiling. I really beat the pride out of didn't I? He said puffing his chest. Both Abito and Hiruzen gave him a blank stare. Also, I kind of figured it out why you can't use the technique Kagami said, it's to do with your average Jonin chakra pool, which is quite a lot for a child, mind you. But the particle release eats away chakra like an Akamichi in a free buffet. Hiruzen nodded, it's something similar to how how when fresh shinobis start learning a new jutsu. For example, young Sarutabas often put too much chakra in their ash-burning jutsu. It's not their fault, an untrained jutsu takes away a lot of chakra. And a powerful jutsu like the particle release does that, with multiplication. Yeah, I thought of something similar. Abito said, anyway, I can fix it? Other than just practicing a lot, until you get the concept into your body and mind no. Kagami said. The Hokage nodded, it could have been useful if you had a bigger chakra pool, but you don't. Also, there aren't any safe chakra enlarging exercises a 10-year-old can do without risking it. And with your current nature progression, you will have a large chakra pool by you are 16. And I won't recommend any chakra enlarging exercise until then, so there's no way the man stopped himself. Actually there is a way take this he said, taking something out from his pocket and tossing it toward the Ache. Abito caught the small bead-like object. What's that, a better version of soldier pill with basic Akamichi ingredients, it won't boost your chakra by much. Around, a quarter of your chakra pool. So I will recommend you take that after getting a bit better at technique. He said, though after using that, you might feel quite lethargic and hungry also, it's a hidden secret that we are even using this. He said, as if speaking from experience. So your basic remedy for my lack of chakra is drugs? Abito deadened. Kagami chuckled, the Akamichi chakra pill or that specific version is meant for kids to use as well. So yeah, our solution is drugs. It does have some side effects, but I also had used them back when I was your age. Not everyone is born with Senju and Yuzumaki genes Kagami snorted. Says the man, who married a Senju Hiruzen coughed smiling, not saying anything. Then, can you tell me if there are any individual problems with my wind and earth release? Abito asked. I know, I have mastered the fire release to its max, because of all the fire release jutsu resources, and with him being around. He said jabbing his thumb toward Kagami. But I can't say the same for my other nature transformation. Oh, so that's why you wanted my help. Hiruzen said, let's see it then Hiruzen was only one of the few that had mastered all the nature transformation. It was something only he had picked out from Tabarama Senju. So with this, Abito could also get some of the flaws in his earth release and wind release fixed. Though, that wasn't the main reason. Abito knew in the upcoming war, or in the future, he might need to use the dust release in front of others. And then, without him doing anything, it might strain the relationship between him and Hiruzen. Even though a few years ago Hiruzen played a neutral role in between the Achiha clan and the village. Now it was the opposite, he was trying to actively improve the Achiha clan's status and removing any conflicts that Danzo or others might have with it. One of them being, the Achiha police force is now a generic police force with a lot of members from other clans. The older Achihas quite detested the idea of mixing their police force with other clans. 
but the new generation quite liked it. While the Achiha had good eye powers, they lacked tracking skills that the Inuzuka could provide, and not to mention the raw power an Akamichi could provide if things got south. So even though for now it was giving mixed results, he knew in the future it would bring stability to the village. So, basically, he was doing this because he wanted to get on the village's good side. Also, it was easy this way. And unknowingly it worked on Danzo as well. Not that Abito knew of course. Danzo was a man who always put the village first, aside from his questionable actions in gaining the Hokage seat for himself. Abito was an Ichiha that was loyal to the village. That had no plan of taking the Hokage seat. And for him it was enough to not see the boy as a threat. Why would he, when his previous actions a few days ago made the whole four great villages recognize Kanoha's threat? Hey, old man, why don't you try the jutsu for yourself, Abito said, as he was panting, after another unsuccessful attempt. Of course, Abito knew Hiruzen would pick up on the jutsu just by helping him, but he wanted to be forward about it. Hiruzen raised his eyebrow, are you sure? Yeah, of course, I am why aren't you supposed to be the mighty Hokage, the strongest shinobi in the village? Or are you thinking of passing on the hat early? Kagami rolled his eyes, just learn it anyway, you have the nature transformations down. And with your talent, it won't take long. Then you can give him pointers this way. That means you too, Sensei Abito said, making the crow summoner blink. I mean why would I bring you to practice the jutsu, if I didn't want to share it in the first place? Just don't pass the knowledge willy-nilly. Because I sure as heck won't also know written documents about the jutsu. Just promise me that. Both the older man firmly nodded. The Hokage would have kept the thing a secret anyways, but with Abito being bold about it, he would respect the boy's decision. Abito also wanted the Hiruzen to learn this jutsu. Why? Just to spite the stone village. He still didn't forget the attack they did when he was only five. So much killing at the hospital. Also, with him stating about no written documents. He was sure that would make Arachimaru and Danzo not have it. Huh, take that sick fuckers the Achiha internally chuckled to himself. You know your skills with copying stuff is quite amazing Kagami said, I could understand the gravity jutsus and the flying techniques, but the particle release I'm not sure even Madara could have done that. Abito gave a cheeky smile. Well, I'm the upgrade. Uh, a humble one, aren't you here is and just chuckled. It wasn't actually that though. Abito knew that his Sharingan was quite amazing at copying stuff. Even without his canon knowledge of Kakashi the copy ninja. But when Abito was fighting Ku. He had planted a lot of his bat clones in the stadium with their Sharingan active from different angles. Some focused on the chakra aspect, while others focused on how the three nature transformations mixed. And when Abito got all of their memories back. It was easy to complete the picture. It was all due to prep time. Always believe in the prep time. Abito knew the training with particle release would take time. And some might ask, wouldn't practicing his jutsu in Kanoha catch some praying eyes? The answer is no. This was an abandoned Anbu post from the First War. A place where Taburama taught his own disciples. And this place was quite guarded with seals, not to mention he had his bats to survey the area for anyone and anything. And from the reports, they had managed to confuse a few of the root Anbu away from this place before they could eavesdrop. This was the perfect place to speed learn the particle release on. Hiruzen was quite glad to learn something new even at this age. And the man would take any excuse to drop his hokage duties. And after what happened in the Chunin exams it was quite tough. The daimyos from the villages all left in a hurry after the match was over. Only to contact the Kanoha village with tons of new missions. It seems seeing the powers of Genins had made the daimyos value Kanoha Shinobi over the rest. And the village was generating a lot of wealth from it, and it was quite needed for the upcoming war. Maybe it would stop the upcoming war huh he was an optimistic one, wasn't he? But the paperwork for new missions was getting to the Hokage's head. And so he had dumped most of the mission duties to Tarifu, and got out to learn and teach the particle release. It was a win-win in his books. But the poor Akamichi but at the same time, he didn't trust Danzo enough to leave him with those duties. God knows what he would do in his absence. Danzo had his uses, but when he found out that the man was doing research on the first Hokage's cells, he almost got a heart attack. Was the man even sane? 
Mito Uzumaki was still alive, and if the word ever got out, she would have his head for not keeping Danzo in check. So for that reason, he had to force the man bury his research to not see daylight. Of course, it would have been the same if Mito wasn't here. He respected Hashirama for all he did, and this wasn't right. It was a good thing he had placed Orochimaru in his ranks. Now that type of research was stopped because of it. The boy was also a good candidate for becoming the Hokage, but Minato was overall the best one. Still, he trusted the boy much. And he knew that he wouldn't betray his trust. With him around Hiruzen could keep an eye on Danzo's whole Anbu squad. It wasn't like his own student would betray him. Never, he basically raised the boy since he was seven, why would he? Even though Hiruzen didn't show it that much, but he was quite glad that he was getting to learn the particle release. It seems that his evaluation of Abito was right. The boy was selfless for an Achiha. He wondered how he should return back the favor. A jutsu like that was no joke. Even he didn't see Madara copy it, and the boy was willing to share it with others. He almost felt jealous that his friend Kagami had taken the boy under his wing. He wouldn't mind training him as his own student if it wasn't the case. Though it also made him realize that his decision to clear the Achihan aim and making good connections with them was a good one. And one of his best if he played his cards right. But first, though, he would need to make the learn the particle style himself and teach the kid on how to effectively use it. It has been a while since he taught someone. Also, he should speak to Minato about Abito is doing. Even though he had some doubts about Abito, now it was clear. So he would give Minato the permission to teach him that technique. Here is an internally chuckled at what his own sensei's reaction would be if he learned that one of the Achihas were learning that jutsu. Though, Minato wasn't in the village himself. He and Jiraiya had gone to the Toad Mountains to do their own training. With that, a month had passed. Abito spent most of the time practicing and learning the dust release jutsu. And he came up with variants that he could use that didn't suck his chakra dry. Even though he still did his research on the curse seal, it wasn't that much. He focused on the jutsus he copied from Stone Shinobi. While Abito passed the knowledge of dust release only to Kagami and Hiruzen. He didn't do that for the Earth Fly Jutsu and the Earth Weight Jutsu. He had given a detailed copy to the Achiha Library and an undetailed one to the Konoha Public Archive. And if they are deemed worthy, the Hokage would give Shinobis access to the Jutsu. Though, Abito did give both of the Jutsu to Might Guy and I. And he convinced them to use it with their to Jutsu. To lighten themselves with the Jutsu to be faster and increase their weights to deal devastating blows. They also had access to pass down the technique to others. Though for some reason, he saw Shisui wearing a green spandex and running around the village for some reason. No matter, Abito found that shit hilarious. And would surely tease the boy when he was older, he even snapped a couple of pictures for that. Okay, now back to the curse seal. Abito had made a stabilized version of it. Which was quite fast, but then again most of the work was done by the old bat. He just needed to work on the Fuinjutsu side of things, so that the seal wouldn't collapse on itself. The old bat would be mad that he was slacking off on the curse seal research. But it wasn't his full fault either. The first version of the curse seal was made, but would need to be trailed on living subjects. And there was a catch. He needed high quality Jonin level shinobi to put his trail curse seal on. As a curse seal was the bastard version of Sinjutsu, so he needed people that had good amount of chakra in their body to test out his seals. Technically as he had already Jonin level chakra he was a good candidate. But he wasn't going to put that on himself, not without knowing the risks. That's where Pakura comes in. She had volunteered in the research on the seal. So Abito needed to be extra careful and make the seal not permanent as well. Even though she was still a kid of 12, her bloodline ability made her chakra pool quite large. And unlike unwilling subjects she was quite willing, it also made things easy, as the curse mark might not reject her that much. Because of that the old bat was trying to get her used to how bats used their chakra. As his version of the curse seal was derived from combining the bat clan's ability and the chudoku clan's bloodline ability. So for now, Abito was doing minor tweaks on the seal. When Pakura would be ready, he would need to place the seal on her. A part of him was quite scared on how it might affect the poor girl. She seemed desperate for power because of losing her friends in the Chunin exams. And in a way, he was taking advantage of it. 
but at the same time, he was excited on what possibilities it could bring. The old lady of the bats knew a lot of Senjutsu. And he had a lingering suspicion that she was an actual sage. But if it was true, why didn't she teach it to others? Maybe it was something similar to the snake Senjutsu, where the white snake would inject you with sage venom to test out our Senjutsu potential. And not like the toads where you just sit around and gather sage chakra. Unknowingly Abito was quite close to the truth. Still, Abito found some relief that the old bat deemed the curse seal safe. Though she did warn that it would be quite painful to put on, adjust and in case of failure, it would quite painful to remove. But Pakura seemed to know it and agreed with the risks. And she wasn't alone, some of the Chudoku clan members also agreed to join Abito's cause. And they wanted to be useful to him, them, seeing the young boy as their savior and all. And that was a lot of responsibility to take. But with how different their biology worked. The old bat could directly whoop them into being sages if their mental state could be fixed. Which was a work in progress. Another funny thing is, when he had made the news about Pakura being a test subject for bats in Jutsu, Robin, one of his bats, approached him. And said he also wanted to put on the curse seal. Abito didn't expect that. Cause his seal was made for humans. But the small bat persisted that he have the seal, he was still sour that Nightwing got the blood clan's eyes. And he wanted something else. The Achiha didn't complain, as that would help him with his research in the future. And also strengthening his bats with it. He would also get some insight into it. The Chudoku clan's ability of Senjutsu branched them into having a lot of chakra, and they recovered chakra as fast as they used it. He wanted to know if that was the same case for his curse seal. If so, Abito wouldn't need to wait that much to increase his chakra reserves. Abito found the whole thing quite peaceful. After the exam, nothing noteworthy happened. While he trained, so did his teammates, Rin seemed to be training more on the medical side of things, while Kakashi was training hard, now that Sakumo was back in the village. It all seemed peaceful. And he knew this was just the calm before the storm. He just hoped he was ready for what was about to come. Kenshi Uzumaki was left flabbergasted after seeing Abito and Guy fight. And they were supposed to be genins. How did that work? Of course, he knew the inner politics behind the exam, as an advertisement for their village. But this was just too much. Both Abito and Guy were younger than him. And could give talented Jonins back in his village run for their money. He was still a bit sour, being defeated by a civilian shinobi, while being a clan heir and by rank is already a chunin back in Yuzushiagakur. But now seeing this he was right to come here. Kenshi seeing the outstanding power, didn't feel helpless, no he felt excited. The Yuzumaki Shinobus in his village, used more muted jutsus, and traps. They acted carefully, and used fast and deadly to finish the battles before it started. Sure all of them had huge chakra reserves, but as the days went by, their numbers were reducing. So they had to be cautious at all times. Maybe that was the reason. Of course, there were some powerful Yuzumakas in the village that used a multitude of Jutsus to overpower the enemies, but they were considered elite of the elite. But this now he could understand why Kanoha was one of the leading villages. Now he also understood why his uncle pushed his father to merge the village with Kanoha. Even though that seemed to be quite impossible with his father around. He was all about safeguarding the motherland even if it costs everything. But now he could kind of see the errors of his way. In fact, Kenshi only came to the village because of his uncle's suggestion. And he was right about his decision to come to Kanoha. Kanoha was in a different league of his own. The other four major villages participated in the exams, but their contestants were nowhere to be seen. Actually, this whole visit changed his worldview. Now he could understand where his cousin Kashina and Lady Mito came from. They would be around the village a few more days. The girls Mio and Momoko loved being here. Even though they didn't outwardly say it, it was pretty obvious. They had even hit it better with his cousin and the unique food selection. Especially the Raymond was quite loved by those two. Even he had to say it was quite good. Also, unlike back in the village, they didn't have to stress about being deployed. Here they could truly relax. Anyway, after a few days they would have to leave. But with all the experience, he found the idea of his uncle rather appealing. Pride was a minor sacrifice if it meant his or his own clan's survival. 
The day of the departure came, so, you are leaving, young Kenshi? Harizen asked. The man might be middle-aged, but he was powerful. He was said to be most powerful cage in this generation for a reason. I had hoped that you would have stayed for some time. Abito seemed be speak quite highly of you the old man chuckled finishing as he puffed his pipe. In his stay, Abito would often come by with some of his friends to stroll the village or go a few practice sessions with them. And Kenshi had to say he was impressed. Almost all of Abito's friends could give any Uzumaki run for their money in the stamina department. Especially, the son of Sakumo, though he was technically a quarter senju. Anyway, Kenshi liked his stay here. And if the upcoming war wasn't an issue, he would no doubt stay a few days more here. But alas, he had his own duties to attend to. Also, it seemed that the Hokage was quite close to Abito. And they said, the Achihas were discriminated against. Kenshi internally shook his head. For all he could see Kanoha had no internal conflict whatsoever. And they had multiple clans living together. Thank you for your kind words, Hokage-sama. But I also have my duties with the upcoming war and all. He said, a tinge of sadness in his voice. The old man hummed, about that young Kenshi I have a proposal for you and your village. With that the Hokage explained his plans. So would you like to accept it? He said, as he placed a golden scroll in front of him. Kenshi stood there digesting what the cage had said. As the clan heir, and next in line for the seat, if he accepted the proposal, it would be unofficial acceptance. Of course, his father got the last decision, but his decision was also valuable. The proposal was simple really. If the war starts, Kanoha is willing to accept around a thousand Yuzumaki refugees, while Yuzushigakur fights its battle. Technically it would be very beneficial to Yuzushigakur and its people. The Yuzumaki population was barely a thousand without the shinobis, so with the offer, they could send out all the civilians and non-combats to Kanoha while they fought in war. But even if Kanohas was an ally, accepting the offer would cement Yuzushiagakur as a proxy nation for Kanohas. It will lose its individuality. Still, he knew for a fact that his father would reject the offer. But he only saw a benefit in it. Thank you, Hokage-sama I will be sure to let my father know, he is the final decision maker. With that he accepted the proposal, while the old man smiled. I hope best for you and you village. The cage said, before also snapping his fingers. Suddenly a few anbus arrived on his side. I hope you won't reject my offer to send some of my shinobis with you, to escort you on your journey. Hopefully they will be of your use, I can't just see off someone like you without fur guards, Kenshi nodded again, seeing no reason to reject. While the Yuzumaki left, Hiruzen smiled thinking about what just happened. This proposal was from a certain Achiha, but who knew Kenshi would accept the offer? Harrison shook his head, Abito was not even 10, and was suggesting stuff that his political advisors didn't think of. It was a bold offer, and if the boy rejected it this might have caused some friction. But the main thing was he didn't. Kenshi actually accepted it. With that the Saratobi decided that he would take drastic measures if needed, but he would make a hokage out of Abito. The poor boy didn't know that he was on his way to a paperwork grave. The day was going peacefully in Kanoha, though there was thin tension in the air. As each day passed everyone in the village knew that a war was coming. They just wondered and hoped that it wouldn't take their loved ones from them. In the Hokage's office, four small shinobis with Kanoha headband were in front of Hiruzen. They stood still as one of Hokage read out the mission briefing. So, basically, we have to play shinobi shipment service for some entitled man? Kakashi said, with a lazy expression. After the explanation was finished. Is it wrong that I was expecting more from the recent missions, the mission was simple, get into the land of mist. To retrieve a package from the water daimyo himself. And get back to Kanoha safely. Pretty anticlimactic, if you ask me Abito said, yawning. On his side guy also nodded. I was thinking it would be some big mission with high stakes yes, I had to cancel my morning training for that guys, come on. This is a safe mission you don't expect all of our missions to be flashy. Rin said, rolling her eyes. Well, at least one member of your team thinks logically. Harrison said, chuckling. Though, the mission wouldn't be that safe. There was a reason why they were sending one of the well-balanced out teams in Kanoha. Yes, we don't have that many of those in my team. Brains I mean Rin said, then looking around. Or any to be exact. 
You should know, I take offense in that Abito said, touching his heart. While Rin just rolled his eyes, the Hokage spoke again. Now, now, kids get off with your mission. Also, it's not a safe mission per se oh, good there's a catch Abito said. Oh, god there's a catch Rin thought. Even though I won't usually say it this mission might be trap. Harrison said. Oh fantastic. Rin thought, groaning inside, don't worry Rin. How bad could it be, and you are a medic. You wouldn't need to go on the front lines unless to save your dumbest teammates. Which they will need saving why couldn't things be easy. Finally Kakashi said, before he corrected himself. Oh, no wait, then why are we taking the mission? I mean, it's great that you have so much trust in our team, but wouldn't someone like Minato Sensei or others do better? Good question. Minato is currently busy. The Hokage said. You see, your team is like an advertisement for our village. And the water daimyo is quite the loudmouth, so he will do a good promotion for your team so by doing this mission, which is directly from the water daimyo you guys will gain some reputation. In the past month your team did quite a lot of missions inside the border, now you should get comfortable doing it outside, in different weather conditions. After the Chunin exams, Minato has taken a leave, and the whole team Minato was adjusted accordingly. Kakashi who applied for Jonin license, was promoted and was given the leading role of Team Minato, in the absence of the yellow flash. Even though Kakashi didn't outright admit it. He mainly did it to show off it to Abito. Of course others didn't comment on that. Huh, neat. Abito said, not even bothering to pay attention. He was getting a bit bored staying here in the village, there was a rush of excitement that can be only felt on the battlefield. So he was quite eager to use his new technique on the battlefield. Though he doubted that anything like that would happen. Well, there's a reason why I chose this specific team, your team coordination is quite good. And with two sensors, it should be relatively safe. Hirazan said, gesturing towards the Achiha and Senju in the team. But if things go south, there should be an Anbu check post on the border. You can contact for backup with summons I think you can figure out the rest. All of them nodded. So, any more questions? All of them shook their head. Good. Then, you should leave for the mission immediately. The faster you finish, the better Hirazan said, his voice serious, this is an air rank mission for a reason, I recommend not to engage the mist shinobis and stay hidden, unless otherwise. All of them nodded, leaving the room. Okay guys let's meet back at the gate in half an hour. Kakashi said. Okdoki boss. Said a certain Achiha, I will bring my big baby pants for the ride, but I hope you don't need it. Hi, hi the haddock said lazily. If it was like before Kakashi would have lasted out. But after spending time with his team the silver haired boy seemed to be mellowed down. Almost going into his iconic lazy mood sometimes. If that's the case, I will bring some of my green spandex for you, my friend Kakashi. Guy, the Tajutsu used said in genuineness. Kakashi opened his mouth and closed, while the Achiha just laughed. A group of six shinobis spoke to each other as they also prepared to leave. Oi where's the new kid? One of them asked, donning an odd looking weapon that looked like a large scroll with seals on it, and the man was holding it like it was a sword. Don't shout the first thing in the morning. One of the other grumbled. He was rather thin and was wearing a mask, on his back was a long needle. The kid was given a specific mission from the cage another one said, he looked rather big and was a bit on the chubbier side. Yet he had a look that was just as menacing. So, he won't be joining us on our little endeavor, the first one clicked his tongue. The brat's stealing all the spotlight enough. The big one said, we are going on a mission and we should focus on that. He said looking on his side, where there was a large bag, but one could see something was inside of it, moving, trying to get out. Also, we should hurry, before things go south. The Mizukage won't like any mistakes. All of the others nodded. The land of flowing water, a beautiful place. A place between the land of water and the land of fire. A small nation just in the middle. And even though it's an independent country it still falls under Kanoha. Unlike other nations it didn't have a shinobi force. And so it was supported fully by Kanoha. Abito and his team were now staying in a nearby Kanoha shinobi camp. A large fort of sorts, guarding the people of land of flowing water from the invaders of Kiri shinobis. So, you will be meeting with the water daimyo. Said a middle-aged man, with red eyes. 
He would have been mistaken for an Acheha if he didn't have a small smile on his face. Just a heads up, don't spend too much time speaking to him he tends to hold long useless conversations. But other than that he's quite a likable guy. We will keep that mind. Kakashi said, while the rest of team stood behind him and nodded. The man in front of them was quite the veteran, Sinku Yuhi was his name. Father of Kurinai Yuhi, he was quite known for his use of his Jinjutsu, some of his techniques could even put most Achihas to shame. And not to mention his keen strategic skill. He and Shikaku Nara were in charge of the fort. But the Nara and his famous Ino Shikacho was out on a mission and called back to the village. So that left only him in charge. Well, then. You can rest for the day, if you like. The older shinobi said, leaning back on his chair. Sorry, Shinku-san. The Hokage ordered the mission to be done quickly. Kakashi said, but I am really thankful for your suggestion. Oh, don't worry. It's just that seeing someone from the village made a little homesick. Even that lazy Shikaku was called back, the man mumbled the last part to himself, by the way, do any of you know my daughter? Is her name Kurinai, by any chance? Rin asked. The other man nodded, smiling. Yes, he said, how was she she did take the Chunin exams this year, didn't she? She didn't get injured there, did she? No, she didn't seem injured in the exam. Though, she didn't pass the second round. Rin said. The old man nodded. She can be headstrong sometimes and jump into danger. But it's good that she has some friends he mumbled, fondly. Due to the war, he hadn't been in the village for almost a year, and now he was missing his wife and daughter dearly. But his shift would end this week, so he was hopeful that he could meet his family. The team of younger shinobis saw the older man and didn't say anything. They couldn't relate, but they knew that it was all part of the shinobi's life. Oh, I completely forgot. You should be busy, sorry for stopping you. Go along your mission. No, it's no problem, Shinku-san. Abito said, we will be on our way. The older man nodded and gave them a small scroll for permission to cross the Kiri border. And with that all of the younger shinobis left. Team Kakashi then found themselves in a small boat crossing the Kiri border. Their next stop was the palace for water daimyo, which was in a nearby island. The whole nation of Kiri were large islands separated only by the sea. Usually outsiders will hire big boats or ships to cross this sea. But with a beto on board a medium-sized boats and some well-placed seals were enough for them to navigate to their destination. Yup, Fuinjutsu rocks. While they were going to the land of water, another group was going the opposite way, towards the land of flowing water. Six shinobis all of them wearing stone shinobi attire. Of course they were using disguises, or else they would have been recognized. Still the swords on their back made it obvious that they were the seven swordsmen of the mist. Or six of them were, one of them wasn't with them, on this particular mission. Fuguki Sukazin was the wielder of Samahata and the group leader. Is the bait ready? He asked as he stood in front of his boat. Yup, fine and dandy. Jinpachi the wielder of Shibuki said. His sword looked like a giant scroll with seals on it. He'll behave well until we reach land. He said looking at the human-sized bag that was dripping blood, one could see something moving inside. Is the intel on the Ino Shikacho solid? Another one nodded. Then Fuguki said, before he turned and looked back at his team. The fate of the mist depends on the mission. Failure is not an option. With this we will make the most proud. He spoke with authority in his voice, while the others cheered with their swords held high. The water daimyo's palace was big no it was huge. The place was decorated in an old Japanese style, and all of it looked amazing. The four shinobi waited in the lobbying area, while some of the attendees went to inform the water daimyo. All of them were a bit nervous no only she was. Come on they were going to meet a leader of a damn country, at least one of them had to be nervous. The Kanoichi shook her head as she glanced at her teammates. Abito was sleeping while crossing his arms, Kakashi was lazily reading a book, while Guy well, he seemed excited and enthusiastic for some reason, and asking the guards all sorts of questions. She sighed. Well, her teammates were all unusual to begin with, what else would she expect? Though she knew for a fact that it would be different if they were meeting with a cage. All of the knuckleheads on her team only respected strength it seemed. Her thoughts were broken when the large door to the room cracked open and the water daimyo walked out. 
He seemed excited and she felt a pitfall in her stomach when he started walking towards her. And she wasn't the only one, all of her team had noticed it as well. Kakashi stood up from his chair going and greeting the old man. They spoke about something and it seemed that the water daimyo was in a hurry. She was a bit tense as she couldn't hear what they were saying. Soon the old man made his way towards her. You are the girl that girl from the exams what was your name again Rin, yes Rin. So girl I have an offer for you how would you like to become one of the honorary girds of the water daimyo? A all of them were a bit shocked. The daimyo had special guards protecting them. But no one of them was recruited this young. Well, not back in Kanoha at least all of their shocked expression was cut off by a laugh. It was a beto. The Achiha made his way towards the daimyo, the man was still a bit taller than his 10-year-old frame, but it didn't make the Achiha less intimidating. A hefty offer, I will say. Abito said, grinning, but Rin sat at her boat dazed at what had happened in the few hours. She looked down at a wrapped up sword that the water daimyo gifted her with. Of course, Abito had checked out the sword with his few injutsu skills beforehand. Well, at least this trip wasn't boring Abito mused as he stood in front of the boat, feeling the breeze. Their boat was a lot faster with Abito's seals, and it cut down the travel time by a lot. You know even I have to say you have way of bullshitting way out of things. Kakashi said, getting his eyes off his book. Abito's eye twitched, I will take that as a compliment. He said, beside you are just jealous that he didn't recognize you, whatever you say junior, and Kakashi I smiled, it was a wonder how he did that, and for some reason it pissed off the Achiha even more. Abito was still a bit sour about Kakashi becoming a Jonin early what was with those two and their weird rivalry. She wondered. But that didn't matter. At least all of them were at least Chunin ranks. Apparently, you didn't have to win the exams to gain the rank, only show enough skills to prove your worth. You know you saved my back there Rin said, sighing. As she placed her newly gifted sword down on the boat. I didn't know what to say he was so sudden about it, and thanks really. What the water daimyo did was quite bold, but it made sense Rin wasn't clanless, but the Nahara clan wasn't that famous. So unlike Abito she could be recruited or at least he thought. But why didn't he give an offer to Guy? Simple he was a man that only saw water jutsu specialist as well special. Anyhow, recruiting her wouldn't make problems with the mist. Apparently no. Complex politics and stuff. Friends don't need that the Achiha just grinned, waving it off. When the water daimyo made the proposal to make Rin one of his guards, Abito had intervened and worked off his charm. There was no way Rin would leave her village or her team for just a stupid position. But she couldn't outright deny it. But that's where Abito came in. He managed to convince the daimyo that she was too inexperienced and the war was going to happen soon. And along with other stuff, he had managed to convince the man to let her go for now. And if he still had the offer after she became a jonin he could send a letter to the Hokage. And there was no way the Hokage would refuse his offer, of course, Rin knew that the old man would refuse the offer most likely. Hiruzen was never the one to force this on others, he just wasn't that type of guy. But the man was persistent and gifted her with one of the famous blades the daimyo post, made out of pure chakra metal. It wasn't in ranks of the seven blades by any means, but it was quite the nice sword. Of course, after that Kakashi had asked for the package that they came to her for. Apparently, the man had completely forgotten about it. It would have really sucked if the whole mission was a setup from the water daimyo to meet with her. But it wasn't anything like that. The man just simply forgot about the courier mission. But after taking the package their mission was done. Well almost done and now they were making their way back to Kanoha. The whole situation was quite messed up. But at least their mission ended safely. Now they could return home. Hey, what's that guy said, pointing at the front. They were near the main island, and they could clearly see smoke rising. Rin couldn't see anything, so he looked towards Abito, who had activated his Sharingan. Wow, people are getting really idiotic ideas these days the Acheha blurt out, before looking back to his teammates. Some punks got the bright idea to attack in broad daylight. Kakashi frowned, anything else? Abito shook his head. I can't see that far with my Sharingan, but I can pick up chakra signatures with my eyes, and it seems that a small battle is going on. What? Rin asked. Was it the start of a war? Hold your horses Missy Abito waved her off. 
Border disputes like this is common, but, but not in broad daylight. Kakashi finished, we have to quickly go there and help them guy said. What do you say boss? Abito looked at Kakashi. It was his call anyway. The lightning user signed, listen here, in case of any wild danger, other than me all three of you will make a run for it and call for backup. Sure thing, I will follow your order to the T. Abito said grinning. The masked boy sighed again, at least you two will leave if I give the command calling backup is also important. The boy mumbled the last part. Bish. We are the backup. The Achiha said a battle crazed grin. Fu 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 I can't wait to tear out my new jutsus. Before he looked back, but yeah listen to what the scarecrow says. Guy wanted to protest, but Rin held the boy by his shoulder and glared at him, before looking towards Kakashi. We will do that okay, then hold your pants tight Abito said as he speed up the boat towards the mainland. The team of young shinobis reached the shore, but the fight had already reached beyond the wall. Inside the Kanoha Shinobi fort, smoke and flames could be seen, and battle noises could be heard. The whole shore had a large wall, sealing it off from the ocean. It was set up in a way, so they could easily see any enemy naval ships. But now it was broken and smoked in some places, as one could see battle had passed from here to inside. Behind the walls were a large forest of sorts, where the Kanoha Shinobis had set camps. And a bit further, there were a few buildings that was set up as the fort. Guys don't engage until we know the situation Kakashi said, while the rest nodded. Body flickering their way up the wall, both Kakashi and Abito scanned walls with their sensing abilities and found no one, so they went there first to get an overview of the situation. When they reached the top of the wall, they felt dread seeing dead bodies littered everywhere. Some missing limbs and blood flooding the floor. But as shinobis they didn't pay much mind to it or at least tried to. Rin was handling it pretty well, but Guy turned a shade of green from the experience. From the wall, they could see that a fight was going inside the jungle area, but due to the trees, it couldn't be fully seen. It was a jungle from above, only the flickering flames in the trees, and the smoke was visible. Abito was eager to fight, but that didn't mean he wasn't going to take precautions. The Achea quickly called out his bat clones, as they mixed in with the shadows moving towards the fight. He also kept Nightwing and Robin near him, hidden under his shadows. A technique that Hiruzen taught him after the Achiha asked about Toad Sage's technique. The old man was quite generous about sharing a few of Jiraiya's jutsus, and even some other clan jutsus. But then again, he did gain his full trust after sharing the dust release with him. I have sent some ground eyes, but the Achiha was cut off. Can you smell that Kakashi said, narrowing his eyes, sniffing the air. Yeah, smoke. Abito deadpanned. No it's something else. Something dangerous. He quickly ran over hand seals, summoning his transformed adiantum silver sword. Monkeys, what? All of the masked, as far as they could see it was all trees. And Abito was about to activate his glitch vision and focus, but their question was soon answered as a roar came out from the jungle, and a large flaming monkey came into view. And it wasn't all. The sheer presence of the beast was terrifying enough, but when it released its killing intent, everyone froze in place. It was as if time itself was frozen. The first thing the monkey did was stomp the ground and fire of a giant ball of black energy towards the ocean. Abito was quick enough to drag his team's heads down as the ball of energy passed him. Creating a large explosion in the sea, lighting up the day like a second sun. What's that Rin asked as her body was shaking a bit. The explosion shook the ground very beneath them, making a few cracks on the already broken wall. One of the tailed beast Abito said, there was a serious expression in his face. But there was also a bit of annoyance there. I wasn't expecting this but Kakashi cut him off. On guard. The others were white-eyed as he looked to the front, and four shinobis came into view. All of them wearing clothes that looked similar to the stone shinobis. All of them also being sword users sword users of well-known swords in fact. The four enemy shinobis stopped, looking at the four Kanoha shinobis. Even though they had disguises, but the Kanoha team knew who they were just by the sword they had. Oi, didn't you say, you cleared everyone in the wall? One of them said, looking towards his side. Shut it, the kids won't take long one of them said, he had a large scroll-like weapon in his hand. And the man moved forward, while the Kanoha team took hesitantly took steps back. It doesn't matter, just finish them off we already lost two men. 
One of them grunted, by the way he spoke he was the leader. He was winded a bit, no wounds visible, yet there was blood on him. H hey, can't we talk this one out Abito said. If they had any doubts regarding who the enemies were, they didn't note. The sword on his back was too iconic. Samahat of the shark blade. Good, one of them is a coward. Kill but he couldn't finish his sentence as a kunai was stuck behind his throat, and the man gurgled, making all his teammates look to the side, there was another Abito standing. And the clones kicked the large man towards his comrades, while throwing a few explosion kunais at them. All of them were too shocked at what just happened, even Abito was one of them. Coward my ass. Charge. Abito, the real one said, as he went over his one-handed hand signs. Fire style. Fireball Jutsu. The fire jutsu provided even more distraction, separating the mist swordsmen. Abito's clones came out of the shadows wanting to sneak attack again, but they got attacked by the dual-bladed lighting user. Making them incapable of moving. Luckily, Kakashi came forward and engaged him. Rin take the high ground, Guy and Abito go all out. Kakashi called out in between his battle, as he was engaged with a dual welding swordsman. Lightning cracked from both sides as they fought. Sparks of silver and yellow battling it out. Guy took off his weights and threw them towards the giant scroll sword user. Jinpachi Munashi was unable to attack the green boy immediately because of it. And it gave Guy just the time needed to open the gates and let loose with a leaf hurricane kick. Abito on his end didn't open his gates, sure they were fighting the seven swordsmen of the mist. But he had to finish it quickly without dragging things too long because he had a wild infernup to catch. Abito on his end didn't open his gates, sure they were fighting the seven swordsmen of the mist. But he had to finish it quickly without dragging things too long. Because he had a wild infernup to catch. His opponent was the needle sword users, brat pay attention, the shinobi shouted as he attacked the Achiha. Abito snapped his head to the side with glowing red eyes making perfect eye contact. Shut it mutt. And with that the man dropped like a puppet cut from his strings. He walked forward, bringing his armament-gloved hand towards the fallen enemy to finish the job. But just before he could set a few spikes to kill the pest, he was attacked. Abito quickly rolled to his side with his hands crossed. His armament taking the full brunt of the hit as he was pushed back, dragging lines in the ground with his feet. The Achiha looked up, annoyed. Bullshit. Abito said seeing the angry Samahata user, who was panting as one of hand was still in his throat, the huge gaping wound nowhere to be seen, only a bit of steam coming out of it. I have to get that sword and study the shit out of it the Achiha thought with displeasure. Why did his enemies had to be cockroaches? Yes, he knew ninjutsu, but that was years of hard work, not some bullshit hacks. Kushimaru wake up. The large man said, towards his fallen teammate as he brought Samahata to his front, towards Abito. The man was still panting. Oh, he won't be waking up nighttime soon. The Achiha said, his Sharingan rotating menacingly. He's having the dream of his life by now. More like a nightmare, but that was left unsaid. The Samahata user clicked his tongue, I would have left you brats if you weren't witness really? The man snorted, who am I kidding, of course not, you tree-humping brat. The only thing I humped was your dead mother, bitch. The Achiha shot back. Ho ho I'm gonna enjoy this much more than I should. The man grunted, irritated, and he brought his Samahata down on the needle sword user. Abito watched in disgust and awe, as the shark sword sucked the life out of the swordsman, leaving behind withered skin and bones. But the Achiha didn't stop it, he watched the process with curiosity. Huh. Brat. Now you are dead. Fuguki said, as the full Samahata came out of his bandages. His energy fully refueled. You know there is one rule I like to follow Abito said, crossing his arms. That is not to let my enemies power up. So wonder why I let you? What? Motherficker, you really thought I let you go through with your fucking Sailor Moon transformation without a reason? Fuguki was about to replay, when his instincts flared out, and he quickly brought his sword to his back. Blocking the sizable ice arrow that now froze his sword. But if he didn't block it, he would have lost his head. But one thing the mist shinobi didn't account for was his position. With the shot blocked from his back, now he was very close to Abito, who had just finished his hand seal. Well well well, how the tables have turned. 
Abito smirked as a cube from his hand glowed, extending forward, before erasing, say hi to your mother for me, bitch. With the user suddenly dying the shark sword attacked Abito out of spite. Even the Achiha wasn't expecting that, but he dodged it just fine. And quickly took out few injutsu wraps to wrap the sword in, so that it couldn't attack anyone. He sealed the sword in one of his few injutsu scrolls, along with the needle sword. For safekeeping purposes of course. Thanks by the way. Abito said as Rin came out from her hiding place. The girl nodded, Guy and Kakashi took their fights down the wall, so you were the only one that I could provide support to. She said, her role was the group's medic, and as such, even if she had flashy skills, she was better to fall behind and provide support from behind, and not be in the front lines. And he found old Yuzumaki archery very good for that job. But you wouldn't need them anyways with your clones and all. Well, you are right on that one, but it would have been a long one. And you had the element of surprise and surprise, my enemy is dead. Abito said, giving a cheesy grin. The girl rolled her eyes. Before she looked at the second fallen enemy. Shouldn't we kill him as well? She said, flinching inside when she thought over what that meant. It seemed she was getting used to it. Killing him would reduce his bounty, and mind you we can get some info out of him. The Achiha said, looking down from the wall, seeing Kakashi and Guy fight their opponents. Rin actually forgot that the seven swordsmen had bounties on their heads. Wait, they actually took down two of them that's, weren't they elite level Jonin or something? They were quite winded and exhausted, yes, but it shouldn't be that easy. And Rin Abito said, glancing at her. Be a deer and make him immobile. Rin wanted to groan, but she stopped herself. Taking out a senbin and throwing it towards the fallen Miss Shinobi. The senbin had a paralysis poison, just for safety. With that she kneeled towards her enemy, using her chakra senses to destroy his chakra points and cut off his arteries. With that done, Abito wanted to move towards the giant monkey that was rampaging the forest, and Kanohe Shinobis were barely keeping the tailed beast in check. But then he remembered something and kneeled beside the Samahata user's corpse, and with a poof sealed him away as well. This would not only be evidence, but he knew that as the leader of the Seven Swordsmen he would carry valuable stuff on him. Stuff that he couldn't waste time on right now. The Achiha looked behind and saw the enemy shinobi wrapped up like a mummy. Hide his body somewhere safe, we might need him for further questioning. Abito said, looking down. Kakashi and Guy finished as well I was going to help them, but it seems I wasn't needed. So I will be going towards the flaming monkey, do me a favor and seal the rest of the swords in here. With that he tossed a sealing scroll. Rin nodded out of habit, while she caught it, before she was white-eyed. Realizing what the boy was about to do. Are you serious? Rin nodded out of habit, while she caught it, before she was white-eyed. Realizing what the boy was about to do. Are you serious? Well, we have a serious monkey problem, the Achiha pointed to the beast that was rampaging, stomping his feet, creating mini earthquakes. He could, god forbid, blow up the small country the fort is far away from civilization, but one misplaced tailed beast, and kaboom. A lot of dead people. And you know a way to stop that? Kakashi asked, as he appeared from below, his left hand carrying the dead core of his enemy. Well, apparently there is a way Abito said, but, there is always a but with you, isn't it? Kakashi sighed, tossing the core towards Rin's feet. Thanks for the assist by the way. Your clones made a good distraction. Well, you are welcome. Abito nodded, as the last one of them team also came up to the wall. Guy wasn't injured, but his green spandex was kinda ripped in places, and burned marks were on it. He was fighting the explosive sword user. So it was given. And his opponent was alive, unlike Kakashi's, but was too damaged to live for long. Guy did a number on the guy. The man's face was all mangled up, and his chest was caved in pretty bad. Barely breathing. And with a well-placed shuriken from Abito, he was dead. What did I say about playing with your food keeping a half-dead shinobi was always a bad idea, self-destruct, killing any other hostage, even creating a small distraction, could make things a lot difficult. Of course it was standard Anbu training that Kagami had made him learn. Other than Kakashi, others wouldn't know that maybe after returning, they should go on a crash course on Anbu training. Guy looked confused, while Rin rolled her eyes. You really can joke in this situation Kakashi just sighed, what a dark guy really hate you sometimes. Oh, did you say something? 
Sometimes my ears don't register the voice of the incredibly weak. And water is wet, and the floor is made out of floor. Guys, it's not the time. Rin said, almost whined, pointing to the giant flaming monkey. Her teammates were strong, but they were damn annoying sometimes. Explain your plan Achiha, if you really can deal with the monkey, then we will give it a try Kakashi said, if not. I'm calling for a retreat. Abito nodded and began to explain. So our last resort is a pot and a bunch of paper. Kakashi said, looking at the glass jar that Abito had, a few injutsu seal on the lead and the bottom. And some papers. I don't like the odds, one bit oh, don't be a baby, Abito rolled his eye. Wait, if this tailed beast was supposed to be from the stone village. Doesn't it mean that there might be some stone shinobis in the mix? Rin was the one to ask. A very logical question. Guy said, looking at Abito and Kakashi. I have checked the chakra signatures, and I don't sense any foreign chakra signature from the group. Kakashi answered. The boy had a talent for remembering stuff, and while he was in the fort, he had made a note to recognize all the chakra signatures. A skill that only skilled sensors had. Wait, you can sense stuff here I see only a light bulb with my sensing. Abito said. But then again, Kakashi's sensing ability was based on smell, while his was based on sight. Of course that's why you are still a Chunin, Junior. The boy replied smuggingly. Abito was about to reply, but Rin cut in. Enough with you too. The Kanoichi said, don't delay things any longer, if this works then good, if not she paused, not finishing the sentence. People will die if the rampaging monkey isn't stopped. A good chunk around the monkey was already on fire. If not then it's someone else's problem. Kakashi said, I'm sorry, but I value my teammates' lives more than other people. Even if it's other Kanoha Shinobis maybe that's what his father felt when he was framed years ago, but unlike him, he could trust his back to his teammates. Oh you will melt my heart, senpai. Abito snorted, ruining the moment. And as a matter of fact it will work. The Achea then handed out two paper seals to Guy and Kakashi. Just follow the plan, like I told you to at least one on each arm my clones will distract it. Good luck guys Rin said, as she was going to stay behind. And collect the swords and bodies of the missed swordsmen. From the given information, this was probably a setup from Mist to start the war between Iwa and Kanoha. And she was needed if one of them got injured. Also as a water user, she was also in charge of setting out the forest flame. Let the fire of youth burn high, friends. The forest is already on fire, my friend. Try another catch for us. Then okay, this is getting annoying now. Rin said, just go Abito just cackled a laugh as they took the charge. Fire Pokemon here I come Shinku Yuhi wasn't having a good day. The day started off good, meeting four promising Shinobis from the village. He was surprised when he saw that they were sent in for an air rank mission. The village was having a lot of talents lately, and he felt proud of the kids in a way. But then again, maybe he was just getting old. If the future was like this, then maybe he could retire early and not worry that much. His life as a shinobi started bumpy, having no talent whatsoever in ninjutsu and tojutsu, he was at the back ranks in his generation. But after finding his master and gaining mastery over jinjutsu, that soon went away. He even had the opportunity to have a family, have a good wife and a daughter. And yet her wife had died in an attack because of foreign shinobis a few years back. She was at the hospital when Stone Village attacked and kidnapped one of the heirs of Hyuga clan. He felt devastated back then, and while he lost her loving wife, her daughter lost her mother. Kurinai was never the same after then. And it was also the reason why he had stayed as an active shinobi, rather than leaning back as an academic teacher. If the borders of Konoha were safe, then the hospital incident could be avoided. And with his experience, he earned the commanding position of one of the border forts. So when he saw Abito in the group, he was quite happy. The young boy was nothing like the Achihas, having more of a relaxed manner similar to Kagami. Not to mention that he was the same boy that fought back against a stone shinobus at that day, and he was what maybe five back then. He was the miracle child of Konoha after the incident. Some even compared the boy's talent to the late Madara Achiha. And as the years went by, his reputation only grew. While he admired him, his daughter had gained an obsession over the boy. A childhood crush. It was amusing and annoying at the same time. But he wasn't opposed to the idea of his daughter's interest. 
though, he could clearly see the youngest son of the Hokage having an interest in her daughter as well. Huh, children. Not even ten, and they already had a triangle set up. He snorted at his own attempt of a joke. Anyway, after the four young Shinobus had left. Things soon turned for the worse after the young ones left, barely an hour later, they were attacked. But it was an unusual one. Most of the times, their forts were attacked by Mist Shinobus, they always came in large groups of 20 or so. Attacking and fleeing into the waters immediately. That's why they were forced to make a large wall to cover the attacks. The land of flowing water was small, compared to the fire country. It was only double the size of Kanoha, so they had to build the wall, then the ford amongst giant trees to cover the country of the border. The small country even didn't have its own shinobi force, and relied heavily on Kanoha. Though the land of flowing water had a lot of minerals and other natural resources that it could provide Kanoha for their service. Anyhow, that was the reason why their border fort mattered a lot. And Mist always wanted the land of flowing water for themselves, even though the water daimyo wanted to stop the approach many times. This time the attack was different. It appeared that six stone shinobis were the main culprit behind the attack. The keyword being appeared. The six of them were nothing like your usual jonin grunts. No, they were strong, by his estimation, all of them were elite jonin level. And that was worrying. Usually, Stone Village was keeping their activities low in the past months. And not only that, even though the this border fort could be attacked by Stone Shionbis by crossing the sea, they never did. It was because of the ocean. Those Stone Humpers hated water more than the Kiri and were in a disadvantage in there. But these attackers were different, he just couldn't put his figure on it. They wielded swords to charge the attack and avoided the use of ninjutsu. They were skilled yes, but they weren't that hard to handle. And it seemed that the attackers wanted to get behind the wall, Shinku seeing the obvious benefit as the enemy would be surrounded the moment they crossed the wall he let them. And that was a mistake. All of them then summoned weird looking swords after crossing the wall. And the Kanoha commander knew who they were, they were no stone shionbis, no they were the seven swordsmen of the mist. Their swords boosted their strength greatly, and the most doing the damage was the explosive sword user. But while he recognized them, other shinobis hadn't. It was a blessing and a curse in a way. The mist swordsmen were quite famed. But with none of his soldiers knowing, it wouldn't let them take steps with caution. But at the same time, they won't be overwhelmed with fear either. As the mist shinobi were quite famous. And it wasn't if he could make an announcement in mid-battle of their real identities either. They were having a life-threatening battle here, and there was no time for monologue here. He wanted to call for backup. He wasn't worried that his soldiers wouldn't be able to handle them, no, he wanted backup because of the unusual way they attacked. Maybe they were only distractions, and a whole fleet of Kiri Shinobis were hiding in the sea, only to come behind them. The seven swordsmen were skilled, he would give them that, but the Kanoha Shinobis under his command were not unskilled either. And Shinku made sure to have the wind users blow out any mist that the other party was trying to summon. Without their hiding ability, they were getting swarmed with Kanoha Shinobi. Some even being lucky to deal damage before going on the next life. While the mist liked to boost about their seven swordsmen, they were never that skilled except a few. They only had the swordsmen set up so that they could barely counter against Yuzuemki swordsmanship. In his opinion, Kumo had more skilled swordsmen than the mist. Miss just liked to brag stuff because of all the clans living under the same village. So Commander Shinku wasn't worried as he monitored the fight. He wasn't in the leading position, and as much as he liked to get there and finish the battle, he knew that his position had some responsibilities. And one of them was not engaging in battle until it's necessary. Honestly, in his opinion, if there was a few Sharingan users in his squad, then the battle wouldn't have so many casualties. While the swordsmen were skilled, mastered Sharingan users could hold them back one on one. Of course, he only thought this way, because having the utmost respect for the Sharingan. And as a Genjutus user himself knew how it helped when a few years back, the Achiha clan stared sharing some of their jutsu outside the clan. Alas, there was no Achiha in the group. The Kanoha council men he was under didn't want the blood-eyed clan in the borders, but in the village instead. It was such waste of a talent really. As the fight went on, the enemy started getting sloppy. 
and they seemed to be winded as the fight went on. There were a few casualties, but he was certain that his border squad would get the honor to kill the group by the end of the day. They had a lot of shinobus here, and they knew how to fight. Still, he wanted to call back up, just in case. Shinku Yuhi was horrified when he saw some of his own soldiers sabotaging them and helping the missed shinobus. H. How was that possible? His team was selected by one of the Konoha council members, and they were supposed to train from young to be loyal shinobus. And had no signs of hostility whatsoever. Of course, not all in his team, backstabbed, only a few of them, but it let the missed shinobus seep through the cracks and get in a bit deeper. It also created distrust among the ranks. With some of the Konoha shinobus backstabbing their own, the whole thing started to fall apart. No one knew if the person by his side could be trusted. And it was a major drawback. It was then things started to get chaotic. Shinku regretted not taking action himself, and so he grunted orders to get his soldiers to snap out of it and work together, and he led the charge with a powerful multi-target Jinjutsu. A powerful Jutsu that he was taught by Sensei, who was of the Kurama clan. The six mist swordsmen, clated in stone shinobi attire, didn't see the attack coming. And three that were back from the group were hit by his Jinjutsu. Falling immediately in the aftermath. It was one of the hidden Jutsus of the Kurama clan that came with a hefty price. All three of them were immobile immediately after getting hit by the attack. But Shinku was breathing heavily at the aftermath of the Jutsu, blood coming out of his nose, ear and eyes, he coughed some blood as well. He quickly gulped three soldier pills not lose consciousness. He would feel the effects of using the Jutsu by the end of the day. But that wasn't important. Three enemies were down, and three more to go. But out of the three, one of them overpowered his Jutsu with sheer chakra alone. And quickly began rampaging with his large sword, if he wasn't wrong, that was Samahata. A club-like sword with scales on it. Shinku seeing this quickly took the time to throw some kunais to kill the two downed enemies before his allies could help them up. His Jinjutsu wasn't easily broken and would give even a Jinjutsu expert a long day to snap out of, but just to be on the safer side, he blew them up. The other three didn't even care for two of their own dying, while the fourth one went into a rampage with his large sword. His attacks deadly but were easily avoidable because of his lack of awareness. So while his squad kept him in check, Shinku ventured further to catch up and stop the last three of the missed swordsmen. But he was too late, as when just a bit later, one of them opened a large scroll, summoning what appeared to be a bloodied bag. One could easily guess there were someone living creature in there it didn't even make sense. Living things shouldn't be able to survive inside a summoning scroll with no air to breathe. And other effects that made it impossible to carry prisoners in sealing scrolls. And the living creature was no ally to the swordsman either, it looked like a prisoner. Why were swordsmen of the mist dumping a prisoner of in Kanoha, it didn't make sense. But what didn't make sense, even more, was what happened next. Fire started coming out of the bag, and with a sheer release of chakra, a giant flaming monkey came alive. Enlarging in size. It was no summoning beast, no it was a tailed beast. And with horror, he saw how easily the monkey started rampaging in the forest, his soldiers dying, and the enemy shinobus were found nowhere. So that was their plan all along. They didn't want to break into the land of water, no, the mist wanted to destroy it with a foreign-tailed beast. Shinku ordered his soldiers to quickly go on the defensive and not let the beast get near the settlement areas of the land of flowing water. Many civilians would die if that happened, even though they were not his countrymen. As a commander, he was ordered here to protect the country, and he would do that even if it cost his lives. But how was he supposed to stop a giant-tailed beast, one of its attacks could easily wipe a village from the map. The only reason the beast wasn't spamming its attack was because of its injuries. He had seen of the attacks reach the sea, it was devastating. And it was said that the first Hokage caught all of them when he formed the Kanoha village. The giant monkey was enraged and also very much injured. Even though he could see it recovering with time. Because of that, it was only using more primal attacks instead of ninjutsu or whatever chakra-based attack it had in its arsenal. Shinka was terrified of what the beast could do. And he was about to summon his hawk to ask for backup or warn them of the danger, when he suddenly heard something. Have no fear. A voice said, it sounded deep and manly. Why? For backup is here. 
It brought all the attention to the source of voice. Even the giant angry monkey stopped his rampage to look at the source. It was the group of three young shinobis that he had sent this morning. The voice said. Gosh, that sounded a lot cooler in my head, the voice changed to a voice, of a kid? No, it was a Beatles. And it brought all the attention to us. It's a good thing that we are, but he wasn't able to finish his sentence. Shinku looked in horror, as the giant behemoth stopped the group. But just a moment before the attack hit them, he saw the trio, puff into smoke. Clones. So they were clones. The shinobi commander looked around and saw the three of them in the field, all of them carrying a lot of what seemed to be paper tags tags on them. And them with great speed flicked through the ground and air, slamming them onto the beast. And that wasn't all, he saw four abidos that somehow seemed to be flying. Wait isn't that the dwarf Anoki's jutsu? How did he oh he forgot the boy was an Ichiha, along with being a prodigy. But what happened next made the Yuhi flabbergasted. Earth style. Super weighted boulder jutsu. All four of the clones said at the same time as they touched the giant ape from behind. That was definitely the Tsuchikage's technique. The weight around the ape increased in significant proportions, creating a giant crated underneath, bringing the beast to its knees. For the first time, he saw the beast being on the back foot as it tried by failed to attack the young shinobis. Then the abido, the son of Sakumo in the green spandex wearing shinobi, moved fast around the beast. Hitting it with paper tags, while the beast was down. The whole battlefield which was littered with destruction, dead bodies and flames was now silent. As all of the Konoha shinobis stopped and watched silently at what the young ones were doing. He wanted to order his shinobi to attack the beast while he was attacked, but he suddenly felt a hand on his shoulder. He looked back and saw another abido. Hey, can you do me a favor? The boy asked. I think I can take down the beast with your corporation. Shinku would have snorted if it was any other kid. But him he was the miracle child of Konoha. So he just followed his gut and nodded. What do you need? Shinku said, he knew for a fact that this day would be put on the history book later on. He just wanted to have his contribution to it. The beast roared as it was held by the clone's gravity. They could hold the beast for a while. I just hoped, by then the preparations were finished. Well, at least on my side, everything was ready. Kind of. As an Ichiha of course I tried to make the beast fall into my Jinjutsu, but it wasn't even remotely possible. The resistance to my Jutsu was just too strong. And the backlash from it was a headache literally. Man, these were the times, I wished I found a way to unlock the Manjekyo. Of course without any sob story or getting nearly killed in the process. I had already explained my plans to my teammates and to Commander Shinku, by extension the other Kanoha Shinobis. I actually hadn't expected them to listen to me, that's why I made a bit of a show with my clones, by stopping the rampaging tailed beast. And it seemed to have worked. More so towards Commander Shinku. The man quickly barked orders to his men. His soldiers that were all looking at the scene dumbfounded moments ago started moving into cinch following his order. Man, that was some top-notch leading skill. I got to learn that, someday. Still, some were odd looking at what was happening. Not that I could blame them, our team, which practically consisted of 10-year-olds, was holding down a fucking tailed beast. We didn't take it down. We were just holding it, for the time being, it was a way to buy some time for what I was about to do next. As I watched, I could see the recovery of the beast slow dramatically. Whoever caught the beast, didn't trip him out of his jinchurki. Meaning, Rashi was still alive under all that fur and lava, not that I cared of course. Anyway, because of it having the human inside, it was weak. Someone might have messed up his seal. Again, it worked to my advantage. I had based my plan on how Gara lost control in the original. But now, it seeing the thing up close, it was more of a Naruto situation. Someone had messed up the tailed beast ceiling, pretty badly. The giant ape was kind of like a ticking bomb. It wasn't going to explode, but it would die with its jinchuriki. And if my plan works, I can rip him out of the stone shinobi, before he gets killed. I will set everything up when it's time, I will give the signal, I said, and jumped off when I saw the commander nod. While the mighty beast was roaring, trying to get get my clones off of its back. He used his tails as the last resort to get them off. But I didn't let them. Robin, take four clones and hold down his tails for a minute, I said, already going over the hand signs needed. 
I closed my eyes and didn't care as my clones came out of my shadows, going toward the beast with Geppo. I didn't need any distractions. I breathed in and out as I held my right hand forward with an open plan. When I opened my eyes, I could see a small dust release cube hovering over my hand. With control I changed its shape, making it look like a one and a half foot glowing stick. And with my left hand, I grabbed it with simple chakra strings and pulled it. The stick spun, making a disc shape over my hand. And I couldn't stop myself from grinning. All the training paid of my very own take on the Keke Tota. My musing was short-lived from a loud roar from the giant ape, whose tails were being pinned down by my armament rods. They were quite large, but I knew they wouldn't last for long. But I didn't need it to be long. At least two of the tails were pinned, and that was enough. I threw the giant spinning disc forward, calling out its name. Abido style. Destructo disc. Did I just name my own jutsu after my name? Yes, yes, I did. As the spinning disc moved forward, I pulled on my left hand, chakra strings still attached to it, as it changed its direction towards the beast's tail. And with one swift motion, and without struggle four tails were cut at the same time. I let go of the control over the disc, as it soared upwards to the sky. I didn't have time to waste any time, going over hand seals. Even if the giant ape was giving an earth-shattering scream for cutting its tail. Earth style? Mud coffin jutsu. After learning to cinch three different chakra natures, it came quite easy for me to use mud release. It was basically an earth jutsu, with yang to make its structure liquefy. Contrary to popular belief, it's not earth and water. The ground in front of me turned liquid as it shot forward, wrapping around the cutoff tail, getting them away from the beast. I didn't want the damn monkey to reattach it with its broken ass ability. I huffed as I held my knees, taking out one of the special soldier pills that Hiruzen had given me. Oh, I was going to have an upset stomach today. Stupid pill drawback. I gulped it down as it started auto-recovering my chakra. With my already stacked chakra recovery, it was just compounding its effects. For the next 5 minutes, I would have basically unlimited chakra. But that didn't mean I could abuse my ability. Too much chakra in a single jutsu, and I will lose any muscle gains that my current body pauses. My fat stores were already gone, by the time I gulped the pill, it was super effective, and the drawback was super annoying. There was a reason why people didn't spam it. But there weren't many whose body could handle the struggle, to begin with. I looked at my handy work, the four tails were now detached from the beast. Now they were wiggling like giant worms of lava. The monkey didn't like it when I cut off its tails. But sadly it couldn't do anything. Other than what seemed like shitting lava from his behind, towards me. But my earth jutsu, gave me enough defense to cover my ass. It did make the surrounding quite hot. Meh, it wasn't a bother. My body didn't seem to react to much too high temperatures, it seemed. Maybe it was due to my unique breathing style. Or maybe I was too good of a fire release user. I shrugged, as I had better things to do. I had a giant scroll unrolled in the ground, the paper being filled with kanji, with ink seals all over it. The moment all of the 64 sealing tags were in place, I will start the sealing. In the middle of seal was a small glass jar. This will be the monkey's new home, after everything was said and done. I quickly made a hand sign, connecting with my clones. Getting a quick report of the progress. While the four clones held down the flamed monkey with the gravity jutsu. The others were helping Kakashi and Guy with placing the seals. Acting more like a destruction to let my teammate place the seals. I could also sense, Rin, she seemed to be a bit far. I felt a bit of frustrated at the girl for coming here, but I could sense the fear from her even from here. Picking up fear was quite the skill that I gained as the bat summoner. Rin seemed to be distressed, maybe because she couldn't help us in the battle. Not that I could blame her. She was skilled, quite a lot actually. But her skills were suited elsewhere. Not here. Her main job was our doctor and sniper. Wait, I should actually, look into modern chakra weaponry for her. Her archie was quite good, and she was practicing with Kashina for only a month or so. And she made the ice arrow a thing, man, it would be amazing to see what she could do with an actual sniping rifle. I mused. While her water and ice ninjutsu skills were top notch, but her body was too damn weak. It was a fact, 
Guy and even Kakashi could survive getting one or two punches from the giant beast, but she couldn't. That's why I told her to stay behind. She was far from the battlefield, but with the giant monkey on loose she wouldn't be safe. But I had other problems to worry about as well. Suddenly the wind rustled behind me, as I could hear a gasp coming from behind. What are you doing, Shinobi? Commander Shinku shouted, the man a few meters away from me. When I looked behind, I saw it. I expected as much. The attack was too planned to be outside work alone it was an inside job. So, there was a mole in the village. But attacking your savior directly. God these people are stupid. The Konoha Shinobi or the traitor behind me was holding a kunai, dangerously close to my neck, but was struggling hard to stab me with it. But he couldn't as my shadows had bound him, pinning him in place, wrapping around his body like a snake. This will be a bother. But might as well. I directly looked into his eyes, my vision red as I made eye contact. Sharingan? Jinjutsu? It was still a bit sensational when my Sharingan spun in full glory. I couldn't see it, but I could feel it moving it kinda tickled at first. My musing was short-lived as I heard the Konoha trader gasp as he was put inside my Jinjutsu. But his body, on the other hand, moved on its own as he changed his kunai's direction and tried to stab himself in the throat. But of course, my shadows stopped it as well. You should have known there wouldn't be an easy way out of it. I rolled my eyes, I saw this coming from a mile away. But just to be sure, I grabbed the lower part of his face when he tried to cut off his own tongue. With one swift pull, I dislocated his jaw in a way where he wouldn't be able to do any self-harm. I was sure it felt jaw dropping to the others seeing a 10-year-old doing that to a grown man twice his size. Of course, pun intended. In normal circumstances, my Jinjutsu should have put him to sleep. But he had a certain few Jutsu marking on him, which made it hard for me put him in any Jinjutsu. My shadow binding was a huge help here. The Nara clan Jutsus were truly a masterpiece. Kagami had found an easy way to make better use of their own clan Jutsu, with some creativity. Even Abito had to say that the Crow Summoner was truly an outside-the-box thinker. Inside my shadow was a bat. And its only job was to monitor anything around me, with its keen hearing and sensing, and trapping any opponents with the shadow jutsu. With this, the drawback of the shadow jutsu was gone. No need to do any hand signs, just give a mental command, and it will be done. It was even easier than my clone jutsu, so I could pull it of just fine. That man truly was amazing abito muse to my own thoughts. As I saw the trader struggling to break free. Seeing him in the clutch of a beast. The other traders jumped at me. Some aimed to kill me, while others tried to kill the trader in my grasp. I really had better things to do. I don't have time to play games. Suddenly tendrils shot out from my shadows like a blur, cutting away my enemies. Decapitated bodies littered on the floor as the Kanoha Shinobis looked at me with horror and respect. I did take down four Jonin level ninjas without moving from my spot. But what else could they expect, I had been training my ass of with Hiruzen and Kagami for the past month, and the dust release wasn't the only thing that I had mastered. Not to mention, the suffering the grand lady was putting me through, to gain my secondary fear ability. And yet, when I trained with those old bastards, I only saw a giant hill that I had to cross. Reaching cage level is easy, my ass. Heck, I wasn't sure if even with a perfect curse seal and my arsenal of jutsus, clones, the Katsurigan even with all of that I wasn't sure I could survive if they tried to harm me. They were just that damn strong. And Madara clapped five of them, like they were wet behind the ears. I didn't like it one bit when the dear Ichiha sensei of mine beat me in sparing sessions, 10 days straight, without even opening his Sharingan. He bloody, well, humbled my worldview there. Show off. And I wasn't the only one who improved. Kakashi in the past month was pushing himself harder, now that his dear daddy was back from border duty. And his fighting style with his lightning release was amazing now. I would have scoffed if it was anything different, that old man was strong as Kagami, and he had a damn Susanoo. I had asked Kagami about it a week ago. Asking who was stronger. And he said that he viewed Sakumo as his equal. He wasn't sure if he could win, without losing a limb or two. And Kagami wasn't a man who gave humble replies, and he had a Susano for crying out loud. I didn't hide my jealousy of my lust for power. 
The difference between an elite zone and a cage level was too huge. But then again, Rasa was a future cage, and Hashirama was also a cage. Not all cage level fighters were similar in strength. Might Guy had the least amount of improvement, but he still got stronger than when we fought in the exams. Maybe, Kakashi and him were equal, if they let everything loose. Hmm, I should give him the Goku treatment and build him a gravity chamber. It will piss off Kakashi, and as a dear friend, it's my duty to piss him off. The Seven Swordsmen had no chance when they crossed our path. They were already exhausted from battle and had to fight my clones along with their opponents. It was no big brainer why they went down so fast. Even though, my clones basically acted as distractions towards Kakashi and Guy's opponent to give them a quick win. But this was war. Who the fuck cared about being fair here? I looked at the last remaining traitor, still in my grasp. And he seemed afraid, with this close, I could practically smell it. Yes, I had some stupid ass abilities. So you do feel fear? I said, I didn't even use any fear toxin. And here I thought Danzo curved those emotions out of you fools I spoke in a low voice, but the traitor heard it just fine. And he was white-eyed. Checkmate. Rather than putting him to sleep, I opened one of his eyelids and stared at it with my Sharingan. Trying to probe through his memories. Usually, it would take a lot of time to find where the betrayal came from, but of course, I had my trusty canon knowledge. And the man's surface thoughts were all flooded with Danzo and Root. So, it is Root. I gave out a frustrated sigh after checking. The dead bodies around me, and only a few of them were my doing, most of them were from the giant ape, or the mist swordsman. And I am sure that their loved ones would be devastated. Fucking Danzo. I will find a way to kill you before you become a bother. The Kanoha trader dropped like a beanbag. And I kicked him in the chest, towards some of the soldiers. Bind him, up. We will need him to find out who's responsible for the whole mess. I said, not bothering to pay anything mind, and looked back towards my main goal. That was a lie, the traitor would never speak. Danzo that sly bastard also had a seal that was behind their ears, and fried their nerves, making them basically living vegetables. What are you doing? You heard him. I could hear Shinku barking out orders to capture the traitor. I wasn't worried about other traits being there. While Danzo's slave mark was quite the nifty work. I was that good. I had gone through the traitor's memories, and there was no one left after I killed the last group. Still, I will keep my guard up, just in case. The old bastard knew how to hide his ass. I will bring it up with Hiruzen and Kagami. I just hope they believe me. But then again, I have no proof, so the most likely outcome is him getting another slap to the wrist. The roar of the giant monkey broke me out of my thoughts. Oh, that thing was still here. For now, I need to seal that damn money. I looked back at the giant tailed beast. Actually, I imagined it to be a lot bigger. But then again, he was critically wounded. Whoever beat him up, did a very good job. And didn't let him heal. Packing him into a time bomb and dropping him here. That's why the four tailed beast was weak. It couldn't heal from his injuries, and with my tags, it couldn't properly use its chakra. My tags weren't some original ideas I came up with, no, they were normal Uzumaki Mito sealing tags made specifically for tailed beasts. She had made that seal if any time Karama got out of hand, and there weren't any adamantium chain users nearby. Kashina had trusted me with this jutsu, a year ago. Saying that if she ever got out of Kantaral, then it should be Minato or me to put her down. I hated how her bubbly attitude always had a lingering sadness. A sadness that she wasn't ordinary. I fucking hated it. And now that I could pick up emotions on he fly, I hated it even more. Even though she acted all bubbly and happy. She had fear, anxiety, and anger all bubbling up inside her. It was her, not Karama's. She was like a sister and a mother to me. Even though Granny Might took the most care of me. She was the one that broke me out of my shell after the hospital incident. Sure I gained my Sharingan to protect others. But there was also a lot of sorrow seeing that many deaths. Not to mention, at that time, I didn't even consider the world a reality. She helped quite a lot. And I hated how things went with her. At least now, she had some control over the fox, so it wasn't all bad. She still didn't know his name though. So they still had a bridge to build. Still, I didn't like it at all. And that's also the reason why I'm going to seal the four tails in the jar, not in myself. 
it was a golden opportunity. I could have sealed that thing inside of me and bullshitted my way through stuff. Believe me, I could say the stupidest thing, and with me having the backing of the Hokage and the clan. I could have gotten my with it. But I won't. Getting a sentient tailed beast would have been easy. But I like being myself, without any influence. And not to mention, if me being an outworlder, the beast might find it out as well. And I wanted none of that. The flaming beast roared, fire and lava coming out of its body. All of my clones that were holding him down wore armament gloves, but they won't hold it for too long. Damn. Note to myself, when I get out of here, I will make at least a hundred of those for backup. Actually, I will make a hundred of everything related to Fuinjutsu just for backup. It's time I heard in my mind. I readied myself as Nightwing gave the signal. Guy and Abito were quite winded and took steps back near the other Kanoha Shinobis. I looked to my side, looking at Commander Shinku. Sir, it's time I said. The man nodded. And started barking orders again. Props to that man for listening to me. Others would have scoffed at a 10-year-old like me taking charge of sealing a tailed beast. Sealing a tailed beast wasn't that hurt. Even more so, when it was this weak. I didn't give it time to recover. If I had given the beast at least half an hour, it would have gained back all its strength and demolished the country. It might even start going towards the fire country after destroying this one. Because the other side was just sea, and fire and water don't mix well. Danzo really was a sly bastard. He made this border the target for a simple reason. It was quite far from Yuzushigakur, so no Yuzumaki sealing team would come to the base's aid until it was destroyed. This beast could have been easily dealt with by an Yuzumaki sealing master and some Yuzumaki jonins who had chakra chains. And they had an abundance of those in their village. By then he would get the perfect opportunity to reel up the Shimura, Hayuga, and his other pet clans to push for a war with Stone. And it will eventually lead to spread out to the rest. That man was warmonger through and through. Even it killed his own villagers, he would strive for war and power. No wonder Kanoha was sending child soldiers in the canon third shinobi world. Whereas the village was made by both Hashirama and Madara to stop children from dying. Oh you poor bastard, you really are on my kill list now. I breathed in and out, calming down my nerves. Even if I felt angry and frustrated, I had to push that aside. I can't let those thing be a bother. Even though I was in theory a ceiling master, nowhere near a ceiling elite like Kishina or Mito, I didn't have any practical knowledge of sealing living things. But I wasn't alone, as I quickly went through hand signs. I hope she isn't too annoyed I placed my hand on the ground. And with a poof, an old bat appeared. And she seemed to be pissed. Uh oh. I thought you were gone for a simple courier mission, brat. The old lady bat screamed as she flapped her wings and sat on my shoulder. How did you manage to get yourself tangled with a tailed beast? The bat cave was too chaotic for me to not notice. Did you think I wouldn't find out about it? If you didn't summon me in the next five minutes, I would have made my way here. She shouted, right near my ear. I really hated my super hearing sometimes. But at the same time, I also felt a bit of glad that the old bag was actually concerned about me. I I'm sorry, my dear lady. But I'm in a pinch here. I said, awkwardly, pointing at the lava spewing beast. I really need your help for this one, the old bat snorted. You and your problems are, uh, she said, before looking down at the huge scroll and sealing formula. You are prepared, so that's good. And it's an Uzumaki seal, so it shouldn't be too problematic, she mumbled mostly to herself, before snapping her small head towards me. You aren't going off easy after this, brat. I will help you this time. But after this is over, your training is going to be twice as hard. I kinda expected that, but still, it scared me. The old hag was already brutal with my training. Pushing my Jinjutsu and sensing skills to limits that shouldn't be possible. Heck, if this incident happened a year later, I was sure that my Sharingan could at least put the tailed beast to sleep. She was just that effective, but that didn't mean I liked her training. Why yeah, sure, I said. But help me here, will you? My sentence was cut off when I felt the foreign chakra enter my body. I could clearly see the small bat's feet merge with my shoulder through my clothes. And my sense of chakra and control over it increased dramatically. My glitch vision automatically activated as my Sharingan spun in full glory. Fuck, this felt amazing. 
I could sense chakra, not only from my sight or hearing no, I could feel it from everywhere. Even my exposed skin was picking up chakra. And I I felt stronger than ever. Brat, I don't have all day. Seal the damn monkey. That brought my attention back. Fuck, I felt amazing. Let's see how I do with my first ever sealing. I slowly ran through four hand signs before kneeling down. Ninjutsu squad. Be ready. Shinku braked from far. I could feel the crackle of chakra as all the ninjutsu users prepared a simple lightning release jutsu with all of their chakras. Even Kakashi was there. Guy on his side held the giant explosion sword in his hand and took a running position. His gates already opening to six. All of them were prepared, and so was I Yuzumaki Fungitus. Sealing of the Hundred Beasts. I clapped my hands as red lightning light chakra crackled before I slammed it on the scroll around the jar. Seal. Chakra erupted as red lightning made its way toward the tailed beast. Hitting it before it turned dim. Some might wonder if this was the end. But I knew this was just a beginning. Suddenly, chakra chains, 64 of them erupted out of the tailed beast as it cried out in pain. I didn't like it that I could also sense his fear, pain, and sadness. I bit the inside of my mouth to push any thoughts away. I didn't need any hesitation bothering me. The chains came out before they extended and slammed into the unrolled ceiling scroll in front of me. They were no adamantium chains, but they were the next best thing. Do it now, I shouted, as I held onto the jutsu with my dear life. This jutsu wasn't like the death reaper seal, which didn't exist here. But this was just as dangerous, an inexperienced user will be killed when performing it. Luckily, he had an awesome bat on his shoulder. A grumpy guardian angle? I chuckled inwardly. Boy focus the old bat said. Wait, could she read my mind? Don't know, and don't want to know. Because the tailed beast was making its last ditch effort to get away from me. But then I heard it. A crowd of voices. Lightning style. Lightning arrow jutsu. They said, the whole Konoha shinobi force at the same time. All of the jutsus landed on its target. And why wouldn't it? Because of the old bat's help, I could not only see through walls, but also the giant ape itself. And what I found kinda surprised me to be honest. Kakashi's adamantium sword Akito had extended from its base and planted inside the giant beast's chest, using it as a lightning rod to deliver the lightning release. Paralyzing it immediately. With no resistance, for a short time, I started sucking up the beast as its chakra started getting drained, turning small as it was getting dragged near me. Its whole body is still dragging across the ground, with my clones using the gravity jutsu to force it down. It gave me another final struggle, but I was ready for it. As Guy jumped, more so dashed from his spot and threw the giant explosive sword right in the beast's face. Creating a large explosion as the Tajutsu user was flung back in air while the beast stepped back towards the ceiling. But I was wittied when the beast managed to catch my friend in his last struggle for freedom. The tailed beast was smaller now, but still, his hand was larger than the boy. Fuck, I had to do something, or if the beast squished then my friend would be toothpaste out of the tube. But as my last saving grace, I saw the giant beast's hand get frozen by a wild arrow. Thank god, Rin acted in time. Guy might not be free, but he won't be squished hopefully. Under my telepathic command, my clones took action. Don't worry, my guy. One of my clones said, as he did a few hand signs, creating a small white cube. The combination of three chakra releases combined into one, making something new out of it. We got you. The other one on his side finished. I snorted at my own clone's attempt at a joke. Amateurs. The white cube extended to a large stick on the first clone's hand. While the clone on his side started rotating it with extreme speed. Abido style. Destructo disc. Both of them shouted, flinging the disc-like chakra projectile toward the giant monkey. I kinda cringed when I heard it from my own mouth. Fuck, that didn't sound cool at all. The flying white disc flew in the air, cutting his hand clean off the moment it hit him. I sighed in relief as I saw Guy getting freed. And I wasted no time pulling the damn thing into the jar. Gritting my teeth, I finished the struggle with one last push before I fell to my knees. My breathing was rough. Now that the giant flaming beast was gone, I had noticed that it was already night. Huh, neat. 
I was getting damn sleepy anyway maybe I can. Boy, don't even think of sleeping or falling unconscious, or you might just never wake up. The old bat said, and she didn't seem to be joking. Well, she never joked. But I as the shinobi world's batman did wait did that mean, I'm this world's version of the batman who laughs. I shook my head, my head wasn't thinking straight. Too much exhaustion was jokes lame. Also, I noticed one issue, which depending on the way you looked at it. Wasn't one it could be an opportunity. Pushing back the exhaustion, I opened another scroll. This one was a normal ceiling scroll. The cut of four tails and the monkey's hand had dimmed down after the beast was sealed. And as they weren't alive, or the fact that I couldn't feel any sentient from it, I stored it in my scroll. And before my teammates could come to me, I quickly gave it to the old bat and unsummoned her. She would be mad, but I could easily cook up a bullshit story if she wasn't here. Also, I will take this as an unofficial payment for my sealing service. And the tailed beast wasn't going to miss his hand or his tails, I could easily see that he was already recovering them inside the jar. Fuck this day was eventful. And I want a damn long vacation after this. My vision started getting blurry, as the chakra exhaustion started kicking in. The old bat had already warned me, but I really needed to sleep. It was a good thing as well, as Kakashi landed in front of me, with Guy by his side, his hand over his shoulder. Oh, you are just in time. I said, more so stumbled. I want some Raymond after this with this, my lights were out, but at least I found myself not falling to the ground, and the dog boy might have caught me. Or hear Anna Chidori through my heart that was dark. Okay, my jokes were getting damn lame right now. Maybe a sleep isn't that bad. With this, I was out for good, this time. Abito was not having a good day. When he woke up in Kanoha, he was quickly ordered to give the Hokage his mission report. Which in the grand scheme of things was a lot more important. But that didn't mean he was okay with it. He had to be waked up forcefully from a chakra exhaustion coma. So his mood was on the irritated side of things. Abito, I want a full report of what had happened, Hiruzen said, sitting in the other side of the table, with a morbid look. The man seemed to be stressed out. I have already asked the rest of your teammates, only your report is left. And it is very important of course, it would be he hadn't been asleep for what 6 hours and he was woken up. How did he get back to the village so fast? Minato was out to the land of Toad's Meh he will think about it later. He didn't know what was happening in the village either. He wasn't woken up in the hospital. Nope, he was wakened up here on the Hokage's office couch. So the first thing he saw after waking up was the Hokage's grumpy face, it made his already sour mood even sourer. So, can you give the report? Harrison said before his face softened a bit. I do you know you had a long day, catching a beast, playing a hero the Saratobi smiled a bit. But we must get to the boring part of being a shinobi. The Achiha grumbled, but nodded. He wondered where the four tails was, but didn't have to look that far, as the monkey's jar was placed under a cloth on the Hokage's desk. Well that was unexpected. But the boy shrugged as he looked around the cage's office. How about you shoo away your Anbu and call Kagami you will have a lot of shocking news to unpack. And he might also be able to give you emotional support Anbu go outside and seal the room, here is embarked the orders, cutting him off. Abito had a frown, when the procedure was done. I'm guessing Sensei's not in the village? Hiruzen sighed, but nodded. I have sent him to a particular mission of the books, and he won't be available for a while. Actually most of the Moraces are sent out of the village the border situation is turning pretty bad right now. And not to mention Hiruzen sighed, please go on, Abito nodded. It would have been easy if he was here. He said, taking out a silent seal and a few others and stacking them on the table. Hiruzen raised an eyebrow. But he didn't stop the boy from finishing setting up all the privacy seals. Let me explain, then with that Abito started giving a detailed report on what had happened. From detailing the seven swordsmen's attack to the tailed beast. And all of the jazz. The only part he left out was about the Roots and Danzo's involvement. Why? Two reasons, the first well, Abito forgot one thing when he was on the mission, that no one knows about him meddling into the Yamanaka arts. So he couldn't explain how he was able to get that information out. Because your usual Sharingan Jutsu couldn't do that. 
So how the fuck was he going to explain the mind probing jutsus that only an expert Yamanaka knew unlike them, he didn't need to weave any hand seals, using them with only with his Sharingan. And even though it was low on the list of treachery it was in fact treachery. All the Hokages knew about all the jutsus because of the agreement made by the Tabarama. Only Hiruzen was able to master all the jutsus in Konoha, which even Tabarama couldn't do. Kagami also knew about the Yamanaka jutsu, but he was an old dog learning old tricks. The Nara clan jutsu was easy to figure out, even if you don't have their clan techniques. Some of the Achiha in his clan knew that. But the Yamanaka clan liked their secrets. And their mind techniques were more valuable. That was why he couldn't flat out state his conclusion. And the second reason was simple, he didn't need to. Why? Because a lot of Konoha Shinobis survived after the border was attacked. And all of them would give reports on how only recently transported men, from one of the village elders, backstabbed the whole fort. Heh. Take that Danzo. The old man was rotting on destroying the whole fort and leaving no witnesses alive. But with him and his team melding it was stopped. If Hiruzen had more than one brain cell he would be able to connect the dots. And even if Hiruzen didn't want to take action against Danzo. He would need to find a very good explanation if he wanted to cover up that man's mess. Because many people died and they would want answers, Danzo was in deep shit now. The Hokage's face didn't change, but he could sense the shift in chakra and feel the unruly emotions boiling inside of him. There was also a tinge of sadness there. There was a long pause as the man digested the information. Matching them up with his reports and others. Abito, are you sure about your conclusion? The Hokage asked. See, that's why I told you it would've been better if Kagami was here, Abito grumbled, he was irritated yes. But in certain times acting like a spoiled brat helped you out of getting out of situations. Why would I lie to you old man I am pissy about the situation as you are. Also, if you want to recheck the info, then sorry, I won't let any Yamaka set foot in my mind. Hiruzen blinked, wait? Is that why you were asking Kagami? Because you don't want anyone else to recheck the info? Why else? Abito asked. Actually, he was a bit scared about it. The Hokage could use this chance to do a detailed check on his memories, and that would open the door for a lot of problems. Boy, I'm not that pleased that you don't rust me that much. Harrison said, huffing. He actually seemed to look hurt. Wait, you mean you trust me enough to take all of the things that I have said at face value? Abito was now confused and a bit flattered that the Saratobi trusted him that much. He even felt bad keeping secrets from him only a little bit. Of course boy, I know you have your secrets, but I also have experience dealing with kids like you. Abito scoffed when he was called a kid. Your character is a blend of Arachimaru and Jiraiya if you just had a hot temper, I might have congratulated you on having all three of their characteristic. He spoke fondly. Abito rolled his eyes. Okay, I get it you trust me and all, but I mean the hidden traitor Hiruzen's face fell immediately. An investigation is on its way and are there any hints anything you picked up on? Sadly all of them were dead. The traitors I mean. Abito said, even the last one I tried to make him fall into a Jinjutsu to give me some info, but he had a slave mark on his tongue and behind his left ear and he was killed before I was able to get anything out of him. Hiruzen didn't react. But he could feel the shift in his emotions. Sure he couldn't tell Hiruzen about his usage about his Yamanaka Jutsu, but that mean, the Achiha clan had no other way to probe info out of someone's mind. Though it was a long process, and that's the reason why he learned the mind-reading clan's Jutsu in the first place. Also, I might have another theory Abito hesitated. But it was a theory, not related to Danzo fully but. Hiruzen frowned, before sighing. Go on, I think the Uzumaki clan might have had a hand in planning the attack. The whole room fell silent, while Hiruzen looked at me as if I was telling him a joke. Okay, it's only a guess, but I'm pretty sure I'm right, Abito said as the Hokage motioned him to carry on. You see when I was capturing the beast. Pointing at the covered jar on the side of the table. I was able to come to the conclusion that only a good sealing expert could damage a Jinchurki's seal to that state. And that led me to suspect the Yuzumakis because there are no one who knows how to twist a seal to that limit, unless he's from that clan I would know as I was taught by one. 
Also, the use of adamantium chains was also visible on the seal it's a theory though you would need to have the Yamanaka probe the last remaining missed swordsman, yes about that he was killed during transport. I even made Rin wrap him up for you a bito fasipumd, before staring at the hokage with judgmental eyes. And so our village is infested with traitors huh? And none of them seem to be in a chiha. Hirazin looked at him with a hurtful expression. Bitch. You let our prime suspect die. It was a low blow on his part as Hirazin felt quite shameful about the actions he had done previously, but who cared? Abito was just pissed. Also, he did want to save the Uzumaki clan. But after what they did he was actually pissed at them. Because he was almost certain that one of them helping Mist was the reason for this whole situation. And that was important info that he didn't want to keep to himself. Many good Kanoha Shinobis lost their lives that day. And he couldn't just hide it. Also, it might flush out Danzo's involvement even more. Don't tell me you have lost the swords as well? No, all six of them are in Kanoha custody for now? Harazin said. Want one, he didn't answer just gave the man a flat look. Well at least the swords are safe. Anyway, it's really bad that we don't have any way to confirm the information, Abito said, it would have cleared things out. Harazin stared at the Acheha for a while before rubbing his head. There is a way to recheck the info. Abito looked at the cage with confusion. Rather than explaining, Hirazin removed the cover on the glass jar. We can always ask him. Abito blinked, blinked several times as he looked at the sealed glass on the table. Inside a small flaming monkey was sleeping or what appeared to be sleeping. The tailed beast looked harmless right now, his four tails wrapped around beneath him acting like a bed, while he lay on his side lazily. Abito looked at Hirazin, giving him a look seriously? The Hokage didn't say anything, just tapped on the glass jar a few times. And it had awakened the beast, and now was glaring at Abito with all hate and vigor. He doesn't seem to like you? Abito gave him a deadpan look. He's just going through a phase here as in blinked, laughing at the joke. It's never boring with either you or Kagami. Abito just rolled his eyes. Yo, can you hear us? He said as he tapped on the jar with his finger. The beast jumped up inside the glass jar, smashing the glass failing miserably to break it, but it seemed to be shouting at him. But the Abito remembered, I think I should tweak the seal to add volume to our mute monkey. Harrison nodded and gave him permission. And after a bit of tweaking the mic for the monkey was one. Going to kill you. Pluck out your eyeballs Abito lowered the volume again. Yeah this is going to take some time. Harrison sweat dropped at the situation. As a monkey summoner himself he felt kinda sorry for the trapped beast. And after some minutes of swearing, the monkey seemed to have calmed down. You chill bro? Fuck you. The monkey replied, before sitting grumpily inside the glass jar. Abito looked back at Hirazan. I think he doesn't like me you the monkey grumbled. You are the sole reason, I'm stuck here. Abito snapped his head back. Nah he gingerly replied, getting clearly amused at the frustrated monkey. I in fact saved your life. If I didn't seal you into the jar you would have died going boom boom like how you were supposed to go. A caged monkey is better than a dead monkey. The monkey fell silent. Before gruffing. Wait did he just win a verbal war against a tailed beast? Neat. Abito the questions, Hirazin said, getting tired of the Achiha's antics, even if they were all amusing. Oh right. Abito then looked at the monkey. Hey one question, big guy. Then you can have your eternal peace in your glass jar. Abito continued without pausing as the beast looked at him. Who messed with your previous Jinchurki's seal? The tailed beast snorted. Like I would ever tell you. Harrison clicked his tongue, but Abito wasn't the one to listen to a refusal. Too bad then, Abito said, sighing at the hokage. The Yuzumakis want you back for their research you know fair skin and red-haired people, uses adamantium chains and all the jazz. Very good with Fuinjutsu they want to give you a better home, but he was cut off. The monkey's confusion turned into fury. I'm going to kill that whole clan one of them is the reason that I'm here in the first place. Rashi is dead because of his messing with my seal. I will never forgive that red-haired bastard I annihilate them all. Now now your tendency to cause mass genocide to a whole clan won't give you back your freedom. Let's feelings and stuff. The monkey then jumped up enraged after he realized something. You tricked me. He said pointing his figure at him. And I'm going to take sick pleas in killing you. Abito turned down the volume again, 
before looking at the Hokage. On a lighter note it's confirmed that the Uzumaki betrayed us. This might have been the dumbest or might be the smartest thing I have ever seen Hiruzen said, pinching the bridge of his nose. But at least you got the info out, on a lighter note it's confirmed that the Uzumaki betrayed us. This might have been the dumbest or might be the smartest thing I have ever seen Hiruzen said, pinching the bridge of his nose. But at least you got the info out, I will take that as a compliment, so what do we do? Hiruzen looked at the Achiha, before sighing again. We can do nothing seeing Abito's annoyed expression he continued. You see even if the Uzumakis help the Mist in destroying our fort, we can't outright cut our ties with the clan. Not now at least Abito raised an eyebrow. Did something happen yes while you and your team were dealing with the six of the seven swordsmen Mist? The last one found his way to use a Shigakur there were some causalities, and the Uzumaki leader was one of them Abito was now shocked. So Mist double-crossed them. Well, they should have seen that coming here is and nodded. That's where I had sent Kagami. It didn't add up, how can one of the Mist assassins get into the land of Whirlpool? Most likely, the Mist Shinobi got there dressing up as a messenger and backstabbed him in the right moment. Abito could see why this might have happened. This most likely was Danzo's involvement. And also the attack on the small Uzumaki village was getting relentless. So they might have thought that switching sides was the best option. Though Abito didn't think went this way as the Mist already had its problems with bloodline clans, and a new one joining in no. So the most likely outcome would be the first one. Danzo. Maybe that bastard was the reason some Uzumaki listened in the first place. This this complicates things, Abito said. And this is the world of politics my boy. Harrison huffed. I need a smoke. He mumbled as he lit up his pipe. What you need is to cull out that little rat that's among us Abito grunted. I blame all problems on that raider. Harrison just glanced at him and didn't say anything. Abito hated every minute that sick bastard was alive, Danzo needed to be put down quickly. Abito was really missing his sensei right now. Kagami would have been bold about it. In the past month of training with him, he made it clear that he didn't like Danzo's way of doing things that much. As they weren't just training all the time, Abito was able to meet all the village elders, and other than Tarifu, he didn't like the others that much. But even though Abito was grumpy about the situation, he also had to look from Hiruzen's perspective, other than being a continuous backstabbing friend, Danzo had quite a lot of achievements under his belt. His Shimura clan for one had migrated half into the business in Konoha. So almost half of Konoha's business was either owned or sponsored by the Shimura clan. And the Hyuga clan, the Aburam clan, and the Inuzuka clan were all very loyal to Danzo. Most of the root members came from their orphans. And not to mention, he had countless secrets about the village. So on the books, Danzo was untouchable. But that was on the books who said, he couldn't do things his own way off the books. But then again, going after that sly bastard when he was in cage level would be suicide. Abito was sure if he could stabilize the curse seal, then he might be reaching the lowest end of cage, nowhere near here is in or Kagami. But a good place nonetheless. Well, did anything else happen while I was out? The boy asked, leaning back on his chair. Other than all of these of course yes Hiruzen said, as he took a drag from his pipe, before opening the drawer and tossing a letter towards the Acheha. See it yourself Abito did just that and was surprised. The letter here was an informal request from the new head of the Uzumaki clan Kenshi Uzumaki, to migrate their remaining clan members with Konoha. Kenshi was now the leader huh? The boy wasn't even 15, and already had the weight of the clan on his shoulders. But he made a good decision. This this is unexpected. Harrison puffed off the smoke. Even if a few of the Uzumaki clan betrayed us, they all didn't. And this request is from a leader that thinks about his people and wants them guaranteed safety. So are you going to refuse their plea for help? I can't even if I wanted, Hiruzen said, and Abito felt kind of relieved in a way. Even though he had mixed feelings about the situation. The Uzumaki clan had done a lot for us, and yes, they might have done something wrong. But Madara did the same thing after coming back with the Nine Tails many of our young shinobis died, Hishirama sensei had to almost give his own life to end his, and yet now, the Uzumakis are one of the most important pillar of Konoha. Abito felt a bit frustrated. Why couldn't why couldn't things be simple? What are your thoughts on the situation anyway taking all things into consideration what would you have done?
Honestly I don't know. Abito looked down. Come on give it your best shot, Hirazan said. What do you think we should do? Abito didn't say anything for a while before speaking. I I would have just turned a blind eye to the whole Uzumaki betrayal it never happened. And take the clan in that way they won't be ostracized and cut off from the other clans. The Achehas didn't like the treatment, and we are all loners for God's sake he said. And what benefit it might bring to the village. A lot actually the Uzumaki's sealing arts could change how we battle, it could even let other clans have good foundation on laying down traps and sealing jutsus. Even though it's the land of fire, with the Uzumakis we could have a lot of water jutsu user specialists, and that's not to mention they could mix very well like the Senju, and breed more powerful next generations. Me and Kakashi are quarter Senju, while Asuma is what? A half Senju so you see the potential in it. Don't you? Hirazan looked at Abito for a while, you know I will act as if I didn't hear the last part, how do you even know that stuff Asuma still thinks holding hands makes babies? Abito scoffed, of course, he's an amateur only kissing makes babies. He said puffing his chest, as if it was obvious. What? Let's agree to disagree. He said, I will have to tell Kagami to give the boy that talk the man said to himself. Abito shrugged, but he did enjoy messing with the old man. Well, other than the last part. I also had made the same conclusion, and I already sent the acceptance letter to the Uzumakis anyways, so there's nothing we could do. Harrison said. He accepted the offer of immigration of the Uzumaki into the village, sure he didn't know about the betrayal then, and he could most likely call back the messenger. But chose not to. When all things considered it was good for the village. It's surprising that we think alike, don't we Harrison said, thinking over the stuff. Please, I would do a better job. Huh, be my guest and take the hat. Abito paused. I walked into that one, didn't I? Harrison just smirked. That you did. Harrison sighed as he saw the Achiha leave his office. The boy wasn't even 10, and he was preparing for war. Harrison sighed yet again. This war was just useless. More people will die, some of the borders would be redrawn, and some people will come out with fame and fortune, while others will lose everything and do everything to seek revenge. He knew this, but there was nothing he could do about it. Well that wasn't totally true. Harrison's mood turned dark when he thought of Danzo it was obvious who was behind the border attack. And it was also obvious why he did that he wanted to start the war. But even with that, he couldn't do anything more than strip all authority from him. He did that the moment dots connected. Danzo now had no access to the roots or any of the shinobi resources that he had as an elder. He would still be an elder as stripping him of that title would ruin some public reputation of Konoha, but he was now powerless. Harrison snorted if only things were that easy. He was sure Danzo had some hidden players in the ordinary shinobi rankings. And he would need to keep an eye on them. Things were always difficult. If he were, to be honest, he was playing favorites. Danzo was his friend. He saved his life numerous times on the battlefield. Took Kunace and Shuriken for him. Even after he became the Hokage he helped him by doing a lot of undercover work. That's why even if he did something wrong, he would try to turn a blind eye to him. And that was the same case for both Kagami and Tarifu. But now it was getting obvious that Danzo wasn't the same man he once called his friend. He gave him one last chance, sure he stripped away all his ranking and power. But he could still live as a civilian in Kanoha. What he did was nothing short of treason, and nothing short of public execution would cut it. Yet he was giving the man a chance, but this would be the last. And he hoped that in the future he wouldn't have to take drastic measures against Danzo. Okay I didn't expect that I would receive this much attention. Abito grumbled as he sat at the dinner table. An old lady chuckled as she served the food. Well, you certainly did something noteworthy I don't think even the great Madara has that on his resume before turning 10. Granny Mai said, sitting near Abito. Well, it was an emergency, and the flaming monkey needed to be stopped. Abito said, well, and you know me, my inner heroism kicked in, and I kicked the monkey's ass. The old lady chuckled before it turned to a sigh. She seemed worried, though Abito, I'm really worried about you sometimes the rumors make it sound easy, but I know it's far from that. Just be careful. She said grabbing his grandson's hand. Just promise me you would be careful and don't go dying before me. 
Abito smiled sadly, I will try it's not me who throws himself in danger, but danger kinda follows me around. The old lady gave a small chuckle. The clan has a lot of expectations for you. The village do as well, but for me, even if you lead a normal life you will still be important, just know that. You don't have to push yourself hard. Abito didn't say anything, just stood up from his chair and hugged the old grandma. Don't worry about, will ya? I will be fine. She just nodded. The old lady didn't say it outright, but what she was meaning was leaving the shinobi life. But she also knew that Abito loved being one, so that's why she didn't flat out say it. Abito knew things were getting dangerous, and he couldn't always be selfish. The old lady cared about him a lot, so he also had to be careful. And he wasn't planning on dying anyway. And don't worry, the Hokage tasked me and my team to stay in the village for a whole year shinobi politics and all. He said. So I will be around here, and soon you will get annoyed with me, Abito said with a cheeky smile, making the old woman smile. While everyone in Kano has celebrated his and his team's fame in capturing a tailed beast and saving the border. It had completely opposite reactions from the other villages. The Kanoha border incident surely made them heroes to some, but it also made them a target for others. Jiraiya had sent a caution letter. His spy network picked up something. Mainly Kiri and the Stone Village were furious with their team. They had put on their bounties and might send hunter ninjas towards them. Mainly Kiri was furious that they lost six of their swordsmen to a bunch of kids. Their reputation was real-time low now. Actually they were the laughing stock of the five great nations. You are not so great when six of your most famed shinobis died to mere children. So Kiri was furious on Kanoha. The stone village was also furious at Kanoha, but also at Kiri. Mainly Kiri, and the word was they might start the war this time. The old man Anoki also didn't like that one of his old friends Rashi was dead because of them. Honestly, Abito expected that, in canon, the stone village tried really hard to win the war. Of course, they got their 10,000 slaughtered by a single man in the process. This world might be different from canon, but it also had a few similarities. Sun Agakura was silent, they also were cautioned about their team. And lastly Kumo, while Abito and his team were fighting a flaming monkey. On the other border that was with Kumo, a small clash happened. It was between Sakumo's team and small group of Kumo ninja. Rumors were one of the Kumo ninja was actually the son of Reikich. So it was obvious that they would target Kanoha prodigies if they had the chance. So any mission outside the village would put the whole team in danger. Their team had a lot of potential, and Hiruzen didn't want to lose that. That's why Kakashi, Rin, Guy, and him were ordered to be in the village for at least one year. Which was kind of let down to him, but it made sense. By the war would start fully, and even if Hiruzen didn't want to deploy child soldiers, the situation might need it. But there was a certain outlier. In canon the third shinobi war everyone against Kanoha, well, maybe not all. It was hinted that Suna fought at defending their borders only. But now, after the stunt that Kiri pulled, the stone's main focus is on Kiri. They have a history of killing each other's cage as it is. So Kanoha might not be in that bad of a position. Kumo is still out for Kanoha, but it seems that Hiruzen is trying to get with an alliance between Kanoha and Iwa. Which is funny as in canon they were at each other's throat. With all of the stakes in line, any child prodigies would be target because of future threat. All four in his team had Jonin level abilities. But Hiruzen didn't want to send out the team of child prodigies until they were even better. And it wasn't the only reason why he and his team was prohibited from going out on missions. No, you see Abito also needed some time to get a specific jutsu down. Due to their contribution, all of them got awarded by Hiruzen personally. For Abito that just so happened to be the Horatian Jutsu, or all the secret inner workings of it. Minato was almost finished with his training in the Toad Mountain, and he would help Abito try to learn Horatian. It seems that Minato wanted to teach Abito the technique from the beginning, but didn't have the permission because of Hiruzen. Now it wasn't the issue. The Horatian Jutsu was quite tough to learn alone, as not even Hiruzen could learn it. Even with Minato's help, there was no guarantee Abito could learn the Jutsu. He had tried already learning it, but failed once. So Minato's help might be the key to learning it. The difficulty of the Jutsu was because each Harishin user used the Jutsu in completely different ways. 
Space Ninjutsu had some Bizer and different rules. And so Ibido was sure he would need a lot of time to learn the Jutsu. Space Ninjutsu was quite tough. And that needed at least one year to even get the grasp off. Here is Nwante Ibido to learn it, mainly because of his team. Then he and his team would be able to get his team out of any sticky situation. The whole team Minato dynamic wouldn't work in the war. Here is an already planned on making Minato his own team of Anbu experts, which would be led by him. That didn't mean much, as team Minato wasn't disbanded or anything. But all of his teammates didn't like that. In the future things like the Kanoha border incident would be more frequent due to war. And if Minato wasn't there, all of them might get themselves killed if they got sorted. And that's why Hiruzen wanted Ibido learn the Horatian Jutsu to get out of sticky situations. There was also another reason why his team wouldn't be deployed. And it was because of the Uzumaki and other civilians that were moving into the village. Due to the war, the Uzumakis weren't the only ones that were seeking shelter in Konoha. No there were also merchants or civilians that didn't want to die in war. And having child prodigies in the village would act as a beacon of hope for them. Hiruzen really did know how to play the politics game. With so many reasons, Abito wasn't able to refuse the old man. It would bring a bit of trouble for Abito. As with Minato being inside the village, Abito wouldn't be able to leave the village personally, as he might be able to find out who was a clone or not. But then again he didn't need to get out of the village personally to get the job done. After the dinner was over, Abito went slipped out of the home towards his lab. He needed to clear out a few pests. He wasn't just going to waste a year inside in the village, and there was a certain pest that he needed to eliminate. He glanced at a scroll that was on the table. Looking at it he smiled. This was the same scroll that he sealed the parts of Son Goku in. But he would work on that later, for now, he had more important work to do. Robin, bring every and all bats available. I needed a supply of spies in both in and out of Kanoha. Abito said while he sat on his chair. Yes, boss. The bats said and flapped about calling all the bats with its soundless call. While this was happening Abito looked at Nightwing. You on the other hand have to do something more risky my friend. The bat just nodded. Go with the most talent of bats and snoop on both Hiruzen and Danzo, I want to know how far their relationship had soured. Abito didn't know what Hiruzen did, yet. But he would know soon. Also the last incident had made something clear to Abito. Danzo was a figure that needed to be killed, and the faster it happened, the more better. And he would take steps that man was six feet under. Killing Danzo might even give us green energy. Abito chuckled to himself. Of course no one got the joke. But in canon, Danzo was root cause of most of the problems, the Kanoha attack, pain, the Achiha massacre only being the few he could remember at the top of his head. Oh, yeah, didn't he also spread out Raumers to make Naruto's life a living hell? It wasn't a question about if he was going to kill Danzo or not. No, it was a question about when. And killing Danzo was how should it be said. For the better good. Now, now only five more to go, Abito said, as he laid in the grass, lazily reading a book. Manjiraya was sure a good writer. This wasn't his Ichiricha series, but a simple adventure story, and it was quite amazing. A bit far from him, Shisui could be seen sweating bullets as he pushed himself hard for another squat. To the untrained eyes, it seemed that he was doing only bodyweight exercise. But the small cracks beneath his feet told otherwise. I'm done. Shisui said, with gritted teeth, when suddenly he fell forward due to the change in gravity. Abito had released him from the gravity jutsu, or weighted boulder jutsu whatever you name it. The boy panted on the floor as he huffed and puffed for air. Now that wasn't all bad was it Abito said, if you want to be fast you have to build legs that could do that honestly, in my time I had to put several gravity seals and do the drill myself. Yes, I'm oh so thankful. Abito sensei. Shisui said rolling his eyes, while Abito gave a small smirk. Sarcasm won't get you anywhere, now practice the hundred soru drill, now that your legs are all warmed up. Shisui's face paled. Wait, I just finished the 500 squats. I cannot even feel my legs anymore except the pain, of course. Humabito looked up from his book. That sounds like a you problem. Now go on I don't want to hear you complaining. If this was the real world, that sort of training would be overtraining. But here. It's not. Ninjutsu are really wonderful. 
Shisui just sighed and stood up with shaky legs. Abito would have trained himself. He can't. It wasn't apparent at first, but Abito's body was suffering from some horrible chakra exhaustion. Sealing a tailed beast had taken a toll on him. So for now he could just do some basic ninjutsu and tojutsu work. Well, he didn't need to do anything that pushed his body anyways. Grand Lady and he was working on their curse seal project. And Minato was busy with his training as well and wasn't present in the village yet, so he couldn't start learning Harish and no jutsu, so all in all, other than being bored he was doing just fine. And even though he was a human, he couldn't just train all the time. So spending some time with his grandma or Shisui was kind of a break for him. Other than training Abito was also keeping an eye on Danzo. After gathering some info it became clear that Hiruzen had given Danzo his last chance. Abito would have liked it if Danzo was eliminated. But then again, he could see from Hiruzen's perspective a bit. Danzo was his friend that saved his life multiple times. Always strive to make the village better, Danzo might be a scheming bastard, but he contributed a lot in the village. And the thing was unlike the original Danzo never tired to assassinate Hiruzen. No, he knew not to do that. That's why Kagami and Tarifu didn't protest that much when Hiruzen gave Danzo one last chance. But did Abito care about their bromance? No. He wow will have Danzo dead, and you don't need to always use a kunai to do the killing. Destroying the old man's reputation and exposing his deeds would be a good way to force Hiruzen to take action. But he couldn't do it personally. That would ruin his relationship with Hiruzen. Someone else needed to set Danzo up. And he knew just a guy, but for now he needed to set the stage, and that meant carefully planning things out. Huff I can't anymore. Shisui said as he collapsed to the ground. Abito sighed. He wanted to threaten no, motivate his disciple a bit, but he then stopped himself after looking at the boy's state. He might have pushed him too far. Fine don't be a baby, Abito said, getting up and closing the book. Wash up we will get something to eat outside today. It's my treat. Doing his first accident S rank mission paid quite a lot. Other than money every one of his teammates got that would help them in future. Wohoo. Shisui would have jumped in joy, but his legs weren't working properly. After some time both of the Achihas left the Achiha compound to get something to eat. Everywhere they walked people stared at Abito and gossiped about him. People started calling him all kind of names of course good ones after the border incident. It also made the civilians fell a bit safe when child prodigies like him walked amongst the masses. The tension of the upcoming war was quite nerve-wracking. But in times like this people looked towards certain people to hope. Abito wasn't going to lie. He loved the attention, but it also made him realize the responsibility of the situation. It also kinda made him feel bad. Because if something were to happen, he would prioritize his loved ones and friends rather than civilians that he barely knows. He wasn't a good person, he never claimed to be one. It was freeing in a way. He could never do something selfless as the canon Minato like sealing the Biju or Itachi killing the clan. He wasn't that type of guy. He would of course help people if he could. Hmm if I was a marine admiral. My justice would be impulsive justice. Abito mused as he walked with the smaller Ichiha. Impulsive to help others when it's not my damn business. And not helping others when I have certain priorities he liked it that way. It wasn't justice per se, and he knew it was wrong in some aspects, but it reminded him that he was still a human. I'm barely a 10 year old, living in this world for almost 5. He thought, and I'm already having a morality crisis. Meh it wasn't that important. Hey, what do you wanna eat? Raymond. Abito asked as he walked with Shisui. Shisui gave the older Ichiha a flat look. Only you want that. He said, while Abito pouted. Let's go to Yakiniku Q. What's wrong with Raymond Abito grumbled. Back in my days oh, stop it. You are barely four years older than me. Shisui said. Stop acting like an old man. Huh, they grow up so quickly. Abito said, wiping off the imaginary tears. Well, it seems that our hero is a bit busy. A new feminine voice said, chuckling. Abito moved his head to the side, looking at the newcomers. It was Makoto Ichiha, and by her side were Kana Ichiha and little Itachi as well. Well, hello there. Looking as beautiful as ever. Abito said, sliding in his shades. If you weren't married I would have asked you out, you know. But alas. 
You really missed your chance. Makoto chuckled, while Itachi on his side gave Abito a silent glare. Well, you can take my sister out, Makoto said, chuckling. I'm sure she's your type. Makoto was quite the beauty in Konoha. The clan leader lucked out, cause he wasn't on the handsome side. Makoto was kind of the traditional beauty with her fair skin complex, black hair, and raven eyes. Kana her sister looked just like the younger version of her, with a few minor differences. Oh, really you have a sister? He said, before he looked at Kana. Oh, it's her. Meh, Miss Damsel in distress is too young for me. Waving her off. Mikoto chuckled as she saw her sister's frustration. One could see the crush from a mile away. But it seemed that Abito wasn't receptive to the feeling. But then again, girls matured fast. Give it a few years, and maybe when puberty strikes she might have a chance for now. Abito was the goofball that liked to poke fun at everything. It was a wonder how a kid that's so carefree could be such an outstanding shinobi. Kana wanted to point out that he was almost a year and a half older than Abito, but a certain other Ichiha cut her off. Hey, I think Ant is beautiful. Little Itachi said it out loud, being the chivalrous boy he was. He seemed mad, and it seemed quite cute on his little stupor. And I will presume that's Itachi? You presume correct. He said puffing his chest in false bravado. Hmm, Abito nodded. Remind me from which clan you are? Itachi looked at others before narrowing his eyes at Abito. Could he not see that they were wearing the same clan symbols on their cloth? The Achiha clan. Oh, yeah. Then, what color is your Sharingan? Abito said while he pulled his shades down showing of his crimson eyes. It's obviously not black, from the last time I checked. Itachi almost seemed quite hurt by the statement. Even taking a step back. I didn't awaken it, yet. And you call yourself an Achiha. Oh, how mature of you to take the fight to a three-year-old. Shisui deadpanned. Don't mind him. He's probably hit in the head when he was little. How old is he anyway? Abito ignored him of course. We'll turn three in a few months why? Kana answered. People would think for a reserved girl like her, she would be annoyed with Abito. But he had a certain charm that didn't let her get mad at him. Not that she had a childhood crush on him of course. Met too early to train. He said, but of course, the prodigy would have already unlocked Chakra by now. All of them looked at Abito with deadpan expressions. But of course, the boy ignored that. Maybe you can do some basic ninjutsu and tojutsu anyway, Shisui get the brat and some training when you are free. You wanted a training partner, and I think he's a killer prodigy in making. Is he always like that the little Itachi questioned. Shisui sighed, as he walked near Kana and Itachi. You have no idea. He said, hey, by the way, I'm Shisui. Nice to meet you. Um Itachi looked at Shisui, then towards Kana who nodded. I'm Itachi so, um wanna train? Itachi looked at Shisui for a few moments, before looking toward his mother, who nodded. Okay, but I don't think I will be able to do any advanced stuff. Kana on her side looked at the interaction and felt a bit weird. She was a loner herself in her childhood, but shouldn't they be playing? But then she remembered how cruel of a world they lived in. Shisui was what six. She was at that age when the hospital incident happened. That's the reason why they didn't discourage the interaction. Training was as important as breathing if they wanted to survive in this world. Well, I appreciate that you think so highly of Itachi's talent. But we should get going, Yakiniku Q has a long line at this hour. Mikoto said, pushing the kids towards the restaurant. Not to brag or anything, but I will be paying. Abito said, as the matriarch of the clan, and being the most beautiful Achiha as you are. You are not allowed to decline. He said smoothly. Mikoto chuckled. It would be an honor then. It was always fun speaking with the boy. Unlike others in the clan, he had a character to go behind. Another week passed, and Abito getting bored with the recent events. Due to his severe exhaustion, he couldn't physically practice ninjutsu. Even the Grand Lady of the Bats told him not use Chakra that much. Well, sealing a tailed beast alone without any major help would have consequences. But as of few days, he could go back to training his Tujutsu again. Meaning he could join Might Guy in some training, even though it wasn't that much. Only minor stuff. But it was enough to help Shisui and Lil Itachi with their training. While he was lagging behind in training, his other teammates were doing the opposite. Unlike him, they didn't suffer from any backlash in the mission. 
so they were training their ass off in the two weeks. Well, they were motivated that's for sure. The last mission was a wake-up call for them. They were finally able to see how things could go south any moment in doing missions, even if the missions at first weren't combat-related. They were tasked for a normal courier mission, but they were dragged into a major border conflict. Sure they made it alive this time, but there was no guarantee it would happen every time. Abito wasn't affected that much because of his experience with the Mist Shinobis in the Chiduku clan invasion. But for Kakashi, Rin and Guy, this was the first time they had faced danger so close. That's why they threw themselves into training. Sakumo was back in the village, and the border situation with Kumo is a bit stable now. He also gained a bit of a reputation after holding of a squad from Kumo, even more so when it was rumored that one of the attackers was the son of Reikich. The last time he saw Kakashi, he was training with him. The boy wasn't the master of a thousand jutsu, but the ones he did have, Kakashi was trying to refine them. Almost the same thing was with Guy. He was also training with his father. After learning the weighted boulder jutsu, Abito made a whole stone arena out of it, and with help of ninjutsu, he recreated this world's version of Gravity Room. That was just before going into the mission, and so Guy would spend most of his time training his body. What was also very funny was that with the world's butterfly effects playing part, Mike Dai wouldn't be ever facing off against the Seven Swordsmen of the Mist. Because of them being dead and all. Abito didn't know where the changes took place, but he didn't pay that much attention to it either. This world was different as it is, and it wasn't something he considered bad. At least one of his teachers wouldn't die early. Anyway, speaking of teachers, it seemed that his red-headed teacher had taken Rin's training up a notch. Rin was doing all sorts of training that would improve her use of water jutsu and her abilities as a technician. Also, his dear teammate was trying to tame a savage weapon with the help of Kashina, so she was quite the busy girl. All of the people in his team were training. So Abito Kinda felt left out. But he did enjoy the small break, training Shisui, and now Itachi seeing them improve made him feel proud in a way. Anyway, the Hokage had called him, and so he was now standing in front of the man's room. With a knock, he entered. You called? Oh, Abito. The Hokage said looking up tiredly from his paperwork. I did call you. Come sit. Abito nodded taking the seat opposite from him. First, Minato might be not back for another week. Abito sighed. What's he training in any way? Sage mode? But then Hirazin blinked a bit surprised and coughed. Abito rose an eyebrow of suspicion. Didn't Minato already know sage mode? Or was he not proficient in using it? Meh, he didn't put much thought into it. Moving on, you are tasked with a mission of sorts. Kakashi will accompany you wait, aren't we not allowed to leave the village? No, this mission is fairly simple. Hirazan said, you and Kakashi and a few others will go and wait at Konoha guests to receive the Uzumaki that are coming. The village migration will start soon, and we should receive them with open arms. He paused before taking a drag from his pipe. Also they are interested in studying the weapons we liberated of the Hands of Mist. He said, they brought some good craftsmen and blacksmiths from their village to study the weapons. Hirazan didn't say it outright, but the Uzumaki were quite talented in crafting. So, he kept his hope up that, once they settled in Konoha, they might be able to bolster Konoha Shinobis with their craftsmanship. Armor, weapons, and ceiling tags price would go down significantly, and they might even be able to expert at other villages later, after the war was over. This could be an economic boom if Hirazan played his cards right. Abito nodded. So, a boring political mission of sorts. What's the point of receiving guests when they are already inside the village? Well, it's something along the lines of a polite greeting. And also Abito was sure Hirazin wanted to show him and Kakashi off to the Uzumaki that was coming. Even though all of his team members contributed in the border mission, Rin and Guy didn't have the background and backing that he and Kakashi had. It's also a bit disheartening that Kashina wouldn't greet them, they have some sour relation going on. Abito didn't like that one bit. Kashina had ties with her former clan members, but all of her close related clan members didn't like Kashina's way of doing things. That's why she mostly tried to avoid them, but for the average Uzumaki, she was still respected and loved as a princess. Abito stood up. I will take my leave then. Yes, also meet me in two days. 
We have something else to discuss then I will send someone to explain it beforehand. He said, going back to his paperwork. Abito raised an eyebrow. What was that about? Before he shrugged. He had other things to do, than waste time here. A few days later, Abito stood at the Hokage Mountain. You usually don't call me out here unless you have something important to say? In front of him, Kashina sat dangling her legs from the mountain. You know you can be a bummer sometimes can't I call one of my favorite students for a meeting? Abito walked forward and sat by her side. If that was the case you would have invited me to Ichiraku Raymond not here. Is something bothering you? The girl flinched. Sometimes you act too mature for your age you know that? Abito just rolled his eyes, playing the goofball is part of my plan. That made her frown, making you confused was also part of my plan. He snickered, remembering a certain meme from his old world. The girl just rolled her eyes. Anyway, don't drag it around just say it already. Abito said as he enjoyed the cool bridge from the top, eyeing the village from down below. Well, the Hokage told me to inform you about your recent capture. She said, the tailed beast. Abito was white-eyed, then pissed. Don't tell me the old man lost the sealed jar, or someone stole it. No. Kushin said, why would you think that? Oh then what about the tailed beast? Abito actually thought that Danzo had found some way to steal the tailed beast. But it seems that wasn't the case. Oh, thank god that wasn't the case. And that brought a thought, he should put a tracker on the sealed jar, just in case if things do get south. Though, putting a few of his bats on that duty would do the trick as well. Well, you know that we have extra a tailed beast on our hands, and someone needs to host it. She said, and we think you are the best candidate? We? Abito raised an eyebrow. Someone had a discussion over this he mused. Well, mainly Granny Mito and Hokage Sama, but somehow I was part of the discussion. You can guess why she said. I know it might seem out of the blue, but you are the best candidate that we have so, let me stop you right there if I really wanted to be a Jinchuriki, I would have fronted the request. Abito said, and don't beat around the bush, why does the Hokage want me to be a Jinchuriki? It didn't come up before, so why now? Because someone needs to host it, the longer we put in a jar. Internation politics might force us to give the beast back. Kashina sighed. Of course, they would. Abito snorted. Kanoha was viewed as a peace-loving nation by the world. So why would a nation like that host two-tailed beast? Sometimes people confuse peace-loving with pacifism. Well, fuck em language. Abito rolled his eyes, yes, mom. Kashina sighed, I know you don't view a tailed beast as a bad thing, and you are the reason that I was able to come to terms with Karama. Who? He acted confused. Kashina smiled, the nine-tailed fox actually had a name, but only recently he had told me. Because of you, I was able to befriend it. She said, I know the tailed beast doesn't want to be trapped in a host, if he's to go by. But we are in a war, and sometimes people have to make some sacrifices. And with your good talent with fire style ninjutsu and large chakra reserves, you are the best candidate to Beto cut her off. Again I won't become the monkey's jinchurki. Abito cleared. It's not that I am opposed to the idea, but it will take years to gain its trust. The flaming monkey doesn't like me anyways I'm partly blamed for killing his previous host, and not to mention a tailed beast inside me, might be able to hamper my growth. I want to be a bit more stronger before I take in a tailed beast. Abito had several reasons to reject the beast. The main reason was his research into the curse mark. Having a tailed beast inside might hamper him form getting senjutsu. Kashina was a bit stunned. You actually thought over it. Abito snorted. Obviously. He said. You are a near cage level ninja, and that's because you are able to befriend the fox, and you are yet to fully use his power. He said, and you had him for what five or six years for now. Kashina looked at him. Yes, but with what Karama said, if I'm able to counter his full power, I will be by his estimate stronger than anyone in the village. And I don't doubt that. But you also have to remember that the fox is rumored to be the strongest out of the nine beasts. Abito agreed. But what I'm getting at is, I want to build my own power up, before I take in a tailed best. Tell me sensei is Karama your pet? Kashina blinked. No he's my partner. She said, he would actually scream at you if he heard our conversation she mumbled, with a light chuckle. Exactly. Abito nodded. 
I don't mind taking in a tailed beast in the future, and I want an equal relationship from the start. If I'm able to contend with a tailed beast strength, he or she will truly be my partner. This was utter bullshit. If he wanted one tailed beast, then forcing it wouldn't be out of options. But he was kinda opposed to the idea of having something sentient inside, to begin with. Wow you actually make sense. But you will need a lot of time before you are strong enough. Kashina mumbled, but I don't think we can keep the four tails for that long. Well, I don't need to be the host. Abito said. I mean give it to someone else. If by any chance I stumble upon another tailed beast that matches me. I will accept it as a partner. And I'm sure I'm not the only candidate Mido-sama and Hokage-sama have in mind. Kashina sighed. There's no changing your mind is there? Abito smiled. Oh, you know me so well. He said. But I'm curious. Even if the relation between the Achiha and the village is better now. Won't making me a Jinchuriki be a problem? Well, no. Kashina said, a scowl on her face. Politics are complicated. And you are kind of like a bridge between your clan and the village. Giving you such power would be as if declaring that the Hokage is favoring your clan. Abito nodded. Exactly, won't it create instability? The other clan would want their own tailed beast if this goes on. He mused. Kashina snorted. Well, they don't do shit other than provide the village with cannon folders anyways. That's a bit harsh. No. Kashina just rolled her eyes. There is another candidate. Guess who? Another Yuzumaki would be better, you do need to fulfill the condition of having a body with a large chakra pool. Abito guessed. Kashina smiled. Nope, it's Asuma. The Hoku's younger son. Abito blinked. Not wanna point it out, but isn't that nepotism? Wow, such big words for a 10-year-old. She chuckled. But no if you are guessing that the other clans will protest think again. If you were to take the beast, it would look like a prize that the Hokage is giving you. It would have created some instability, but he would have managed it somehow. You did catch it. Abito nodded, as Kashina continued. But if the Four Tails is given to his son, it will look like the Hokage is carrying the burden and tasked his own lineage with the cursed beast. She said. Or the old man will try to make it that way. And Asuma also checks all the boxes, Young, has good control over his fire release, and is a half senju with tons of chakra from both of his parentage. That does make sense. Abito nodded. I think he should take it. Nowadays people don't view tailed beast as danger anyways. Well, at least inside the village. Kashina nodded. She was the current top kanoichi in Kanoha, Tsunade is still the village top kanoichi, but she's not an active shinobi. So, people didn't view them as bad. Actually, Naruto only got harassed because the fox had killed a lot of people when it was released. But none of the civilians or even shinobi didn't encounter the tailed beasts, so they were blissfully unaware. And it's easy to change perspective when you are in the top of the ladder. So Asuma wouldn't face any harassment. He also had the son of Hokage going for him. Making Abito the Jinchuriki on the other hand would have some hassles. Abito had a slight suspicion that Hiruzen did this to test him. To see how much greed he has for power. Well, with this it should be clear to him. Even though in reality he was much more greedier in seeking power. I kind of suspected things would go this way she said, sighing, wanna grab some Raymond. No. That brought down her mood. I have something else to ask, and you will have to answer it honestly, Abito said seriously. Why are you avoiding your clan members her eyes narrowed, you know why I do, but I want to know how do you intend to fix that. Abito said. The ordinary Yuzuamki still see you as a princess, and you not showing up, is making them say bad stuff about you. Now I'm sure you don't want that. Hey, what can I do, anyway? She snorted. The former Yuzushiakage might be dead, but some people in our family still hold similar beliefs. They want me to marry someone from the clan. I have older brother you know, because of the whole shenanigan I can't even meet him in public. Kashina's older brother was one of the few people in the first batch of Yuzumaki migrants that came to Kanoha. The same man that made Abito his first chakra-based gloves. Abito had met him a couple of times. He wasn't a shinobi but more of a sealmaster that focuses on craftsmanship. Due to the whole situation, Kashina wasn't even able to meet him in front of other Yuzumaki. Or the whole Minato thing would be brought up. You know the whole situation is stupid. 
I know no I mean you are stupid. Cushion actually felt hurt by the comment, but before she could get mad, Abito clarified. Why don't you just marry Minato? He's going to take the hat after the war anyways. So marry him. And I'm sure after that they wouldn't be able to do much. Kashina snorted. It's not easy I have tired, but Minato that man is actually very insecure about this. Him being a civilian and all. And he wants to prove his worth first. Yeah, I don't care that much. Abito flatly said, before his eyes softened. You are hurting sensei. Just drag him by the balls and marry him after he comes back to the village. Who gives a fuck what other people think? I I don't know, you should take the step. Why did you think our clan matriarch Makoto married so early? You are practically the same age. He said. And now they already have Itachi I don't want to be the bringer of bad news, but people die in a war. And it's no guarantee if Minato-sensei will survive. Hey don't say that. Oh, I will. Abito said, he felt a bit bad, but continued. I don't want you be the next Tsunade after his certain boyfriend died. The woman became an alcoholic and a gambler. And I don't want you to end up like that. Abito knew Minato didn't die in the cannon. But this world was different, and anything could happen. That's why he would like to have a realistic view of things. And Kashina deserved every happiness she could get. So that's why he was being a bit forceful in this situation. I I Abito stood up. I'm not going to force you guys into this it's your life. But you guys had a long relation, and I think it's time to tie the knot. He started walking away. I won't say anything else, but I hope you think over my words. Abito viewed Kashina as an older sister he never had. And that's why he wanted the best for her. But sometimes you have to be hard. Kashina sat there stunned. Going over what the Uchiha boy had just said. This is going too far Rin sighed as she hid behind a bush. In front of her was a forest where three shinobas were fighting it out. Even though they were in the forest of death, she was almost sure that soon some of the Anbu would be here to stop the fight. Because almost a good chunk of the trees were either cut, blown off or were on fire. And not to mention the explosions that were happening when the three shinobas clashed with each other. How did things end up like this she sighed, but it was actually for good training. She took the weapon that was hanging on her hip. It had an odd shape, but with a flick, the weapon extended into a fully formed long bow. She concentrated her breathing as she sent some chakra into the weapon, generating an ice-based arrow from it as she pulled the string. This bow was made was a gift from Kashina sensei She had spent quite the a lot of time crafting it, she also had help from her brother and Abito as well. She seemed a bit happy these days, she didn't know why, maybe because Minato-sensei was going to return soon. She shrugged as he focused on her target. Well, there wasn't any target, she would shoot randomly at one of them with a non-lethal blow. Of course, this was training that was thought by Abito. He wanted all there of the heavy hitters in the team to fight each other, while Rin would try to shoot them down, at the same time. While it would increase her accuracy, it would also raise their team's awareness for unexpected attacks. The attack that was aimed at Guy missed by a slight chance, but it also distracted the boy enough to get punched by Abito. Kakashi took the time to use his new attack Chidori and dash at Guy, who was a bit distressed. Guy by some luck rolled to the side and avoided the attack. Kakashi on the other hand got his hand planted in a nearby tree, with lightning piercing the tree. But Abito took the chance to get behind him and attack him with his armament rods. Only for a silver dog to attack him, protecting his master. Akito had some dangerous level of speed for a summoning dog. Abito jumped back, not wanting to get bitten, but was suddenly stopped when sensed something. He quickly put his hand near his face as an ice arrow struck his hand, freezing it. But of course, he had his armament gloves on and he crushed the arrow before it could be a hindrance. Almost hand me Abito mused as his red Sharingan reviled the girl's location. Rin clicked her tongue as she quickly moved away from her hiding spot. She could already hear a few shurikens that were coming at her. She quickly did some hand signs and used a water jutsu to send her upwards, the kunais missing her. She had seen Abito do some really nifty work with some kunais. They were all unpredictable and would bounce of each other before getting to their target. It confused the enemy or even sometimes caught them by surprise. But for Rin avoiding them wasn't that hard. She had learned from experience. 
It was a fancy way of saying she got attacked by those pesky shuriken couple of times. And that was enough for her to avoid them. Of course, all of them would unsharpen kunais, but they hurt quite badly when they were traveling at such speed. Rin moved fast trying to find another hiding spot when something yellow hit her. Or at least tried to, she had just enough time to use her bow to block the attack. But it did send her crashing into a tree. And that knocked the wind out of her. And she wasn't the only one. Guy who was using his fifth gate, suddenly got kicked in the back, and managed to not fall face first into the ground. While Kakashi got a fist planted in his stomach, almost making him throw out his breakfast. Even the silver dog, Akito couldn't stop it. Abito was next, and his figure suddenly moved away avoiding the first attack from the yellow thing, but got caught by an attack from behind. The speed of the enemy was beyond unreadable, even for a Sharingan user like him. Did you really just kick me in the ass the Achiha complained with anger and frustration. Well, I kicked your butt multiple times anyways, but this time literally. Said none other than the yellow flash and Kanoha. Sensei you are back Kakashi said, not happy either. And the flash. He said disappearing right from where he was appearing right near Abito, who blocked his kunai with his armament glove this time. Say I haven't been in the village for quite a while. And I hear you guys made quite the name for yourself, so let's test that. Dynamic entry. Minato disappeared again appearing right where he was before. Guy I don't think you should shout out attack names until you are fast enough to surprise me. He said. And that's never going to happen so just give up. Guy gasped, never. He said. My youth runs hot. Minato shrugged. Well, boys he then looked at where Rin hid, and gals prepare to get your ass beat by your amazing sensei. I hope you haven't been slacking off on training, but I just so happened to master something new, that I want to show off to my chibi disciples. All team members readied themselves, but they didn't need to. Because at the next moment a sudden burst of killing intent froze all of them. You will do no such thing, Minato Namikas. It was a certain angry redeed. What you will do is answer as to why you didn't visit me first, rather than join the training. Am I that low on your priority list? Minato gulped seeing the angry woman. Kashina, I can explain. Kushin cracked her knuckles, oh you will. She was actually sent here by the Hokage to stop the team for causing any more explosions. Their so-called training caused the already tense people in Konoha to be even more concerned. And after coming here she found this Minato looked around, and all of his team were gone. In their place were wooden logs. Traitors he thought, but he couldn't focus on that as the redeed got near him. Her red wavy hair was up like it was one flames, and adamantium chains were out for the count. Minato could gulp. So that went well Kakashi lazily said. All four of them had already entered the village and were perching on a rooftop. But Minato-sensei had gotten stronger much stronger. That won't help much from Kashina's wrath, though. Abito snickered. I almost pity him. Rin said, almost. She joined with her own chuckle. Hey, but what did Minato-sensei do wrong? Guy asked. He just followed everyone into hiding away from Kashina, so the boy was still clueless. The whole group looked at Guy. Huh, naive childern. Abito said, shaking his head. You still have some growing up to do, Kakashi added. Rin sweat dropped, as essentially Guy was actually older than both of them. But it seemed that the boy was lacking some knowledge. Hey Guy. Abito. All of the group stopped as a Kanohe shinobi that was jumping rooftops came towards them. Looking at his vest, one could guess that he was a jonin. Wait up, I didn't know you were back in the village my youthful friend, Guy said after seeing the shinobi giving a thumbs up. Yeah, did you get deployed in a mission or something? Abito said. Or something the newcomer was Mukaiko Hinata. His one-eyed Byakugan was hidden in a special eye patch. It was made in a way that would never hamper his dejutsu ability, but boost them. Of course, it was gift from Abito. Yeah, I regret getting the Jonin post eye on too much work man. He said, also things thing works great. He said pointing at the eye patch. Uh, you gonna make me blush Abito snorted. Kakashi was also recently got his position as a jonin, but couldn't relate actually. A new jonin would be tasked with a lot more missions for the first few years or so. But due to their ongoing fame, he was able to skip that. But not all of them were as lucky. They were too valuable to be deployed for any recent missions, where they might be put on danger. 
Kakashi knew Kohinata, the one-eyed Byakugan user who had a bit of fame himself. Rin was the only person that didn't know about Kohinata. And after some introductions, they had some small chat before deciding to go to Ichiraku Raymond. I still can't believe that you guys made such a name for yourself, the older boy added. Must be good to be able to skip missions, he practically whined. They chatted while they skipped from one rooftop to another, like badass ninjas. Well, they mostly had to do it so that they don't get crowded by civilians. Don't be a baby Abito rolled his eyes, seriously you almost sound like Shisui where's your patriotism? The love for the village? The Achiha added with sarcasm. It was also ironic how similar both Mukai and Shisui's personality was, because in canon Shisui was one of the reasons for Mukai's death. Though, Abito was somehow able to stop Mukai from joining the Anbu. So he was all good. And even though general people didn't know, but in the shinobi circle, Danzo's reputation had gone down after the border incident. Of course, Hiruzen was being soft here. But Abito was keeping an eye on the man. He was going to have to wait to deal with him soon. But it was more easier said than done. Mukai snorted. Yes, I can practically see the love for your nation oozing out he said, but man, I really hate that I will have to mostly be on the front lines in the war. Yeah, most likely not, Abito said, making the boy turn around him with a frown. You might be a jonin, but I know an unwritten rule that Kanohe usually tries to keep their under-16 shinobis inside the borders really? Mukai practically hugged him. That's great now I don't have to overwork myself. Get off me you vermin. Abito shouted in exaggeration, separating from the older boy. Oh, don't be like that the great Ichiwa is scared of a hug. Don't make me go all Taburama on your ass. Mukai wanted to counter with something witty, before he frowned and looked at Kakashi, who had a nonchalant impression. Hey, isn't the second Hokage's his grandson you shouldn't say that. He whispered the last part to Abito. That my friend is killing two birds with one stone, Abito said, he then pointed at Kakashi. I'm pissing both of you guys with one sentence. That's a high score in my book. He might look all calm and collected, but he's actually super mad at me. Anytime now he might awaken the Rinnegan Kakashi just rolled his eyes, and they all walked into the Raymond shop. It takes skills, but I have learned to remain silent against idiotic people. He casually said. See he's super mad. He's being all cryptic about it the Achiha said acting as if he won the verbal war. As all of them took their seats after finding the shop empty. So they ordered their food. Mukai seemed to remember that he had an errand to run and said his goodbyes. So they were again back to only four. Rin just rolled her eyes, at least one of his teammates was at least normal. But then he looked at Kai, but the boy seemed to have ordered a large meal, and because of Abito's question, he was doing fast-paced push-ups now to blow of some calories. Okay, maybe not. All of their teammates were insane. I know that look. Abito said, making the girl look to his side the Achiha was almost in his face. I don't need the Sharingan to tell me that, you think all of your teammates are insane. Rin pushed of Abito's face, while she rolled her eyes. What of it? Think about it, if all us are insane then you are the outlier doesn't it make you the most likely candidate of being insane? Abito crossed his arms and nodded to himself, maybe all of us are not insane, only you are, and you are viewing the world in a colored lens. Are you telling me I'm the insane one here? Rin said flatly. Well, let's do a test. Ayama-chan, do you think I'm insane? Abito asked the small girl serve their food. Um no. She said. May, but Abito cut her off. Huh, see. If I'm not insane, then by that rule, you are the one who's insane. Kindly stop speaking, your dumb brain cells are withholding my smart ones. She said rubbing her forehead, why did she even ask? Nice comeback for someone who's insane. Huh. Abito said, but then he was given his plate of Raymond, and his focus turned elsewhere. Oh, thanks. He said as he started inhaling the Raymond. It's great. Kakashi patted Rin's back. Don't take it personally, he was probably dropped as a child. You aren't any better you know. Kakashi just gave her a eye smile. Rin gave the other boy a flat look. And they call me insane. The next day team practice was called off. As Minato had asked for only Abito to train with him. All of his teammates knew that the Achiha was getting personal tutoring for the Horatian. Even though they didn't show it, all of them were a bit jealous. 
It was a human thing really. All of them knew Abito deserved more than that. As the last mission was fully carried by him, but they were a bit sour. Though, it wasn't like they would just brood around because of it. Kakashi had gone to practicing by himself or with Guy, now that Sakumo was back to border duty. He was developing a jutsu that wasn't quite original. But his father had believed that he would be able to learn it by himself. A certain jutsu from the land of clouds. Rin was back training with Kashina. Who seemed much more cheerful now that Minato was back. And that was bad news for the medical Kanoichi, as she was put on a more harsher training due to her enthusiasm. Guy was of course always on the grind. So he wasn't missing anything. Though, he seemed to be taking some bold steps and challenging another well-known Tajutsu expert that lived in the village. Most Hyugas weren't a challenge for him. As Mukai, Abito, and Guy all of them had trained with each other for years, countering a Tajutsu was nothing new to him. Nice home by the way, Abito said as he entered Minato's home. This was his first time actually getting there. It was in the outskirts of the village. A small cozy home. I can practically smell Kuhina all around the place Abito said, and smelling isn't my specialty hey, I just Minato was almost red as Kashina's hair, the man in his twenties was more than embarrassed. Adults these days all naughty, Abito said, making the blonde blush even more. Nothing like that happened he said, coughing. And how do you know about this stuff anyway she just sometimes comes over to cook. Of course, one night stands were way less common in the shinobi world. People were much more conservative around here. But that didn't mean Abito couldn't tease. Wifer, why don't you the Achiha rolled his eyes. The man just coughed, mumbling something to himself. Anyway, which room should I go you do have a separate room for Fuinjutsu practice don't you? Abito said. Fuinjutsu was dangerous and needed to be practiced with some caution. So most Fuinjutsu users had their own Fuinjutsu lab set up. Because I don't accidentally go into one of your more personal rooms and ruin my innocence, Minato just cited his comments. It's underground, Minato said, walking forward and doing a hand sign as an underground door opened. Oh a secret lair. Abito said, I got to make myself one, one of these days. He laughed at his own joke as he went down the ladders. Both of the Kanoha Shinobis entered the underground lab, which was more like a bunker. As the place was full of Fuinjutsu ruins that protected the place from the outside. Some of the seals were even drenched with natural energy. It was quite amazing in a way. It also made Abito wondered when he could dabble in those arts. Minato walked forward, gathering some scrolls, and Abito took a seat on a nearby table. Let's get the theory part sorted Abito said, you know I hate that every cool ninja stuff related to seals is filled with tons of boring reading. It almost makes me want to rethink my life decisions. Minato snorted, these seven scrolls are the only first part. He said, there are still nine more parts left at least you have me to explain the second Hokage's notes. I had to scramble in the dark for two years to make my first working Harrison seal. What will you do in the meantime? Babysit you of course Minato said, I have nothing else to do, and I will most likely be stuck with your team for this year. I also was given in charge of my own Anbu team now, so we are working on our teamwork as well. Hmm here take that, the Achiha tossed the blonde a scroll of his own. And the blonde was a bit surprised that Abito was giving this to him. You didn't have to you know the scroll was about how Abito was able to learn the Rasen Shuriken. Minato might have been able to recreate this jutsu on his own. But using someone else's jutsu without permission was something that might get you in trouble. Even Abito couldn't spam Nara clan's shadow jutsu out in the open. By giving Minato this jutsu it was as if saying he could use it without getting into any further trouble in the future. But are you sure? The blonde asked. Yes, think of it as an early wedding gift. Minato shifted in his chair with a worry chuckle. Was he trying to put pressure on Minato into marrying Kashina? Yeah. Why? Cause unless the blonde flash took some bold steps Kashina would have to face scrutiny from all sides. Kashina helped him when he needed the most, and Abito was just replaying the favor. Abito nodded as he opened the first scroll reading through them. Most of the stuff he had already access to because of his bats collecting Tabarama's jutsu from the Hokage's office. But Minato's notes were offhand for now. Being a sage and all. Now he was able to get those on his hands. And as he read the scrolls in Minato's personal notes, 
he came to an conclusion that Minato was one of those that were really gifted in understanding space ninjutsu. Thinking again, Abito wasn't actually that much talented when it came to the line of shinobi work. And yet he constantly outperformed people that were much more talented than him. Canon knowledge was a big help, but also the fact that he had an outside box of thinking. So he was quite amazed at how understandable and details Minato's notes were. He was actually able to make sense of it. But he still had tons of them to go through, he wasn't hoping to be able to use the Harishin anytime soon, but it wouldn't take that long by his estimation. No one was betting him to be able to finish mastering a complicated jutsu like Harishin before the war ended, but Abito will just have to surprise them. Almost one year passed, and the Third Shinobi War had now reached a more complicated stage. The tension was high, and almost all the attention was on Konoha. While the Sand, who was fighting a defensive war. But they didn't want to allay with Konoha. Due to Kiri Haven been involved in killing an Iwa's Jinchiriki, Iwa and Kiri were going neck and neck, just like the First Great Shinobi War. Both the respective village cages had already engaged two times in battle. While Anki had the upper hand in each time, but third Mizukage was a sneaky little shit that would survive the assault. One would think that might demoralize the Kiri Shinobi force, but it did the opposite. The Mizukage knew that he couldn't beat the old fossil. The current Mizukage and the current Kazukage were the weakest of the five cages. But strength mattered very little in face of practical strategies. The Kiri Shinobi forces would ambush the Iwa borders and surprise attack them when the Mizukage was fending of Anoki. The Kirikage only acted as a distraction so that the Kiri force could attack them by surprise. Now both sides were at a stalemate. Which was good in a way, as both sides weren't that much eager to attack Anoha, only getting into some small clashes. The main problem right now was Kumo. That's where most of the forces of Konoha were camping at, Sakumo, so Kagami and Minato was there. Kumo was trying to take over some Konoha land, even the Rakage himself appeared there a few times with his forces, but the three of them were enough to block the muscle head from doing anything. While things might have been tough for Konoha, they were the least damaged due to the war. And a good part of that is Yuzumaki's involvement in the war. Due to almost all of Konoha Shinobis having few injutsu based armor and an abundance of explosion tags, the village had lost fewer Shinobis, even with all three villages attacking them. Now they were at the stage both Konoha and Iwa were trying to ally with each other and find off the other nations. This was a big deal, as Iwa was generally hard-headed in terms regarding alliance, and they had a bad history since Madara came to their village and beaten the Tsuchikage at the time. If the alliance worked things would happen that might shake the whole shinobi world. The whole world was watching. While this was happening in an open field. Abito was standing opposite to Asuma, with Kashina and another male Yuzumaki that was on the side. Asuma for his part looked drenched in sweat, and his right hand was on fire, large, and gigantic. Actually, you could see his actual hand underneath the translucent avatar. You did way better than before Abito said, shutting off his Sharingan. At this rate, you would become a perfect Jinchuriki in no time. Kashina from his side nodded. Honestly, it took me years to even get at that stage with Kurama. At least, Son Goku isn't as hard-headed as him. Asuma smiled weakly, oh, he is hard-headed all right, he just hates Abito's guts and is willing to help me more in using his power. So, I'm basically a go-to guy for your training. The Achiha chuckled as he walked over to Asuma, now that he was fully detransformed. He held out his hand as Asuma grabbed it standing up. Wanna grab some steamed buns? Even though Ajin Cherky could take on their bestial from when they had the beast under some control, it was more like wearing them. Like a usual Jinchuriki was a human that had a beast inside him, but when transformed the roles were reversed, now the human was inside the beast and struggling for control. So it was more like wearing a sentient jacket or armor that wanted to take over your body. It became apparent when both Kashina and Asuma used their partial or full beast forms. Sure, if you are buying. Abito rolled his eyes, yeah, and they call me stingy. Asuma snickered before looking at Kashina. Do we need any more testing for the day? Kashina shook her head as she wrote something in her clipboard. No, you guys can go, this test was the oddity they found in Kanoha's Jinchurikis versus the others. When other Jinchurikis transformed it would show the full-tailed beast, but when Kashina and now Asuma transformed they would transform, but it would be transparent, and one could see through it. 
The theory was that the eight trigram seal that Yuzumaki's made it appear that way. It didn't cut of any chakra from the beast, but due to the seal, the aesthetic would change. As Asuma and Abito walked the streets of Konoha, one wouldn't be able to tell that a war was going on. People were cheerful, kids playing and other were just going on with their lives. Well, what could they possibly do people had eventually accepted the war. With each passing day, a few casualties would come mothers losing their son or daughter in war, others losing their family members, but it was a very small number compared to the previous wars. So people were hopeful that things would calm down soon. As Asuma and Abito walked the streets a lot of people would look at them with appreciation and awe. Not just for Abito, but also for Asuma, usually being a Jinchuriki was scorned upon. But unlike the incompetent Herzuin that did shit for Naruto in the canon series, he did much more for the public image of his son. Now his son was looked at as a hero, who was carrying the burden of the village and keeping a whole beast in check. And Asuma seemed to love the appreciation. Mainly because a certain someone was taking notice. Like everything biology worked a bit differently here, even though Asuma and Abito were 11, they looked around the age of 15. Chakra made everything grow faster. But hopefully, puberty wouldn't come anytime soon. You know I hate the war Asuma said, as held one of the steamed buns, exiting the shop. Abito nodded as he chowed on his. You don't say, I know it might be a stupid question, but why is the war even happening? It's just stupid Asuma said, he didn't seem to be joking either. Why is the war happening you ask? Simple. Ambitious people trying to fulfill their ambition. The ambition might be new land to conquer, or safeguard their old land, or to keep their beliefs and values, or to just make people suffer and show their dominance, it could be anything. Heck, some people want just pure chaos war isn't stupid. Abito said, it was fantastically stupid. Well, this war is at least. Asuma just chuckled. Even though he hit it well, after almost a year of training with him, Abito could kinda understand him. Now that he was a Jinchuriki, he was one of the people that might be deployed in the war. Hiruzen might show favoritism, but if the village needs it, he will do what's necessary. Asuma knew this when he was taking in Son Goku, now he might be getting a bit cold feet. Not that Abito blamed him. Even Rin and Guy were having a hard time seeing their relatives brought back in stretchers. Abito wasn't any different, the amount of funerals in the Achiha portion was also increasing. Kakashi was always on the edge, thinking that he might lose his father, so was Kashina for Minato's safety, now that they were married. Abito could fell the boy, even though he was technically 11, he could understand his mentality. War was stupid. Even if you complicate things, it was stupid. But at the same time, it was necessary. As for Konoha, it was necessary, they didn't want to declare war, excluding the jackass called Danzo, they were almost fighting a defensive war. Almost because Konoha was smart enough to not just sit around, unlike the sand, where they had the geographical advantage, Konoha didn't. They had to attack first and intercept any attack before it reached their borders. So yeah, things were just complicated. But it didn't matter, because he knew what he needed to do. Abito entered the lab, he knew what he needed to do. It took a year, but he was able to get the Harishin no Jutsu. Now Abito was an official teleporter. But not only that, but he was also able to trick Minato into thinking that he only managed to get the three-man version of the Jutsu. The Harishin three-man version was a Jutsu, where Abito would use three of his clones to teleport himself and what was inside fire formation to one location to another. The three-man Jutsu is known as the Flying Thunder Formation. Which wasn't invented yet, so Abito was kind enough to introduce the concept. When in fact Abito knew the full version of the Jutsu. But it was a tad bit slower than Minato's Jutsu, as he had to make three hand signs with one of his hands which is quite fast because of his inhuman hand sign speed, but it was still slower than Mineoto who could do it without any hand signs. Of course, it would be the case, he was still new to the space jutsu manipulation. Which was a mix of yang and lightning chakra he was good with yang release, but he wasn't a master at lightning like other elements. Is everything ready? Abito said as he walked in. If things went right, then this war would be over in a few months. Nightwing nodded, in his clone form. He looked exactly like Abito, but one of his eyes was a permanent Katsuryagan that wouldn't shut off. 
There was no chakra consumption, a beto, and the grand lady was able to fix that, but the eye would always have be active. Though Nightwing was genius enough to make use of both his fear toxin ability and blood controlling ability of the Dejutsu to make something new. Boss, you sure you want to do this this is pretty risky, Robin said, unlike Nightwing, he didn't have the eye modification. Or any modification really. After seeing the struggle of Nightwing, he would only take in a Dejutsu implant when he was sure it wouldn't act unstable. And the Sinjutsu seal wasn't ready yet. Abido didn't like calling it Curse Seal, because it didn't have any side effects like the one Arachimaru made. So he had renamed it. Yup, why? The Acheha smirked playfully, getting cold feet? Robin nervously chuckled. Of course, all of his clones were tense, he was no different. Though he was trying to hide it, telling himself it was excitement, not that it was helping much. Anyway, Abido knew the main reason for why Robin didn't want the implant. He wanted to be unique. Little Robin didn't want to hide in Nightwing's shadow anyway, that was the reason why he was focusing on lightning release, the only weakness to Abido's bat clone was either lightning release or fire release. Fire release they would take some damage, but the lightning release would paralyze them for a while, that's why Robin focused there. Now he was the only clone that could tank lightning attack like no other and convert it directly into his own jutsus. Yup, for lightning jutsus he was ripping of Sakumo and Kakashi. Though, he couldn't trip all of their jutsus, as most of them were linked with their Admantium Wolf Summon. Abito walked towards the table that had his gear. It was an orange mask, this one laced with all kinds of seal, from protection to even having a self-recovery function. Also, a seal to hide his Sharingan and change its appearance. A simple black robe with also shit ton of seals, custom black shinobi attire, and a wig of red hair, because why not? And it wasn't just him either, there was a set for all 15 of Abito's clones. Though they didn't have the robe cause it might hamper them if they want to use their bad intangibility. The robe was made so that the real Abito could tank damage, even having Senjutsu based sealing on it. His curse mark research was finished. Pakura already had her mark, and the testing was quite stable, but Abito wanted to do some modifications before doing a permanent seal like her. Well, her seal wasn't permanent, it could be removed, but she would be in a world of pain if that was done. Pakura was desperate for power, the wild girl wanted to get power by any means. His seal was on his the back of hand, invisible to the naked eye, it was of a Sharingan pattern. But this seal was much weaker than Pakura's, it would only give Abito a limited amount of stored Senjutsu chakra, which would refill after use. And would provide three abilities. First increase durability and regen ability, second increase control over chakra, meaning he wouldn't need to use his hand signs for Harishin, and potent Jinjutsu, that was amped with Senjutsu. And thirdly, increase overall in the power of any ninjutsu. It only would work for two minutes, before it would need a recharge. But it was way enough time to deal with most of the enemies Abito would face here. Hopefully thinking again, maybe Senjutsu was the key to fully mastering the Harishin Jutsu because the control that Sage Chakra gives is like no others. Maybe Sinjutsu was the reason why Minato was able to perfect the Jutsu. But wait, did the second Hokage know Sinjutsu? Who knows this world was fucked up as it is. He didn't want to think about dead men just yet. Or ever. Abito dressed up wearing the gear. It's showtime boys. All 15 of the clones nodded, going right into his shadow, and Abito put his mask on with his right hand, while he quickly made three hand signs with his left hand. Disappearing from the lab. The land of water, the Mizukage was journeying to the land of whirlpools in his ship. He was going there with some of his trusted Anbu guards. He was cautious after getting fighting near death battles with the Tsuchikage. That old man was quite a tough opponent for the third Mizukage. Anoki wasn't that old, he just stepped into his 50s. The same age as the third Hokage Hiruzen, but the Anoki looked quite old due to him acting like one. The third Mizukage on the other hand was five years younger than them. But age wasn't the factor in shinobi fights. Anki was quite skilled as a cage, and his use of unorthodox jutsus that barely needed any hand signs and his ability to fly made him a tough opponent. But he managed to survive. Not without consequences though, the old man's particle release almost killed him multiple times. So he was lucky that he came out without any permanent injury. In the war, they had won the almost abandoned Uzumaki village. 
The village was mostly deserted when the war started and was filled with traps. Many Kiri Shinobis died while trying to scavenge the village for goods and treasures. The casualty rate was so much that the Mizukage had to order to blow all the old Uzumaki ruins up so that his soldiers wouldn't get killed by any traps. It was better to build a new fort rather than use a fort that was filled with traps. Even if conquering the Uzumaki village was a con, in the long run, it had many benefits. He was going there because of the land. Geography is king during wars. Yuzushiagakur was in a spot where one would secure them from any attacks. It was an island that was surrounded by whirlpools, and from the outside it was very hard to get in. There was a reason why Kiri wanted that land for themselves. And because of those whirlpools, not only shinobi but even merchant vessels had a tough time sailing through the waters. And an Uzumaki escort was needed. This island was a very good investment for the future of Kiri. And now that it was there, it could easily fend of Konoha or Iwa attacks. That's why the Mizukage was trying to make it his main base. Now that the war has stalled a bit, the third Mizukage could focus on that. That was the reason why he was traveling to Yuzushiagakur. Even though they were shinobis that could walk on water. Most of the time they used ships to sail through the land of water. Chakra usage unless you were a Jinchuriki should mostly be kept to a minimum. When are we going to reach there? The third Mizukage said. His name was Kaido. He had no last name, an orphan that was once the guard of the first Mizukage. By Akiran. After Jinjetsu Hazuki died he took his place. Kaido-sama, it will take a couple of hours. Mai said. Mei Terum Plus, a 16-year-old Kanichi from the Terumi clan. Which was a long-distant branch of the Uzumaki clan that defected into the mist after the creation of the village system. Not all people saw eye to eye with how Uzumaki did things. The cage nodded, sitting in his ship's office. Doing some of the light paperwork. He then remembered something and looked up. Have you sent a scout to look at the weather up ahead? Entering the Yuzushiagakur is though even in this route. The girl nodded, I have sent Manjetsu and two others to look in front. Mai said. But I'm sure nothing will go wrong. In a way, she was proud that Mist was able to gain control over the Uzumaki territory. The discrimination her family faced when they were still part of the main clan made her hate the Uzumaki clan. The Terumi clan didn't pose as the usual traits normal Uzumaki showed. While they were gifted with large pools of chakra, they were small compared to an average Uzumaki. And for generations, their clan wasn't able to produce a chakra chain user. That's why they weren't treated as a real Uzumaki descendant. And often looked down upon. Their clan was really good with fire release and unlocked the secret to fire type Kik Genkai. Still, they weren't viewed with discriminatory eyes by the main clan. Well, it wasn't just them the main clan kept all the clans in check. That's why they were forced to flee from the clan and join the mist where they were valued. And they weren't the only ones. There was a reason why most low-blooded Yuzumaki tried to leave the village and start elsewhere. In the Yuzushiagakur, they were looked down upon. Some of the discriminatory practices would even make the Moon-Eyed Hyuga clan frown. They were looked at as nothing valuable. But outsiders often treated them otherwise, even being half Yuzumaki were praised and respected. That's why many small branches of Yuzumaki often broke off from the village. Though oftentimes the main clan would send assassins to take care of them secretly. And now that Yuzumaki lost their village, people who were from the branch clan like Mai, found satisfaction in it. In a way, the Senju clan was lucky to never suffer from in-clan discrimination. There might be many reasons, but the main one would be because of the Achiha clan. Fighting against the Achiha for so many generations made the brotherhood in the clan run thicker than blood. They would rather die than let discrimination flow amongst themselves. Even the late first Hokage and his wife tried to settle the situation of Uzumaki after Konoha was created. That was also the reason why the Uzumaki clan didn't join the Konoha village. Because then, they wouldn't be able to do as they pleased. And while the first Uzumaki Patrich broke off from the Senju clan because he didn't want any part of the generational wars. It created other problems such as in-clan discrimination. You seem happy, Kaido said smiling a bit. He was bit tired. But in a war where he had to look over his soldiers and plan each move, who wouldn't be? The girl blushed but tried to play it off. Well, it's my first time going in that village even though our family hates that place. 
They still considered it home, and now we can see it. The third Mizukage chuckled. Well, that's good. He said. But it's sad that most of the village was destroyed due to shit ton of traps your so-called family left there. Mai chuckled. Well, the Uzumaki clan is called a seal master clan for nothing. She said, looking a bit sad, and it's sad that while Tarumi is in Uzumaki branch clan, we have no knowledge of the higher form of traps that they set up before leaving. Then our clan could have dealt with that. The cage hummed. Well, they did set up that kind of trap for a reason. I think they might have even started a new kind of trap set up when your clan defected from them. It was possible, as the Tarumi clan knew about the functions of most basic traps used by Uzumaki, they had to change the whole thing, so that their traps wouldn't be disarmed easily. May nodded, it's possible. The main family does like their secrets. She said, I'm also a bit bummed out we weren't able to get any one of the Uzumaki artifacts they would have helped us quite a lot. But they would rather destroy their toys than let us, branch clan members use them. May nodded, it's possible. The main family does like their secrets. She said, I'm also a bit bummed out we weren't able to get any one of the Uzumaki artifacts they would have helped us quite a lot. But they would rather destroy their toys than let us, branch clan members use them. Kaido nodded. You know, rumors say that they had mellowed down quite a lot now that they have merged into Konoha. May scoffed. Well, Manjetsu might have scared them after he killed their last cage. That old man was the worst out of all the Yuzukages. Kaido chuckled. Well, Manjetsu is a good soldier. His skill was the key that led us to gaining an upper hand over the Yuzumaki. The late patriarch of that clan had many forbidden jutsus that only he was able to use, but cutting him down made us the victor of the war by default. Mai nodded. Having too many secrets was also a bad thing. The secrecy of jutsus even in the main Yuzumaki line was so bad that a few jutsus were passed down only from patrich to patrich. And now that the last head of the Uzumaki clan is dead, those forbidden jutsus should be lost. And even if the new head of the clan Kenshi Uzumaki knew of the jutsus, he was too young to use them continuously. Killing his father was key to gaining control over the village. Though, they hadn't anticipated that the Uzumaki clan would migrate to Konoha. They were actually trying to take over the can, kill the main line, and branch members who were loyal to them and merge the rest of the Uzumaki population into the Tarumi clan. But it was unfortunate that didn't happen. That would have put the Hidden Mist in a favorable position. Speaking of Manjetsu how's the situation with the Hazuki clan? Mai asked. They were causing fuss again before we left. Kaido scoffed. Let them after Jinjetsu Hazuki took the seat as the second Mizukage they have inflated their ego to the extreme. They need to be taken down a peg or two. Mai nodded. The Hazuki clan and their supporters, mainly the Yuki clan, were vouching for their clan over their village. Well, not quite. But they wanted the cage position to be only filled with prime clans that set up the Hidden Mist village. They cared for the village, but they wanted the cage seat to be filled up with the major clan members. The Hazuki, Yuki and the Kagaya clan were the founders of the Mist village. But even then none of the three clans joined willingly at first until the first Mizukage by Akiran forced them to join in. Who was of course not from any of the clan. And while the second Mizukage is viewed as a hero by the Hazuki clan, in all honesty, he had many flaws. Giving the main three clans benefits over the rest, wasting tons of money on useless projects, and even dying against Mew, because of a personal enmity towards the second Suchikage. The only reason why he is respected in the village is because he died while taking down another cage with him. That's why Kaido took the chance immediately in taking the position as the third Mizukage to bring back stability in the village. But the Hazuki clan and the Yuki didn't seem to like it that much. The Kagaya clan didn't care who was in charge, as long as they could quench their battle lust, and someone strong was leading them. Well, it was quite weird how they were branched off from the actual Hayuga clan. As the Kagaya clan was far from elegant. Anyway, because of the third Mizukage being a clanless orphan. That created a bit of instability in the village. A few years back, when a whole squad of Yuki and Hazuki clan Shinobis died while subjugating a tribal clan in the land of Mangrove, drove things got to the extreme. The full squad that was compromised with Jonin level Shinobis led by two elite Jonins, died to unknown causes. The Yuki and the Hazuki clan lost a lot of reputation and tried to blame it on Kaido. 
and that almost started a civil war. But Kaido was able to stop it. And he was angry when he found that Konoha and Iwa spies were winding the flame for the civil war. But that was part of being in shinobi politics. Even he had his advisor scheme out to other village. But no one liked to be on the receiving end. Manjetsu while being a Hazuki and a protogai was very loyal to the village. The boy preferred the village over his clan. And Manjetsu was a protogai, so Kaido found it good that the boy had his back. Manjetsu wasn't even 20, and yet he was able to use all the seven swords. Mainly using Hiramekure and now that six other blades were lost, it was the only remaining blade left. Young people like Manjetsu, Mai were future of the village. The mist valued strength, there was a reason why none of the cage removed the ritual where academy students would be forced to kill each other in order to graduate. It gave them quality over quantity. And Kaido saw Mei and Manjetsu as prof of that. And even young shinobis like Zabuza, Kisum and Yugura were scouted out that way. Though the first two had lost their lives in the Chunin exams. But Kaido didn't consider it a loss, they were weak, and they faced the consequence of it. Though young Mei didn't like it that much. As she was the one training the two younger shinobis and treating them like siblings. Oh, and before I forget, Mei, but Kaido was cut off. Mizukage sama were are being attacked. A voice called out it was Manjetsu, who opened the office door. Mei already took out her kunai, and Kaido quickly used his chakra sense to scan the area. Their ship was surrounded by the enemy. But they were low in number, only a dozen. Still, the ship had only 15 shinobis, so the number difference wasn't that much. But the problem was Kaido couldn't tell if there was an cage level threats preset amongst the attacker. Mizukage sama stay on guard, we will protect you. Manjetsu said with determination. As he held his sword tightly. I already took out two while I was out for scouting, their weird sound based ninjutsu are something we should look out for. Other than that, they are only jonin level threats. But I couldn't save my comrades Manjetsu went to scout with two other Kiri Shinobis, and they seemed to have died in the ambush. Kaido nodded exiting the ship to get a better view of the enemies. All of them looked almost identical, wearing orange face masks and similar clothing. And all of their chakra was hidden with few injuries. if Kaido wasn't a skilled sensor, he wouldn't be able to pick their chakra up. Where were they from the Yuzumaki village, but they didn't have red hair. But then again hair color could be easily changed. Or was it Iwa who attacked them? Unknown Shinobis. It bothered the third Mizuich. He had to be on guard. One might think that all of them might be clones with how similar they are. But Kaido knew better. The enemy knew where their ship would sail through. Kaido didn't want to admit it, but there was a mole among his rank. But Kaido didn't want to think about it. All 15 of them, excluding were trusted people that Kaido took care of for years. He didn't want to think of them as enemies. The information might have been leaked from elsewhere. Who knows it's best to not think about it. Whoever the masked individuals were they were confident that they could take care of him. And it meant one of them might be a Kajelival opponent. But then again this place was in the middle of the sea, for Kiri Shinobis it was home turf. So, it shouldn't be difficult. Well, welcome Lord Hokage, I hope your journey went well. The Tsuchikage's attendant said. A blonde man, with an Iwa headband, standing next to the sitting Anoki. They were sitting on a round table, inside a tent. Only two people sat on it, Anoki and Hiruzen. Their attendants by their side. Well, it has. Harrison smiled, I'm really eager for the meeting, of course, you would be. It will stabilize the whole shit show. I would never imagine that Iwa would sit with Konoha one day for an alliance. Anoki said. But this alliance meeting is necessary if both Iwa and Konoha want to survive the third war. The Hokage nodded. Yes, let's get started. He said, we have a lot of things to discuss Minato if you will. Minato who was on his side, took out a small scroll unrolling it on the round table. And with that the meeting started. They discussed the terms and conditions and how they will split the loot in case of a successful invasion. With how the meeting was going one would think that the Iwa and Konoha meeting would conclude with both villages meeting in the middle and signing an alliance. But it was far from the truth. Hiruzen seemed happy and smiling on the outside, but inside he was constantly worrying. The same was Minato. They had been given an anonymous tip that the Iwa was setting a trap for them. One would pay no heed to the tip if things weren't going as the anonymous tip said. 
The blonde Iowa shinobi that was smiling and cheerful was the head of the Explosion Corporation in Iowa. A man that was a master at setting off explosions. He was by no means a cage-level opponent, but his traps were deadly even for seasonal shinobis. That's why Minato was here in the meeting with Hiruzen. The Hokage wanted to bring either Sakumo or Kagami with him. But the tip was given specially to Minato, detailing how to escape using his Harishin Jutsu. It made sense. Any sign of attack and they would flee the site. This wasn't a place for battle, if Iwa wanted to ambush then they would flee. There is no shame in running if Kanoha was in a better position. Even though this meeting was at the border, it was still near Iwa then to Kanoha. So, it seems that our deal is almost finished, Hiruzen said, chuckling. I have to say Anoki, I really hope to see a future where both our villages wouldn't have to fight in the war. Anoki scoffed. This war was not our intention either. That was obviously a lie. If Rashi wasn't killed by your Shinobis and Kiri pulling the strings, we would have stayed out of the war like the sand. Hiruzen nodded on the outside, while he wanted to scoff at the dwarf's face. This was load of bullshit. Iwa was fanning the flames of war for six to seven years, now. They hated Kanoha and every other village because the last war ended with them having an unfavorable position. Iwa attacked the borders each year, not to mention six years ago, they were able to enter the village and kidnap a Hyuga with them. Still to this day people remember the hospital massacre in Kanoha. Kanoha lost a quite the reputation at the time. People were afraid of moving into Kanoha a bit, thinking their security wasn't as good. But it was healed over time, still it wasn't forgotten. That is true anything else you need before we seal the deal. Hiruzen said, rolling out another scroll, this one he had already signed, and would require that Tsuchikage to sign. Yes. Anoki said, leaning back on his chair. He moved his hands together slowly making it appear he was going to take it out. But he was doing something else. Die. With that a white light emerged from his hands. The Kiri Shinobis were on full guard, all had their back toward the Mizukage who they were tasked to protect. Who are you people, Kaido said. He might seem relaxed to the untrained eyes, but he was on guard. Why have you blocked our way well, isn't that obvious? One of the masked figures said, amused. We are here to kill you. Kaido tensed up. It seemed that they were confident in taking him out. Where are you from? What group do you belong to does it matter? The masked figure said. But if we were to say then you can call us the orange masked pirates, led by none other than the great Toby D. Shanks. Of course, everyone knew that the man was jocking. No pirate group would dare to attack the Mizukich. Huh, tough crowd. Still one of us should have dyed our hair red my idea for later. One of the masked figures said, so are you all going to wait around? No. Attack them. The Mizukich gave the order, and all the shinobis started off throwing explosive kunai sand shurikens at the orange masked shinobis that surrounded them, standing on water. The explosives hit the masked shinobis creating explosions, sending water into air, and rocking the boat. But they didn't stop there, the mist shinobis quickly weaved hand signs to use a jutsu, but shurikens came out from the still bruising water and attacked them. A few of them dropped dead with shurikens stuck to their necks, while others jumped away cancelling their jutsu. They went on and engaged the enemy head-on with kunais in hand. The Mizukage didn't move from his position as he was protected by Manjetsu, while he weaved hand signs for a Jutsu. Water style. Great water kraken. With that he slammed his hand onto the boat, his chakra skillfully going through it and hitting the water below it. And right after that giant water tentacles sprouted out of the sea, while the mist shinobi forces backed off and attacked the clones only. Mei who was on Kaido's side, looked at all the masked attackers and found one of them missing. While she might not be a skilled sensor in range, as in Yuzumaki she was able to use sensory skills for a few meters around her. Kaido Sama look out. Mei said, pushing Kaido away, as from the ground one of the masked attackers phased out with kunai in hand. Mei quickly rolled and tried to kick the masked man in the face, only for his body to turn into multiple bats, and him grabbing her by the leg and throwing her away from the cage. Mei skidded on the ocean water trying to get back to the ship where Manjetsu and Kaido engaged one of the masked mans. But she was blocked. You are fighting me girly. Said another masked man no woman. Mei didn't notice it at first, but unlike others, her voice wasn't as deep and her chest was bit inflated and also had a bit of long hair, 
signs that this mask shinobi was a girl. So, not all of you are clones. Mei said with a kunai in hand. Figures no idiot would attack the Mizukage himself without backup. But then again, I must have overestimated your intellect. Is that so do you want a medal for that? The female mask user mused. But wait didn't you betray your original clan? So you won't be getting any, you dirty little whore. Mei growled and took steps back while she threw multiple shurikens and already finished with her jutsu. Vapor style? Dragon's breath. With that, she breathed out a stream of hot vapor that made its way to its target like a snake. The female mask shinobi ran forward with her own hand signs finished, breathing in and screaming out. Sonic roar. Breathing the vapor jutsu and almost hitting Mei who moved away at the last minute. But she wasn't able to do another jutsu either, as both female kanoichas engaged in a close quarters battle. Mei with her dual kunai and using her expert skills with them and the masked shinobi with her hands which were now big and shaped like claws. The tips of the claws burned bright red. Abito watched Kaido and Manjetsu fighting against two of his clones, while he looked to his side. Pakura taking care of Mei. Abito or at least his main body was keeping himself out of sight for a while. He wanted the missed Shinobis to underestimate him and his team. Give them hope that they might have a chance. And strike them when they least expect to. That's why, even though most of his clones could kill the struggling missed Shinobis they didn't. Only fought them on equal terms to give the ruse that they were struggling against them. He was fighting a cage level shinobi here, so he has to take every necessary step. This opponent survived against Anoki two times, the same man that later down the line stopped a meteor. So of course he would be careful. Even more so when in the series he knew absolutely nothing about him. The third Mizukage needed to die if he wanted to stop the war early. By his estimation the war should continue for three more years, judging by Itachi's age and some of the canon knowledge he could cross-reference with. But he wouldn't let the war drag along that much. Asuma, Shisui, Itachi if things went on like this. They will also have to be deployed, one by one. Maybe not Itachi, but Shisui was off age, where he was able to join the academy, but Abito held it off. They were talented, but he would rather not test their luck on a real battlefield. Even his own team, with Guy, Kakashi and Rin, would need to be deployed. But unlike the others, he trusted his teammates to survive the hell known as war. But others wouldn't. He was sick of this war and all the bloodshed. He at first thought that it wouldn't bother him that much. But each day, when the children of one of the Achiha clans came and asked them if their parents will return, he had to reassure them with bluffs. But they weren't the only ones losing their loved ones. Rin she lost both of her parents and the war. Fuck. No one deserved to lose their parents. And surely not his friend. And he couldn't just stand by now that he had the power to make a difference. With his bats even while he was stuck in the village, he was able to gather key info on all the five cages with ease. Anoki that dwarf fell under the pressure by the Iwa Council and would betray Kanoha. They even planned everything if that happened that meant Kanoha would have no allies. And after that it would be three village against Kanoha but it could be avoided. And that was simply by killing the Mizukage this bastard was the reason why the war started by killing him, it will favor Kanoha how? Well Abito's thought process was cut off, Manjetsu had left the Mizukage's side to attack the clones, leaving a gap in what Abito could take advantage of. Two clones were holding of the cage, while Manjetsu tried to finish another clone of himself. He gave a telepathic signal to his clones, both the clones that were fighting the Mizukage breathed in air. And screamed out a sonic roar, making the cage back off and jump away from the boat. Of course, the sound jutsu damaged the boat beyond repair, and it would sink soon. The Mizukage was in air, and he had lost the contour of the silver water that was around his body. So, both the Abito's clones took the chance to throw multiple shurikens at the cage. But they were no ordinary shurikens Abito had his shuringen running, so he doesn't miss any opportunities, and quickly made three hand signs with his right hand, while on the other hand, he prepared small armament senbans. The shurikens bounced off each other and one went past the Mizukage. This particular shrunken had a mark on it. Abito used the chance to use Horatian there and appear behind the Mizukage. Got you. He quickly flung his left hand at the back of the Mizukage. The cage grunted, but kicked behind Abito, who used his arm to block the jutsu, throwing him a bit away, 
but he stayed on the air with his flying jutsu. Well, he wasn't actually using the flying jutsu he stole from Anoki. No, it was his special cloak that he created that would use the gravity jutsu on him, with a mental command. He could also use it to increase his weight when using tojutsu as well. Kaido stood on water and quickly made three hand signs, and jelly-like silver liquid came out of his vest, taking out the armament senbans and creating a protective armor around him. Abito smirked, that was a deadly poison that he had bought from Anko. What just because he was a bat summoner, doesn't mean he wouldn't use the snakes for his own benefit. Poison brewing was a snake summoner's go-to job, and Anko had set up a shop to sell poisons made by her and Arachimaru. And this was the best kind. Though he was pretty sure that it wasn't even the top 10 poisons that Arachimaru had access to. This poison would have insta-killed any adversary, but in the world of Chakra, and against a cage-level opponent like him, it should take a bit of time. Poison? Really? How original. The Mizukage said, unamused. Not seeming to be a little bit concerned. I have seen through your tricks, not all of you can turn into bats and avoid damage. Meaning I have to focus on you and the girl that's fighting Mei. So killing you both should be easy, unlike the rest. I'm also guessing you or her is the mastermind behind the whole plan. Abito snorted. Was that supposed to impress me? Abito could switch between him and his clone anytime using his Horatian, and unless the man knew Senjutus he wouldn't be able to find the original. But Abito was a bit white-eyed when noticed that purple liquid was coming out of Senban wounds. Shit. So the Mizkage's water jutsu wasn't just only armor, it could also detoxify poisons. Did you really think this battle would be that easy? The Mizukage said, the silver mercury-like liquid around his body seemed to gain some solid definition and even gave him spider-like legs on the back and two swords in his hands. It seemed that the cage could control the liquid like water, which was obviously tougher than steel. Fuck. So it was like fighting a shinobi version of a waterbender. The only silver lining was there was a limit to how much that silver liquid he could control. If not he would have taken over a huge portion of the sea in control and attacked him with that. This fight just got tough, the poison was ineffective. So he had to kill him the old-fashioned way. Let's not waste any time. Guys finish them, we need backup. Abito said, as he gave the order. And suddenly the whole battlefield shifted in Abito's favor. The clones were finishing off the Mist Shinobus with these. It should be easy, all of the soldiers had already unknowingly breathed in Robin's special fear toxin. Which made them fear the water they stood on. The Mizukage and a few seemed unaffected, or they were just strong-willed enough to fight through the fear. Even Pakura took it up a notch and summoned her Scorch Release and Sage Mark. May herself using Lava Release to counter them. Abito really could have handled the whole the Mizukage was white-eyed and quickly moved fast towards one of the Mist Soldiers to kill the clone. The Mist Soldier, who was about get stabbed in between the eyes with an armament rod, suddenly got pushed to the side, while the Mizukage used his spider-like pincers to throw the clone away. The clone turned intangible crows to attack damage and reformed. Soldier are you alright? Kaido asked. But the Mizukage to no replay, in fact, he sensed something odd from behind, a shifting of Kraka, to fire release of sorts. Kaido only got the chance to look back as the soldier inflated and then exploded, engulfing them both. Mizukage sama Both Manjetsu and Mei called out. Abito quickly slapped away a silver bullet that was about to him. The smoke cleared, and the Mizukage's mildly damaged figure was relieved. He looked a bit pissed. Well, why wouldn't he be? The clones while fighting the missed soldiers, Nightwing had put almost all of them in his blood bomb Jinjutsu, pumped with fear toxin. Now, while the Mizukage might have avoided the poison. Fear Toxin on the other hand was a different story. Now Kyoto was feeling a bit lightheaded and angry. Soon it will turn to full-fledged fear with hallucination, untamed anger and impulsive decision-making. Though it will take time, a lot of time. By now most of the clones were done with their tasks, three of the Abido clone was handling Manjetsu. The 17-year-old boy was already an elite jonin and was able to handle three of his bat clones. Impressive. Mei was also the same. Pakura herself was an elite jonin, so the fact that she can keep up while only being 16 is quite good. Though Pakura herself was only 13 years old. Abito had eight of his clones now, with him they were nine. And now the real battle started. 
Abito and his clones surrounded the cage and moved at once. The Mizukage skillfully controlled the silver liquid and used it to make weapons to hit the clones or deflect their attack. Though he was still getting pushed around. Abito's sound-based ninjutsu made the cage lose a bit of control over the liquid each time him or his clones would attack. And Abito was waiting for an opportunity. And Abito made a clever feint and used an sound-based ninjutsu to fool the cage. And this was the opportunity Abito used his high speed and almost was face to face with the cage. And he made eye contact with the cage. Jinjutsu Sharingan. Inverse world putting him on the strongest Sharingan Jinjutsu he knew. Huh. All according to my plan. The cage lost his concentration of the battle just for a moment as he was unable to break of the Jinjutsu immediately and his senses worked in reverse. And Abito used that chance to slit his throat with an armament rod. The attack landed, but at the last moment Kaido backed off, holding his throat. The Achiha was impressed, he was still able to break from that Jinjutsu. He suspected that Silver Liquid also worked like a symbiote and helped breaking him out of the Jinjutsu world. The Mizukage was injured, but alive. Abito clicked his tongue, that should have taken his head off. But it seemed that it only slit the front section of his throat. And so now the Mizukage couldn't speak, but he was shocked that his opponent was an Achiha. Not that he could tell anyone. While his Silver Water Judas lets him take out the poison from his bloodstream, it didn't have the effects on healing. For now, he could only stop the wound, and after the battle was over he could have that repaired. But his concentration was now almost cut in half, he had to worry about his open wound and also fight off the enemies. Kaido was in a tough position, he first thought that his enemy was an Iwa Shinobi. Because of him being able to fly, but then when he was using those air-based jutsus, it almost made him wonder if he was from sand. But now seeing the Sharingan he was confused. He had seen someone use all of them. And that was a kid the Mizukid shook his head. It could also be Kagami. And it would also explain the strange teleportation jutsu he used. The Hiroshin, a jutsu created by the second Hokage. He only thought Minato was able to use that, but it seems that Konoha was hiding their talents. The Achihas were able to copy any jutsu given enough time. Maybe the brat taught his teacher those jutsu. Why did Konoha want him dead it doesn't add up. But they were in war, so any blood was game. What? Cat got your taunch? Abito chuckled. After this is over, it won't just help stop the war, it will also help the mist. So, please die for their sake. While it might seem provocative, it was the truth. The third Mizukage was ambitious, and even though he wasn't bad as Danzo at creating wars. He was just as much the reason. If he was dead, then the next Mizukage would be Konoha's allies. Now that Iwa was planning to betray Konoha, having missed on their side would eventually lead to a more even war. As the fight was dragged on, Abito was gaining the upper hand. The Achiha wasn't sure, but at least 10 minutes passed. Which was a bit worrying. The man had a slit throat, and he was still going. Well, he was a cage for nothing. Abito didn't think he would need to use every card he had to battle the Mizukage. His Harishin was countered with the Mizukage's fast reaction speed, his armament rods countered with silver water jutsu, and now that the Mizukage knew that he was an Achiha, he was cautious of making eye contact. And was breaking off from any sound-based Genjutus he put him on immediately. But even then, he was able to land a hit or two on the cage. Small slashes or punches that cracked bones. Abito was in much better condition than the cage. But from his senses, the cage still had almost half of his chakra left. Abito even had to pull out eight gates, opening up to the sixth gate. But even with the added speed, it was doing nothing. So he had turned it off. The Mizukage was fast enough to react to Harishin, so of course, he would be able to counter any movement-based jutsu. Mainly the Mizukage's reaction speed came from his sensory ability. His speed could even match most lightning users that focused on speed. But then again, he fought off against Anoki two times already, without permanent damage, of course, he would be tough. Abito only had his last card left. You really have pushed me far, old man. Let's give you a little treat. With that he activated the sage mark on his hand. From his glitch vision, Abito could see the surge of green chakra that was pulled inside of him, as the tattoo of spread around his arm, and his hair stood up. Kaido seeing that the enemy wasn't holding back anymore, he also made his last ditch effort. 
and quickly ran through hand signs and planted his hand on the water. And with a puff of smoke, a giant spider with silver outlines was summoned. The battle just got interesting. The giant spider stood on water, on top of it was the Mizukich. It seems we are facing a tough opponent who isn't a dwarf. The summon said, his voice was deep, and his eyes were glaring at the mask shinobi. This should be fun. And he tried to intimidate an Achiha by glaring at him. A mistake. Abito quickly used the chance to put the spider in a nightmarish Jinjutsu. But it seemed that the Mizukage was clever enough to figure it out. And break his summon out of it. The summon seemed a bit rattled, before it hissed with fury. So he's from that clan. The Mizukage didn't say anything, not that he could with a slit throat. So he just nodded. His silver liquid had now merged with the giant spider's body now he would be able to control much more of the silver liquid. Abito didn't know what perks it granted. But he would need to be careful. The fight started again with Abito and his eight clones, fighting against a giant spider and the Mizukich. It went on for a while, neither side gaining the advantage. Well, Abito mostly started using his flame release jutsus, along with wind release jutsus. With the added power of the sage mark, the effects were devastating. But the spider, even while in water, was nimble enough to move around the attack. Well, of course, the spider would be fast, it was fast enough to help Kaido fight against Anoki. Even in water where he didn't have any good footing, the spider could easily jump from one place to another, using its webs to pull himself out of attacks. Or web up Abito's clones. Abito was impressed. That was an air rank summon right there. The same rank as the second Mizukage's clam summon. The fight was dragging on, and Abito was running out of time. He could only use his sage mark for another half a minute. Before it would need some time to recharge. Unlike Pakura's sage mark, it had a few drawbacks. Abito needed leverage. Abito, now that he could use sage chakra, tried to find any weakness in the giant spider using his Sharingan. Honestly, it boosted his ocular abilities to another level. The whole fight was going in slow motion for him. But with the physical boosting of the sage mark, he was able to react faster. And he found one. It was easy. Like any spider, it had multiple eyes, and it wouldn't be too tough for him to put it in a Jinjutsu, and now that he was using Sage Chakra. He was sure he could deal some significant mental damage with his Jinjutsu. Abito had learned the most potent of Sharingan Jinjutsu, that would one-shot most Jonin level opponents. But against Cage level opponents it wasn't enough. But there were two ways to increase the power of the Sharingan Jinjutsu. One is the obvious option, that is awakening the Manjekyo, after that even a simple Jinjutsu would have twice the effect. In the original series, Itachi was able to paralyze and make Orochimaru shit himself with his normal Sharingan Jinjutsu. He didn't even open up his MS back then. And the other way was using Sinjutsu with the Sharingan. The Toad clan had very powerful Sinjutsu techniques related to Jinjutsu. Minato had shown them to him after a lot of pestering. And Abito was able to readjust some of the jutsu to work with his Sharingan. Abito looked at his clone, Nightwing, and nodded. Giving him a mental idea of the plan. The other clones also took flight with Geppo around the Mizukage, and then finished their one-handed hand signs. Fire style. Fireball jutsu. Half of the clones said. Wind style. Great breakthrough. The other half of the clones said. Both justice combined and the effects were devastating. The Jutsus might not be enhanced by Sinjutsu, but they were just as powerful. And yet the Mizukage was ready. He moved his hands around the sea, with the added help of his summon, the water beneath the spider also turned silver and moved with his commands. Encasing both him and his summon within a protective bubble. Abito smirked. They fell for the trap. He quickly moved towards the spider and hit him with a Jinjutsu. This one was supposed to hold the spider still. The silver spider summon only saw that his legs were stuck to the ocean like it was glue, and no amount of strength could remove it. But he was able to see everything else. And even while knowing it was a Jinjutsu he wasn't able to break it. Not without help. The Mizukage was stuck between controlling the bubble, so he wasn't able to break his summon out of it as well. Abito smirked, just as planned. And he clapped both his hands. And a small white cube took shape. It was called dust release for a reason. It was because it used fire, wind and earth chakra to supercharge the dust around the area to make the devastating jutsu. 
The Mizukage was in shock. When he saw the cube get larger and larger, before shooting forward into the protective bubble. It disintegrated the whole structure and the spider beneath it. Not that jutsu. The summon screamed in fear. Trapped in its own bubble with legs stuck because of the Jinjutsu, it gave its last scream as it lost the top half of its upper body and head because of the Jutsu. The Mizukage in the last second had mounted off the spider's back and got away from the attack. Nightwing quickly took the chance to make eye contact with the frantic Mizukage. Putting him in another Jinjutsu. And this wasn't a Sharingan Jinjutsu, but a Ketsurikan one. Kaido, who was a bit used to breaking off from the Sharingan Jinjutsu, stumbled to break off from the new type of Jutsu. All the clones threw multiple shuriken and kunai at the Mizukage. The cage tried to use the leftover silver liquid to shield him. But Ibido found a chance and used Horation without any seals to appear right in front of the cage and plunged two armament rods into his chest, piercing both of his lungs. He was targeting his heart, but the man was like a cockroach. Though he wouldn't live long because those were also coated with poison. Removing poison from internal organs wasn't as easy as removing them from skin wounds. Abito wanted to scream in frustration and blow his head off, but wasn't able to do much as the Mizukage kicked him away. Mizukage-sama. Manjetsu said, appearing behind him. I will hold him off please flee the area. The Mizukage even while injured didn't want to flee now. He was on his last leg already. Also, with the opponent's speed, it would be useless. Kaido wanted Manjetsu and Mei to flee and alert the village. But as he was about to say something, he felt pain from behind. It was as if someone cut off his spine. Because someone did. The cage looked behind he couldn't believe it. Was it a Jinjutsu? Ugh the cage grunted as he fell forward. Mizukage-sama. Mei screamed while looking at Manjetsu with horrified eyes. Manjetsu. Why? But she was in her own battle. Eyes here, lady. Pakura, who was also wearing the Toby outfit, attacked with enlarged hands. Punching her in the gut, flinging her to the air, before screaming away a sonic scream that rattled the poor missed girl. Pakura found some pleasure in killing the bitch. Their village was the reason why her team was dead in the first place. While she wasn't able to kill Zabuzab or kiss him, now if she could kill someone as powerful as her, then it would satisfy her. Mei was still in the air, and she tried to weave another hand seal, but with the sound jutsu blowing out her eardrums and with all that was happening, she was a tad bit late. Before she could even land on the water. Pakura shot out multiple spikes from her mutated hand. Red scorching spikes multiple of them pierced her body as she fell on the water, dyeing the sea red. The Mizukage gurgled, eyeing Manjetsu, as if asking why he couldn't even scream or ask because of his throat being slit. Well, wouldn't you like to know? Manjutusu snorted, swinging his blade, cutting the man's head off. This time he wouldn't live. Abito mused jumping near them. You really had to take the show, didn't you? He said. But then again, as the future Mizukage, you do need to be cage level. And killing the previous Mizukage does make it count. He chuckled at the last part. Manjetsu didn't say anything. He looked to the side where Mei was, feeling a bit of regret about her dying. But he strengthened his resolve. If he wanted to create a better future for his village, then he would need to make tough decisions. And with him as the new Mizukage, he would finally be able to stabilize the village and his hidden supporter. Manjetsu looked at the masked man, even he wasn't sure if the man was from Kanoha or from Iwa. He was using a mash of jutsus that derived from both villages. And with how proficient he was using wind jutsu, one might think he was even from the sand. But that didn't matter. The man called himself Toby and his hidden supporter wanted this war to end as fast as possible. And that was why he approached his clan to take over the mist, with him as the cage. And the scary part was how powerful Toby was. He was able to put all of the active shinobi in his clan to sleep with his Jinjutsu. But those that were able to keep themselves awake were terrified of his presence. And that's not to mention how much hidden info he had of the mist and the clans, Manjetsu was actually glad that a powerful shinobi like Toby didn't come and kill off his whole clan that day. The man was kind enough to give his clan the chance they needed to secure the position of Mizukage. He personally didn't hate the third cage, even respected him more than the second Mizukage, who was his ancestor. But he valued his clan over his village. 
With how things were going Manjetsu was sure the Mizukage might start a purge to kill off the Hizuki and Yuki clans. There were already plans for doing that with the Kagaya clan. That's why he had no choice. Manjetsu looked at the sea around them as it was filled with blood, broken parts of the ships, and the bodies of his allies. He asked himself if it was worth it, but with this, the meaningless bloodshed could be stopped, and their village could finally prosper. With his own clan, and the Yuki supporting him, the village won't mind such a young person being the Mizukage. And with how much the third Mizukage trusted him, the Mist Council wouldn't protest that much. He was the only one that survived the assault from the Masked Shinobi. What the Hizuki didn't know was that they were all being played by Abito. The clan already had a distrust for the cage with Danzo's manipulation, and when he was cut off. Abito smartly took over the brainwashed spies. Using them to retell the happenings into making them believe that the Mizukage was trying to kill off their clan. Ironic, wasn't it? Abito found it really amusing how Manjetsu's backstory was a flipped version of Itachi's own story. Both clan prodigies, both sent by the clan to keep an eye on the cage, and one took the route of helping his village, while the other took the route of helping his family. Abito smiled underneath his mask. He was pulling strings and he would make sure Manjetsu became the Mizukage. If he took the seat, then with him in charge, they were bound to sign an alliance with Kanoha. Every village had a few cage-level shinobi. From the start of the war, the only reason the Mist was even able to survive was because of their abundance of shinobi from all the islanders. They only had Kaido as a cage-level shinobi. The Mist had no other like him. And if Manjetsu became the cage, he would be underqualified. All the villages would try to get them off the map. But it could be stopped if they sign an alliance with Kanoha. With that, Iwa and Kumo wouldn't dare to drag the war any longer and put a stop to it. Abito wouldn't have to do this if Iwa was actually planning to get in an alliance with Kanoha. But those rock humpers were trying to betray them. So with Toby being the hidden supporter of Kiri, the alliance between Kanoha and Mist was guaranteed. What he did wasn't right, but there was no other way. The Achiha just hoped that it would be enough to stop the war. Things didn't go as planned, now the whole of Kanoha was in an uproar. Not only did the stone betray the trust of Kanoha, having even went as far as to ambush the Hokage during a peaceful meeting. Thankfully Minato and Hiruzen were both able to safely return to the village. But now, politically, Kanoha was in an unfavorable position. Now both Iwa and Kumo were directly against Kanoha. And rumors were that both had joined hands in getting rid of Kanoha from the land of fire. In the war, only the mist had gained some land due to the Uzumaki relocating to Kanoha. So the rest of the village was getting restless to gain something for the war and justify it. If Iwa had joined hands with Kanoha, then even if Kumo or the other villages allied together, Kanoha would be able to survive. But now it was looking like all things were against Kanoha. If this went on the shinobi forces in Kanoha would be cut short, and Kanoha might even have to deploy child genin to fill the ranks in war. The situation wasn't looking too good for Kanoha. Now rumors were that the Tsuchikage was preparing to send a large army to invade Kanoha. That's not to mention that the Rakage had already been seen at the border, and he was building up quite a large number of soldiers to attack Kanoha on that front too. Things weren't looking good for Kanoha, and it would only worsen if steps weren't taken. It was a good thing that you had received that tip otherwise I'd fear the worst. Hiruzen said, sitting in his chair. Minato was on Hiruzen's side and nodded. They were in the cage meeting room, around him were some of the most contributed shinobi commanders, clan leaders, and advisors. Almost all the upper rank members of Kanoha gathered in that room. The only one that remained missing was Danzo, but most of them knew why. This meeting wouldn't have been possible if not for Minato having the jutsu of the second Hokage, Taburama. Hiruzen had even brought some of the best commanders of Kanoha back from the border to the meeting. This meeting was that important. Of course, this was also the reason why some equally successful shinobi like Arachimaru and Jiraiya were not seen in the meeting. That dwarf how dare he try to deceive us. Said the clan leader of the Akamichi clan. As a last line of defense, even as a clan leader, he had joined the war. And like his brother, Tarifu Akamichi, he was a man of honor. We should attack them now. For using such trickery against a peace treaty. Do they not have honor calm down, Chumza. Anoichi Yamanaka said. 
We shouldn't rush into decisions I'm just glad that Hokage Sama was able to get out of that situation unharmed. But things aren't good on our front either I agree. The village is in a tough spot, now the other village, mainly that the sand and mist might even jump to the attacking side if Kumo and Iwa attack at the same time. It was Shikaku Nara who spoke. The Nara's words made everyone in the room grim. It was the hard truth. Hokage Sama, are there no ways to ally with the other village? Sakumo Haddock, or less commonly known as Sakumo Senju, spoke. Other than the small villages that are allied with us, having Suno or Kiri as allies would be very helpful, but then again I see no way how Kiri would ally with us. They were the ones that started the war. The others in the room nodded. Hiruzen and a few others were aware that Danzo had some contribution in the war happening in the first place. But they didn't want to sully the old fool's reputation and bring an internal struggle. Not when a war was happening. All we can do now is to be prepared for anything Kiri won't likely make an attempt for an alliance and also might reject it because of having us. It was Kenshi Uzumaki who spoke, the youngest in the room. But as a clan leader, he along with his uncle were attending the meeting. But we can still be hopeful about Suna, the situation with Suna is also complicated, since in the previous war, we were directly against Suna, they aren't very keen on allying with us. Shikaku Nara said. What was left unsaid was that one of the elders of Suna, Lady Chiyo, was totally against Konoha. Mainly because Sakumo was the reason for her family member's death. Here is in sight, before looking at Sakumo, Sakumo how are things on your end? It might be too much of a responsibility, but you should prepare in case the rakage attacks. With Minato and young Abito, I'm sure we will be able to deploy a few of our elite squads immediately. The fact that an Ichiha knew the jutsu of the second Hokage was found amusing by many in the room. While Kagami and Fugaku felt a bit proud of their clan's dark horse. Sakumo nodded, I will try my best Hokage-sama. But the room door suddenly opened. A jonin was at the door, and he looked a bit winded, he also had a certain letter in his hand. Jonin what is this Minato stopped speaking when he saw the letter the jonin had in his hand. It had the symbol of Kiri and the emblem of the Mizukage. It was no doubt an authentic letter from the land of water. The whole room fell silent, and Hiruzen gestured to the jonin to bring the letter, and the old man opened it. The contents of the letter on the other hand. After reading it, it made the old cage speechless. Minato, who was at his side, had glanced at the contents of the letter as well, and he had a deep frown in his face. Is something wrong Hiruzen? Kagami spoke seeing his friend's reaction. But Hiruzen didn't say anything, just passed on the letter to him. And after reading it, he was equally surprised. Is this is this true? What happened, Hokage-sama? Shikaku asked. Did the mist send a notice of war? It might be bad, but this was fully logical because Hiruzen had already received a notice of war from both Kumo and Iwanao, so another village allying against Konoha was fully possible. Hearing Shikaku's words the whole room felt a bit grim. But they readied themselves for the possible outcome. No the third Mizukage has been killed during an attack during his visit to the land of whirlpools. The attackers are yet to be known, but almost no one in the journey survived. Harrison said. The whole room fell silent, but for different reasons. Well, is that bad news? Sakumo asked. One less enemy to kill in his book. Actually, with him being a lightning user, killing the third Mizukage wouldn't be too hard for him. But then again he was most of the time there to counter the rakage, so that the old fool wouldn't get any ideas. No, wait if the Mizukage was killed, and Anoki was in the meeting with Hokage-sama, then who killed him? Shikaku was the first one to question. Did Kumo attack the Mizukage? The letter didn't mention anything about the killer, other than the fact that one of them called himself Tobi, and wore a mask. And was a good fire style user. Harrison said. That is strange we don't know of any shinobi with that description. But why hide his identity? Killing a cage is no joke. Every other village would want him in their ranks, with that skill, even if it was a full team, killing a cage even with a dozen shinobi is no easy task. Shikaku said. We will have to look into our spies for that answer. But this is just too sudden. Hiruzen said. It is most likely an inside job, but it doesn't add up. Even if we say it was a setup, and there were some internal betrayals killing the third Mizukage is no easy feat. Sakumo said. 
The third Mizukage fought Anoki to a standstill two times, there was no way he would be killed that easily. There must be something behind this more importantly, what's the mist's response? They don't want to go to war one presume. The Nara guessed that if one of their top shinobi was suddenly killed, it would be hard to replace, then they wouldn't be acting so boldly. No the newly appointed fourth Mizukage wants an alliance with us. Kagami spoke this time. And now the whole room was shocked yet again. This might be just a thing that Konoha needed to win and end the war. This this can't possibly be true. Kenshi Uzumaki was the one to speak. After driving us, the Uzumaki, off our homeland, now they want an alliance? It sounds like a possible trap. Almost half of the room agreed. Kiri was known for being shrewd and merciless amongst the five villages. If you would Shikaku Nara asked for the letter, which Kagami handed over and went over his content. He thought for a while before speaking, it might sound wrong, but I don't think it's a trick. All eyes were on the Nara now. So Nara explained. You see, Kiri was already facing a lot of pressure from Iwa, and unlike Iwa, they don't have that many powerful shinobi, they were mostly holding them off using their home terrain as an advantage. The only competent fighter amongst them was the third Mizukich, but now with him dead, Iwa might try to seize control over the land. The same for Kumo so they are trying to get into an alliance with Konoha for that reason. The room pondered over the words of Nara. That was right, while Konoha was the strongest village amongst the five major villages, having multiple cage-level opponents, Kiri was the weakest amongst them, alongside the sand. The only possible cage-level shinobi they had were the cages and the Jinchuariki so it would make sense if one of them allied with Konoha. Who is the fourth Mizukage anyway? Sakumo asked. I don't know of any capable cage-level shinobi taking the place of Kaido, the third Mizukage. Kaido might not be that well known amongst the cage, but he fought Anoki twice and survived, that's quite the feat. There aren't any capable shinobi like Kaido and the Mist Hirazan agreed. If it was anyone else, I would have been confident in saying that the killing of the Mizukage was an inside job. But with him it's just complicated. Who's the man in the chair now? The fourth Mizukage is Manjetsu Hazuki the only survivor from the assassination attempt on Kaido. Shikaku said. Wait, if that's a Hazuki, it should be an inside job they were after the seat for quite some time, after the second Mizukage's death. Sakumo said. And we all knew how things were unstable between the Hazuki clan and the third Mizukage. Shikaku shook his head, no, while the rest of the Hazuki were loyal, Manjetsu showed undying loyalty towards Kaido, even going on suicide missions on his orders. So that's why we can't say it's an inside job. Even if that's the case by appointing a Hazuki as the Mizukage, aren't they creating more internal conflict? Sakumo said. Even if the boy was a loyalist, people with power would often question your morals in some situations. The room silently agreed with Sakumo, a few years back even he was questioned on his loyalty. And that's not to say the boy isn't of a cage caliber, sure he might be talented, but he needs raw power to take the hat people aren't just going to accept him. The internal conflict of Mist was getting worse by the day, this might be one of the possible reasons why the third Mizukage jumpstarted the war. But Manjetsu Hazuki being the new Mizuich. The boy was talented, him being able to use all of the swords of the seven swordsmen proved that, but he wasn't a shinobi of cage caliber. An elite jonin yes, but not cage level. Hearing that name Kenshi's hands clenched up. That was the same man that killed his father, but his uncle put a hand over his shoulder and shook his head. The young clan leader sighed. He couldn't do anything. Removing his personal animosity towards the man, Kenshi knew a possible alliance with Konoha and Kiri might be possible. While his father might have died by that man. His father's foolish decision to betray Konoha and help Kiri in attacking the border of Konoha was the reason the whole war started. And yet Konoha accepted the remaining Uzumaki into their ranks. That's why he couldn't flat out share his anger and frustration. If this brings peace back to the shinobi world and Konoha in general, then as a clan leader he wouldn't stop it for the benefit of his own clan. Anyway, the newly appointed Mizukage wants to have a meeting to discuss an alliance, Hiruzen said. They want it within the week. That's quite the deadline, Sakumo said. It seems they are in a hurry. But should we have another alliance meeting? I think we should think things over before replying to Kiri. 
Now, Fugaku Ichiha was the one to speak, Kiri had always been unstable, be it amongst their own village, or their clan allying with them would also mean we would need to help during internal conflicts. And that's not to say they had already taken over the land once held by the Uzumaki, so allying with them should need to be reconsidered with all the accounts in mind. I agree with the Ichiha clan leader on that one, Sakumo also nodded. Him being the representative of the Senju clan, it might be one of the few times that both the Ichiha and Senju agreed on something. We should reconsider it and demand the land of Uzumaki back, and also put Konoha in a favorable position with all things the Kiri did. They were the reason the war started in the first place, allying with them won't do us any good in image or in favor. Minato also nodded, yes, if we do accept the peace treaty offer, we are accepting the young Hazuki as the new Mizukage, I think that's what they are hoping for in the first place. The third Mizukage had a lot of loyal followers who would want to take the place, rather than give it to a Hazuki. But if we accept the offer, we are practically securing his seat. But, we shouldn't care about that whoever assassinated the third Mizukage is still unknown, so we should be careful, Shikakunara said, we can't make too many demands in case Kiri backs off from the alliance. We can force the terms later after the alliance is completed. But still, we shouldn't outright delay their peace meeting. If it's a trap it would still be one even if we set the date at a later time. It's better to hope that this one doesn't end up becoming a trap. I agree with Shikaku on this part. Anoichi Yamanaka said. The same was with the leader of the Akamichi clan. While both Senju and Ichiha clans were powerful, they were fewer in number to the Akamichi, Nara and Yamanaka clans nowadays. The other clans also gave their input. Some wanted the meeting to happen as fast as possible, while others wanted to wait things out and get the full info on the situation of Kiri. And that led to people agreeing and disagreeing with the cause. Everyone was giving their own input. As clan leaders, they had a duty to share their views. So the meeting continued. All the while no one noticed that a certain bat was hanging on the wall, well hidden in the darkness. Its bloody red eye spun lazily at the meeting table. Abito watched as the meeting went on, he smiled seeing how things were going. With his bat, he was easily able to spy on the Hokage's meeting. Now that he knew a bit about Sinjutsu, he knew how to hide the bat's chakra so that Minato wouldn't catch it. Of course, there was a chance he could get caught, but honestly, even if he did, Minato and Hiruzen trusted him enough to let it slip by. Huh, the fools thought they could make a hokage out of him? Never. Anyway, back to the meeting. It seemed that after the Nara's explanation, few had complaints regarding the alliance. With how things were going Abito was sure that by the end of the day, Konoha would be on its way to signing a treaty with the Mist. Abito made a note to expand his spy network, keeping an eye on both Anoki and the Rakage. And from what he knew both of them were too eager to gain a leg up on Konoha. But if Konoha and Kiri joined hands, there was a chance for the two other major villages to join hands as well. And Abito knew better than to let that happen. For now, he would only keep an eye out, Konoha was fighting a defensive war here, and with Kiri joining the alliance, it would either stop the war prematurely, or it will fan the flames of something bigger. Still, nothing was sure. With Manjetsu as the Mizuka Jibito basically had the mist under his wing, and that was also the reason why he didn't want the country to take any major damage. He wasn't delusional enough to think that he could rope all the five villages together. That was for little Sasuke and Naruto to figure out, well, if that were to ever happen for now, he would try to make a better future for them. Another few days passed, and finally, the alliance between Kiri and Konoha was declared. The people of Konoha cheered, the same went for the people of Kiri. The general population didn't like the war. They wanted the war to end, so that they could get back to their usual life. Many merchants had to stop their business due to the routes getting blocked, many families were separated due to the border clash. While Shinobi fought for honor, the general population sought out peace. No one wanted to die, especially not powerless civilians. But on the other side of Konoha, something was happening. A certain elder was making a few steps that will shake Konoha to its core. Danzo, this is the last favor we can pull for you. After that, we are done. Hamura Mitakato said as he spoke to him, through a water projection. We have made preparations, and if you leave immediately, then Hiruzen won't suspect anything. Kahara Yudetane said, also as a water projection. 
She might have retired not too long ago as a shinobi, but her work with water was still famed amongst Konoha shinobi. This was one of her personal jutsus that she kept mostly to herself. She was one of the students of the second Hokage, so of course Fuinjutsu and water nature would be her specialty. You have my gratitude. Danzo said, I will use this opportunity carefully. Danzo Shimura was in his room. He was under unofficial house arrest, all the power he once had as an elder of Konoha stripped away, his chakra sealed, and his root disbanded. One would think this would be the end of his schemes, but it wasn't. Around Danzo, five root shinobi were sitting across from him with one holding the scroll that held the two water projections, along with two smaller scrolls in his hands. He was only able to hide five of them. Once a force of hundreds now reduced to numbers that can be counted with one hand. They might be only small in numbers, but each one of them were at least Jonin level with their own specialties, they could even give a Kajelival shinobi quite the trouble. Hiruzen might have disbanded Root, but he of course had some hidden cards. He was Kanoha's darkness and he had his shadows everywhere. You better, we are basically betraying Hiruzen's trust, Kaharu said, frowning. But, know this with that, our debt is repaid. Danzo nodded. I will destroy all evidence of that incident. He said. Like everyone, Danzo's fellow elders had a lot of skeletons in their closet. It just so happened that over the years, Danzo was able to get a close look into their secrets and find things he could work with. You better, we don't like getting blackmail to do your bidding. I have a reputation as the chief of the civilian council. Hamura said, more so growled. Danzo again nodded, no emotion in his face. Believe me Hamura, I don't like using those kinds of tactics either. But desperate time calls for desperate measures. And you have my word, I'm only doing this for Kanoha's sake. The Shimura sounded genuine, but both the elders knew better than to take his words at face value. For a few seconds, the projections didn't say anything. Before Danzo spoke. So, were you capable enough to fix my chakra issues? Danzo asked, while he held up his hands. There was a tattoo-like kanji going around his wrists, this was also one of the issues that was holding him back. Stopped him from using his chakra and ninjutsu. Kaharu smirked, well, that Yuzumaki seal was quite tough to crack, but I was one of the second Hokage's students. It would be a shame if I wasn't able to figure it out. The projection said. I have already given your root shinobi two other scrolls. One holds the key to defuse the seal. But be aware Danzo, if you remove the seal, Hiruzen will be notified. So, do it after you leave the borders. Danzo again nodded, and the other scroll will be on my decoy, so that Hiruzen doesn't suspect anything. He went over the scrolls. It was a decoy scroll of sorts that would mask his location, until he broke the seals that were on his wrists. You have my gratitude, Danzo said, pocketing one of the two scrolls, while one of his root members transformed into him, before sitting near him. He gave him the other scroll. Where will you be going? Hamura asked. To the land of rain? Danzo didn't say anything for a few seconds before he nodded. Yes, I won't ask how you got that information. But believe me, I'm doing everything for the sake of the village. Kaharu snorted. You started the war Danzo. I hope you at least will help in ending it. That I will, and I will make sure that Konoha comes out of it as the victor. Danzo Shimura didn't like where Konoha was leading to. He instigated the war to end all wars. There was a reason why he started the war with Kiri's attack. Kiri was a major village, yes, but it wasn't as powerful as Kumo or Iwa, heck even Suna had more capable shinobi than them. And with Kiri first attacking Konoha, this was the perfect chance to do a full-scale invasion of the Water Nation. It was always the plan, he even hinted it to Hiruzen several times. Including where the mist kept its Jinchuricus and other secrets that he had gathered over the years. There is a reason why he was focusing so much on that village. Konoha had enough forces to defend against the other villages and attack the mist. Sure, Konoha would be spreading its shinobi thin, but at the end of the day, results mattered. And Konoha would come out as the victor because of it because of him. Kiri had a lot of islands under it and had the whole sea at its grasp. Even if Kanoha was only able to take over Kiri after the war, it would still be enough to make the other major villages cower in fear. He made sure to plant enough of a mess in Kiri's internal politics that they would gladly take anyone other than Kaido as the new Mizukich. Even if they had to submit to another nation, they would gladly do it.
That was how much he messed with the internal politics. But then things happened. His attack at the border turned into a failure, exposing his involvement, which took away all his rights. And now the third Mizukage Kaido is dead. With another Mizukage taking the seat, he knew damn well, things couldn't get any worse. There is still a chance for Konoha to take over Kiri, before Kumo or Iwa does. But, then out of the blue, Konoha declared Kiri as its ally. Here isn't that fool, does he have no backbone? Kiri, a literal backwater nation, was now their equal on paper. Kiri had a lot of clans, some of them had few clan members, but the bloodline abilities they had were extraordinary. And if Konoha was able to take over Kiri, all of them would be under Konoha's banner. They would have no choice but to listen to the Hokage's commands. His commands. Konoha was already the most powerful military force compared to others, and with Kiri soldiers amongst their ranks, it would make Konoha nigh impossible to defeat. With the largest land mass and ocean mass combined, Konoha would be a nation like no other. But of course, things did not go his way. With things taking a turn for the worse, here is in that fool he now made Kiri their ally. That meant both had equal powers. Danzo knew that Konoha gathered a reputation for being a peace-loving nation. But this was war, some hard decisions were supposed to be made here. Did the Uzumaki clan not protest his decision? Who knows, he only has a few loyal root shinobi left. Hiruzen made sure of that. Even the other elders, Kahara Yudatane and Hamura Mitakato weren't in that meeting. It seemed that Hiruzen was only keeping an eye out for all of them. Not that it mattered, Danzo was put with a very complex Uzumaki seal that would render his chakra null until removed. And it was so complicated that even Danzo knew he couldn't do anything about it. He had no chakra and messing with a seal like that could bring all the attention to him. He would have asked for Rachimaru's help. But that snake refused to cooperate with him. Even when Danzo threatened to expose all of his underground research, Arachimaru did the same to him. It seemed that the snake had gathered a few secrets that he could use against him. Danzo would have to take care of him later. For now, he would do what's right for Konoha. For Danzo Shimura was born for a glorious purpose, the rightful leader of the village. And that included him going to the land of rain. This was a last resort, but he would need to contact Hanzo the salamander, and he would need to trade well. As this would shape the future of Konoha in a new light. He didn't like it one bit that one of the root members had to carry him around, but there was no other way. Behind him three other root shinobis were following behind the first, skipping from one tree to another. One of the root shinobis was left as a decoy who had transformed into him and taken his place under house arrest. For one year, he could do nothing, and things turned for the worst. He needed to fix it, and he would fix it now. He wasn't going to just sit around while Kanoha led itself to ruin. Abito looked at what Danzo was doing and sighed. He couldn't get a break, could he? It hasn't been a week since he had to kill Kaido. And that plan took months of preparation, planning, tweaking and last-minute adjustments. And now only three days later, Danzo makes his move. But this was the perfect opportunity to kill the old bastard. Abito silently watched from his bat cave as the Shimura slipped away from his house arrest. Abito was annoyed, yes, that he had to chase after Danzo just after dealing with one cage level threat. But at the same time, he was elated. Foresight was 2020, he saw it coming from miles away. Why? Cause, he knew the stubborn kind that Danzo was. Just by stripping away his power wouldn't stop the man. The same was for the other two elders. They of course officially held their seats, but after the war started, Hiruzen made sure to give a cold shoulder to them. So of course they would make a move. And because of that, Abito had at least one of his bats monitor their movements. Abito even planted eyes on Arachimaru as well, in case the snake bites in amongst the chaos. He made sure to track all of them. Not to pat himself on the back, but Aizen could suck light Yagami's ass. Abito sipped his hot chocolate coffee. It is going all according to Kakaku. Yuahaha. And he cackled like a madman. A few distances away, Robin glanced at Nightwing, you think he has had too much coffee? Most likely. Nightwing said, where was I? Oh, yes prepare, we have another dog to hunt. The Abido bat clones gave a quick salute as they marched to ready themselves. Their target, Danzo Dog Shimura. Kakashi gasped for air as he was kneed in the diaphragm, his body shooting like a cannonball, 
destroying a tree in its path as he smashed into a large rock, creating large spider-like cracks in it. Too slow. Kakashi has barely enough strength, but his instincts kicked in at the last moment, with silver lightning dancing around his body, he vanished from the spot. Just after that, the large rock exploded, with a dust cloud. Talk about holding back, old man, Kakashi growled as he wiped the blood and spit from his mouth, making two seals with his hands. With a poof his adamantium silver sword, his summon Akito appears in his sword form, a sliver of lightning casually cracking around its blade. Huh, you complaining, brat. I thought you didn't like me holding back. Sakumo mused as he stepped and slashed his own white adamantium sword, the wind pressure driving away the dust cloud. Revealing the cage level shinobi. While Sakumo looked completely fine in his shinobi gear, Kakashi was not. Most of his training clothes were ripped, with chunks of it, either going missing or got burned during the clash. They have been at each other's throats for at least 15 minutes or so, and now exhaustion was kicking in for the 11-year-old. Ready when you are, Sakumo said, holding out his hands. Kakashi felt his eye twitch, muttering stupid old man. Before father and son dashed at each other. Silver and white clashing in electricity, battling it out on, who would reign supreme. Each clash destroyed the chunks of ground, and charred the nearby grass. The training ground was in ruins, with craters, everywhere, the ground charred in most of the spots by lightning, and the sum of the surrounding trees and wildlife getting caught in the father-son skirmish. Honestly, this was quite impressive, considering that both of them only were using their sword and lightning releases. No sane shinobi would call this a spar. It looked like father and son were out for their own blood. Mainly because Sakumo was holding back, minimally. Again the fight paused when Kakashi was hit by the blunt side of his father's blade and blasted off. With the grace of a ragdoll, he skidded the ground before Sakumo delivered a kick that made Kakashi dug a noticeable trench in his path as he finally stopped when he crashed into another tree. Yup, the old man wasn't holding back anything. The boy was about to get up but winched when his side burned. He had to grit his teeth and ignore the pain before lighting again draped around his body, his dark eyes flickering with power, and even his silver hair seemed to gain a lighter shade. Sakumo grinned. Now, that's the spirit. Don't keep your old man waiting now. Kakashi didn't say anything as he planted his sword to his side, quickly going over a few hand seals. Chider. Silver Fang. Like the name suggested the power of the silver lightning in Kakashi's hands was no joke, as he body flickered forward picking up the sword, along with him to his father's side. The speed was unheard of for most normal jonins, even more so for an underaged kid, who's not even 12. And yet Sakumo at the last moment held up one of his kunais deflecting the strike. Still, the older shinobi blinked in surprise when the sparks of silver lightning destroyed the kunai and slashed into him. Sakumo was white-eyed as he was cut in half before he smirked, and with a poof, his whole body turned into lightning, except the sword, which fell on the ground assaulting Kakashi with full force. Ugh. Kakashi halted on his knee, supporting his weight with his sword. Lightning clone substitute stupid old man and his stupid tricks. With a grunt, he stood up once again. If this was a few months ago, this kind of attack would have knocked him unconscious and maybe even given him some nasty burns, and yet, now he could stand it. All because of an experimental jutsu that his father was trying to teach him. You know I'm impressed, even I'm not that good at controlling my lightning, you might be able to complete the technique. Sakumo commented, from a few meters away, sitting on one of the large rocks that managed to survive the father and son clash. But it will take more than that if you don't want to get left behind. A few hand signs and with a poof his father's sword, Aki came back to his hand. With that he moved, going for the attack. Multiple strikes that were all aiming for weak points, but Kakashi was managing to keep up just barely with lightning fast reflexes. As the battle continued, not even Sakumo noticed that Kakashi's eye color started glowing silver. But the older shinobi didn't pay that in mind. At the same time, Kakashi felt his surroundings slow down. It was as if everything was moving at a slow pace. The exhaustion, the pain, the fatigue everything was gone. All his thoughts vanished, and he only had one purpose, and that defeating his opponent. 
and yet funnily enough, he couldn't control his body, as it moved out of the way of his father's attacks, and analyzed anything that can be used to his advantage. Even Sakumo was surprised as Kakashi's movements became smooth. He only had seen expert veterans move like that, there was no wasted movement. He grinned, that's my son. He thought. Kakashi finally found finding an opportunity and he capitalized on it, taking out a kunai from his pouch, he clashed with his father's sword, bringing it over his head, as he drove his adamantium sword in, trying to stab his old man, in his gut. Sakumo yelped suddenly getting caught off guard, he had to use one of his hands to catch the sword, before it could stab him into the stomach. But it also brought Kakashi another opportunity, and his body reacted giving a headbutt, hearing a crack as Sakumo's nose broke with his headbutt. Sakumo grunted holding his bleeding nose, taking a few steps back, and holding up his sword with his instinct to block Kakashi's next attacks. That was a wild move that wasn't expecting from his boy. But it also meant, his boy learned to be tricky. Oh, they grow up so fast. So he readied for the next assault, and yet it never came, the silver lightning around the boy died, down, and he suddenly pummeled to the floor. Gasping for breath and sweating like a pig. W what was that my body, it moved on its own. Sakumo blinked, surprised and dumbfounded. What the heck do you mean, brat? The world it slowed down, Kakashi said, panting. This wasn't the experimental jutsu that Sakumo was trying to teach Kakashi. No, it was something different. Dad, I could see all of it in slow motion. And it felt like I was in the back seat of my own body, as it started avoiding your attack and looking for opportunities. Sakumo didn't know what to say, he was still holding his broken nose, before popping it back to its place. A sometimes your instincts take over, nothing new. But anyway, you caught me off guard with whatever that was you sure you didn't steal one of two of Abido's eyes during your last mission. Kakashi gave a dirty glare to his father, who held his hands up in mock. Hey, just wanted to make sure unlike my teammates, your teammates actually care about you and can hold their own. So I don't want you to take drastic measures. And besides, you are already what was her name again. Rin, yeah, you are already playing with Rin's heart, so I was just watching out. Father. Kakashi growled, his face a shade reader. The man in question barked a laugh as he held his stomach, he winched from the pain from the wounds in his nose, and the shallow cut on his left hand. We should end the training session here. You are already doing pretty well lightning armor Sakumo said, jokes aside, your lightning armor was coming along just fine, you were even able to stand up after fully facing against my lightning clone substitute, you just need to become enough durable, and maybe gain some muscles, then you will be on your road to becoming a rakage in no time. Believe it. He even gave a signature thumbs up. Kakashi snorted. Kashina will kill you if she ever sees you doing that. What? That was a funny joke. He said, crossing his arms and pouting, you just don't get it. Uh huh. You know for a shinobi that's quite feared amongst the five nations, you really have a bad sense of humor. Kakashi said, standing up from the ground, dusting himself off. But he jolted when he suddenly felt all the pain and fatigue hit him like a train, making him wobbly. He hissed, holding his ribs. His body had gotten stronger, even with his father using the flat side of his blade, it should have cracked at least one of his ribs. Luckily, it didn't. It just goes to show how long he had come to figuring out the Reikage's jutsu. Sakumo was a lightning release user himself, and over the years had faced many lighting users in his path. But only the Reikage was someone that he couldn't beat. The large built black man that supported the muscles of a bodybuilder was the only man that could give Sakumo a challenge. It was a wonder how he could match his white fang's speed with that bulky body. It just showed how to fine tune his control over his jutsu. And taking a page out of the Achiha's books, he was trying to recreate the older man's techniques. Lighting release was always very hard to control. Control came from yin release, and power came from yang. If you try to put too much into control then you lose the power that made lightning such a dangerous element. And yet the rakage was able to coat his whole body, making the gigantic man the ultimate shield. But it didn't take away his power. It just showed how fine-tuned his control was, along with his power. He always fought unarmed, and yet people called him the strongest spear. Sakumo was never one to believe rumors. But after facing him at the border clash, 
he knew that the Rakage's techniques were no joke. The ferocity of his attacks, his cunning use of tactics, made him a tough opponent. Even with Aki in hand, Sakumo didn't manage to harm the old Rakage. The lightning armor jutsu he wondered what that kind of technique would do in the hands of a haddock. And so Sakumo was trying to pass down the knowledge of what he knew from the battles his son. His son's silver lightning was always an oddity, being more controlled than his own white lightning, and more powerful than normal blue lightning. So that was why, even if he couldn't pull the technique himself, he could at least teach his son the technique. Sakumo might be optimistic, but anything could happen in the war. So he wanted to pass down what he knew before it was too late. Frankly, with Konoha fighting against both Kumo and Iwa, he knew it wouldn't be long before he would need to fight against the Rakage once again. And that time both of them knew what would happen. Against the Rakage, honestly, it wasn't a fight. The older Cage was overpowering figure, and most of Sakumo's attacks were mere annoyance to him. He didn't fight the Rakage, no, he survived him. It happened both times. The first time, because the Kumo forces weren't trying to attack. But the second time, because Jiraiya was there, he managed to come out of it alive. It needed both him and Zaraya to hold down the Rakage. And it became obvious, the Rakage, he wasn't out for blood. No he was just stalling for time, sizing him and Jiraiya up. The Rakage was more of a tailed beast than a man. And that's what Sakumo respected about his foe. What Kakashi showed him earlier, wasn't the technique that he wanted him to learn. And yet, Sakumo wondered what Kakashi did. Slowing down one's perception with lightning release, nah. It shouldn't be possible. Sakumo thought. He was no medical nin, but knew better than anyone about lightning release. Chakra was many things, but unless you had deep control over yin release, chakra didn't affect your brain. If not, he would have fired his own years ago. It was one of the body's limiters saving you from exploding your gray matter to the world. Sakumo wondered if his boy's technique was a fluke. But who knows, he would need to look out for Kakashi, in case that happened again. Then again, even he had life and death moments when things slowed down as well. Oi, why are you waiting old man? Kakashi said, he was already wearing new clothes, replacing his tattered ones. I usually wouldn't go out for lunch before taking a shower, but I want to get things out of my head. So you coming old man? Now you go, Sakumo said, throwing his wallet at him. I have to fix my nose amongst other things Kakashi winched. Sorry eh, don't be actually I'm quite proud of you? Sakumo said, before laughing. Is it weird I'm proud of you? Anyway, it's my treat, have fun he winked with that he was gone, in a flash. Kakashi grumbled, but there was slight blush on his face. Fine, I'm going on my own. He said, grumbling stupid old man along the way. He didn't say it out loud, but he missed his father when he would go out on missions. Each mission not making it easy for him to get home, taking at least three to six months out of him. But at the same time he wondered and worried at the aspect that in his war, anything could happen. He looked at the sky, he didn't remember his mother much, but he just hoped that nothing would happen to his stupid old man. He was his only family left. Kakashi shook his head, reassuring himself that his father was strong. And if he wanted to protect his father, no better way than by being by his side. But you know after facing a literal tailed beast, his bar for strength might have had got broken. He needed to get strong fast. Even though he was getting more skilled with his lightning release, he needed to speed things up. Abito was way stronger than him. And he knew that boy had enough secrets to make even the most stingy clan elders blush. So he couldn't just sit behind. He wouldn't let that Achiha get the smug pleasure of getting one up on him. Huh, my Senju blood is acting up again. He mused as he went towards his nearest food joint. We should probably take a break, Kashina said. Your strength has been improving, you really have a knack for chakra control, don't you? And damn it's kinda scary how you move that huge thing. Rin sheepishly laughed, rubbing the back of her head. And her hand was Samahata, the shark sword. It took quite a liking to her. After the border incident, Hiruzen gave each one of them something in return. She didn't know about others, but she was gifted one of the seven swords of the mist. The Samahata. And Hiruzen gifted it knowing that Rin was good at using water jutsu. Samahata being a sentient weapon, wouldn't just take anyone as a wielder. But it seemed with time, the stubborn sword accepted Rin as the new wielder. And along with them came a lot of free perks. Rin nodded. 
The strength did improve, but I am still getting the hang of it. Using Samahata's chakra is a bit tricky. She answered, she was training for a whole year, trying to improve her ice archery and water style. But most of all, she was trying to learn the chakra enhancement techniques that improved her strength and power. The same technique that made Tsunade quite the strength beast. In fact, it was mainly Tsunade who requested her to learn the technique after seeing her match in the Chunin exams. The slug summoner would have liked to teach Rin herself, but she wasn't ready to go back to the village. More so because of the war, as she might get deployed immediately and she had already seen one war. She didn't want to see another. So that was why it was left to Kashina and Mido to teach Rin. The strength enhancement techniques that Tsunade used was actually the same technique Mido taught Kashina. It wasn't something that should have been that noteworthy, and yet Tsunade had made it her main weapon during the Second Shinobi War. So the Red Hot Habanero was trying to teach Rin about the technique. But there was a slight problem. Both Kashina and Tsunade had tons of chakra, so they could easily use the technique all the time and not get dried up. Tsunade on top of that had the Yin Seal, while Kashina had her tailed beast that could help them recover chakra faster, along with fixing their injuries. But that wasn't the case for Rin. She had a lot of chakra for her age, sure, but it wasn't anything noteworthy. That was until Samahata's perks came into play. The sword was able to store its own chakra, steal it from others and give it back to the user. And not only that, the sword was also passively trying to enlarge Rin's chakra pool. So with a bit of brainstorming, Kashina came up with a grand solution. As Samahata was able to take others' chakra and give it back to Rin, Kashina thought why not give her own chakra? And after a bit of failing and experimentation, she found the solution. It seemed that the large sword quite liked Biju chakra. Now, Biju chakra was honestly poisonous for a normal human, but this thing was a sword, so who knows. It took a lot of whining to convince the furball to lend a helping hand. And with Karama's help, things went quite smoothly from there. Now Rin could train all day without worrying about getting chakra exhaustion and completely focus on learning chakra enhancement. And it seemed Rin was also developing her own chakra pool because of Samahata and Kashina's training. So, over the one year time, Rin improved quite a lot. And she needed it. Right now, Rin was, by Kashina's estimation, around Jonin level. But compared to how Abido and Kakashi were, she needed more strength to keep up with her teammates. In a way, she was trying to balance out the team. Both Kakashi and Abido were speed freaks, so she wanted to have the upper hand on them when it comes to strength. But of course, she wouldn't be a one-trick pony, she already had a good mastery over her ice archery and water jutsus. With her added chakra pool, she could easily pull out some wide-range water jutsu and drown her opponents, or even freeze her opponents with powerful ice arrows. And that wasn't even the last of her tricks. Well, how are you adjusting to your chakra increase? She asked. Your chakra growth is quite scary, and that's coming from an Uzumaki. Samahata really knows how to help with that, huh? It's still a wonder how you were able to tame that wild sword. She chuckled. Heck, with your chakra pool, I wouldn't be surprised if you have more chakra than a Beto. Rin smiled. But he has an insane recovery speed to compensate for his average chakra pool. You know Kashina nodded. Yeah, in fact, with how fast he recovers chakra it's almost as if he never runs out of it. I still remember how Minato was dumbstruck seeing Abito's chakra recovery. Honestly, it's weird she mumbled the last part, thoughtfully. It is. Rin agreed. I can understand Kakashi cause you know, him being part Senju. He has a massive chakra pool. But Abito well, he's in Ichiha. A you are forgetting technically he is also quarter Senju because of his grandma. But if he had a massive chakra pool, then it would have made sense. But the recovery hmm, I have to ask him one day on how he can recover so fast. Kashina said. Well, don't expect an answer Abito likes his secrets to be well, secret. Rin said, while Kashina laughed. He's in Ichiha it would be weird if he didn't. She said, actually that might be the only thing that he has in common with his emo clanmates. Rin laughed. I'm gonna find a way to tell him that to his face. You do that. Kashina smiled. You know what Abito kind of reminds me of Arachimaru. Rin blinked several times, looking at her. Nothing against the snake Sanon, but I don't find Abito to be creepy. No, not in that way I mean, Abito is smart and has secrets. 
But at the same time, he isn't creepy and knows how to crack jokes, she then snapped her head back to Rin. Oh, my god. Why didn't I figure it out sooner? Figure what out? Rin tilted her head. Your whole team is a much more stable and sane version of the original three Sanin. Abito because he's smart like Orochimaru on figuring things out, but not creepy, Kakashi because he's got the same hair as Jiraiya, but isn't a skirt chaser, and you because you punch strong, but at the same time aren't an alcoholic. Rin deadpanned at her teacher and sighed. Shaking her head she said, I'm nowhere near Lady Tsunade. She's awesome and I'm me. She said mainly about her skills, but then looked at her not too developed chest just for a second. Unfortunately, Kashina was able to see it. Hey, don't worry about it you will grow a pair, just drink milk, it worked for me. Kushane said, puffing her chest as her assets bounced. Rin opened her mouth to say something but stopped. You know what, I'm not even gonna try to explain how wrong it is. And I'm a qualified medical ninja, thank you. Stop being a smartass. It works. Kashina protested, believe it. She said, and giving a thumbs up. Kanoha was in an uproar and why wouldn't it be? Just after Kiri and Kanoha's alliance was declared, something came up that riled most, if not all the clans in Kanoha. All the clans of Kanoha had complaints about two certain elders. And they wanted their heads. Currently, a large number of shinobi from all of the clans were gathered around the Hokage Tower for answers. Even the Anbu and Kanoha police force was finding it hard to keep them at bay, as all of the protesters were active shinobi. The situation in Kanoha was not good at all. What is the meaning of this? Hiruzen shouted as the two elders were brought in front of him. To use my trust and to go behind my back. Hamura, Kaharu, why did you do this? He then tossed the pile of paper onto his teammates' faces. The two elders in question flinched as the pile of papers hit their bodies, scattering into the room. Each paper had a lot of details on how over the years, the two elders had sabotaged some of Kanoha's clan shinobi, to either clear out a passage for clanless shinobi or for their own benefits. Of course, the latter was most prominently highlighted on them. Along with how they even joined hands with other villages to assassinate them. And the scroll that held the information came with proof. It would have been bad if it was only Hiruzen that got it, but no. Whoever exposed the two elders had given every clan leader their own copies. And all things considered, even Hiruzen was surprised that they got away with so much behind his back. Sure he might be less surprised if it was Danzo who did that, he was an active shinobi with his own Anbu squad. But Hamura and Kaharu retired years ago, right after the second war. And they were mostly busy with civilian council duties, like building the road, or clearing the merchant routes and other mundane stuff. So for them to do this much, was staggering even for him. And it just made Hiruzen question if he really was worthy for the seat of Hokage. Hiruzen, this is quite bad, Tarifu, who was by his side, spoke. The clan leaders want recompensation for the damages we have to do something. And he wasn't siding with his one-time friends either, there were many Akamichi who lost their lives due to their involvement as well. And for what, to bring up no-named clanless shinobi. If clanless shinobis had talent then they would be like Minato, Jiraiya or Arachimaru. Who gave them the right to harm their own shinobi for such reasons? Just give their heads on a pike, this should calm everyone down. Sakumo who was sitting on another chair beside Hiruzen said. Mind your tongue, boy. Hamura Mitakato said, glaring at the white fang through his glass. Don't boy me, you old fart. You folks aren't even a decade older than me, so shut it. Sakumo growled, pointing at him. You forget that I'm also the acting leader of the Senju clan with Tsunade's leaving, and you are quite literally responsible for killing at least a dozen of my clan members. We, as shinobi, took an oath to protect our village and its members. And I have no respect for oath breakers, not even when they are the favorite students of my dear old absent father. Even Hiruzen flinched from the killing intent that radiated from Sakumo. But he had to stop it, before things got any more disastrous. Calm yourself down, Sakumo-senpai. Jiraiya said, trying to calm him down. Even though Sakumo and Jiraiya had a bit of an age difference, both Shinobis had a good bond due to the missions they had done over the years. They were brothers in arms, so Jiraiya could somewhat understand the feeling. Arachimaru, who was at the side, didn't say anything, but was just frowning. He only knew a few people that had access to that amount of dirt on the Kanoha civilian elders. 
Even he didn't have that amount of evidence against the civil elders. The only one that could have been was Danzo. But the man was on house arrest, why would he do that, when he was sure Kaharu and Hamura also had lists of his bad deeds? It was just downright confusing him. Danzo had no reason to out them, not now. In the room, other than the two convicted village elders and the Hokage, Sakumo, Jiraiya, Arachimaru and lastly Shikaku Nara were present. The other clan elders were specially kept out in case they took measures into their own hands. Kagami was not present due to the mission he had to subjugate one of Kiri's Jinchurikas. Yugura, who didn't want to stay under the newly appointed fourth Mizukage, Manjetsu Hazuki. As the young Jinchuriki was much more powerful than him in terms of ability. That's why Kagami was tasked to provide help to the young Mizukage in dealing with the situation. This is quite the mess, Hokage-sama, Shikaku said. The scar-faced Nara was thinking over the situation. I might sound a bit radical, but I think we might have to take extreme measures if we want to quell the anger of the clan heads. This why can't things just get better? Finally, things were starting to calm down, and now this happens? Harrison said, massaging his forehead. He had a heavy heart as he knew what he might have to do. With all the evidence that was now public knowledge. Everyone knew that public execution would be a merciful answer. But still even with all the crimes they did. The village elders did a lot for the village, and they were his once teammates that were willing to give their lives to save his. Being Hokage was no easy task. Hiruzen might have wanted to say more, but stopped when suddenly Minato appeared, having teleported from the hung tri kunai that was in the office. And he looked a bit pale. Now what? Hiruzen thought internally, already getting a bad feeling. Hokage-sama, Danzo he he fled from the village, Minato said. The silence in the room spoke all. What do you mean he escaped? Tarifu asked. Wasn't the Yuzumaki sealing squad put on the task of monitoring his seal if he even stepped out of his house? They were but somehow Danzo was able to put a decoy that messed up the sealing formula of the Yuzumaki. And his last known location before he broke the seal was outside the border of the land of fire. Minato explained, he then handed out a small paper for the Hokage. It read Hiruzen, know this, everything I ever did was for the village. But now, I see no future in it, so I will destroy it from inside and out. I was always the shadow of Kanoha, but with you as the leader, it would never improve. So I have taken measures into my own hands. Know this, it is all your fault. This is bad, Jiraiya said, he was also able to read the letter. Did anyone else aside from you and the sealing squad know this? No, sensei, they don't. Minato shook his head. I didn't want this news to leak out when there is already panic on one account in the village. His eyes brushed over the elders. Also when we tried to question the decoy he left, he killed himself after giving me the letter. He also said something along the lines of, Danzo-sama will have his revenge. Before dying. Jiraiya then looked at Hiruzen. Saratobi sensei do you know what Danzo is planning? A high-ranking shinobi like him. Who knows how many secrets he knows now he is actively declaring war on Kanoha. It was that bastard's fault. Kaharu, for the first time, spoke. He was the one that outed us, that snake. And now, he betrays Noha. She gritted her teeth and looked at Hamura. I told you to not trust him Arachimaru's eyes gleamed, connecting the dots. So, it would appear that you guys had something to do with his escape. He said, before he acted surprised. Wait, was it all Danzo's plan to make you guys the bait, while he escaped from Kanoha? Now, with all these things going on my, my Danzo, he is quite the schemer isn't he? Skikaku Nara was also shocked. If the whole village is already in a state of panic, then it would be unwise to reveal that Danzo had fled the village. Meaning yes, we got played, Kaharu spoke again, and she was angry. Which was a bit uncharacteristic of her, since she mostly stayed calm, it was almost as if something was causing her to have this type of reaction. A certain toxin. But I'm not going to go down alone if it happens. She then took out a scroll from her dress, making all the present shinobi stay on guard in case she does anything. Wait, Kaharu, Hamura said. Are you sure you want to expose Danzo like this what if this is a misunderstanding? Think rationally. He blurted out, surprised by what he said. Why did he say that out loud? He didn't want to say it. You still want to cover that fool's ass you have gone senile Hamura. Kaharu said. And it resulted in two things, first, 
The surrounding Shinobas got a bit less tense that it wasn't some paper bomb. And second, Minato appeared right in front of the village elders and took the scroll to himself before teleporting away. The Namikas quickly checked the scroll for any bombs, and when he found nothing he handed it over to Hiruzen. It had a seal on it, so it couldn't be opened unless it was authorized. Kaharu, open the seal, Hiruzen ordered, and his chakra flared up. The atmosphere grew heavy and there was no room for arguing. The retired Kanoichi complied and opened the scroll. And Hiruzen opened it to see what was inside. And what he found shocked the Hokage to the core. He knew Danzo had done things behind his back. But not this much. Kidnapping, blackmailing, assassination, running full orphanages that produce children for his root, just how far have you fallen, Danzo? Tarifu said, the list of things he did was much more heinous than the two elders that were still in front of them. We will think of Danzo later, let's deal with these two first. With his being already out of the border, we can't do anything now. Sakumo said, before looking at Hiruzen. I have to say Hokage-sama, I didn't know the village had this many traitors. Not in the upper ranks at that. Hiruzen looked down in shame, he couldn't say anything. Just how did this happen? And that's not even half of it, Kaharu said, before looking at Sakumo. You say some pretty strong words, boy, but think about it. Years ago when you were convicted of not being able to retrieve the Byakugan from those Iwa Shinobis. Who was it that wanted your death? It was Danzo, in case you forgot, we were all on your side wanting to excuse your simple mission failure, but he didn't. He pushed for your execution. Why? Did it ever cross your mind that he wanted to get rid of you? Along with your son? Everyone, even Hamura, was surprised. Because both him and Kaharu knew that Danzo had no involvement in that incident. Sure, Danzo wanted Sakumo to be executed, but it was because he viewed him as a threat to the Hokage position. And there was nothing about him targeting the White Fang's son. But then Hamura realized what Kaharu was trying to do. She was trying to divert the young Senju leader's attention to Danzo, away from them. So he kept his mouth shut and nodded, playing his part as well. Yes, it is unfortunate. But we found out quite late that he had a connection to the previous Hyuga clan head to kill you off, in fact, he might have leaked your info and set up the whole failure in the first place. Now it was Sakumo who released a suffocating amount of killing intent. The man was shaken to the core, for all he did for the village, he could have been killed years ago if Kagami didn't arrive in time with evidence. And the bastard even tried to target his son, even Hiruzen looked pale from the revelation. How could Danzo try to kill their sensei's only son, and even target his grandson? Meanwhile, Arachimaru found the whole thing hilarious on how each elder were throwing each other into the fire, just to get one angry Senju's attention off of them. He also knew that Danzo had nothing to do with that incident, but he could understand why. Sakumo was powerful, more so than him and Jiraiya. After Hiruzen, everyone knew it was either Sakumo or Kagami who was the strongest in the village. So he could understand the why bit. Still, it baffled him that Danzo would actively declare his war against Kanoha. This could get bad if he exposed his secrets as well. Sensei. Jiraiya looked at Hiruzen. We have to do something about that traitor, immediately. Even when ignoring the crimes he committed. To put blame on Sakumo senpai that man was willing to kill one of Kanoha's best shinobi for his own gain. And to even target little Kakashi? And now he even declares war against Kanoha? Yes? Tarifu slammed his fist on the table, agreeing. We have to take action immediately. That one-eyed bastard. To betray our trust and now he's actively going against Kanoha. You all don't need to, Sakumo spoke. I will go find him and kill that traitor myself that time. Everyone in the village was against me I, I was even willing to kill myself so that my blame wouldn't fall upon my son. But this? Almost everyone in the room looked at Sakumo with a bit of sympathy. Those who knew the first two Hokage knew that while Sakumo was Tabarama's son, his attitude was more out in the open like Hashirama. Then, Senpai, take me with you. Jiraiya said, before glaring at Hiruzen. We have to put an end to him before he does more damage. Who knows what kind of sensitive information he would sell to the other villages to save his own skin. That kind of man shouldn't be kept alive. I, for once, agree with Jiraiya on this one, Arachimaru said, seriously. Inside he was cackling like a madman. Killing Danzo would bring him many benefits, he didn't want to end up like the two elders himself. 
The sooner the man was killed, the better. Danzo had his secrets, other than him no one knew about the illegal experiments he had done under Root. Not the two foolish elders, not Hirazan, not anyone. So him dying was a great way to clear out any obstacles in his path. And he needed to die, now that Danzo had declared himself as Kanoha's enemy. He might try to even expose his secrets to Hirazan. He couldn't let that happen. Hirazan sighed with a heavy heart, but stilled himself. Then I, as Hokage, deem Danzo Shimura as a missing nin. And is to either be killed on sight or brought back to the village for further questioning. While this was happening, Abito was laughing his ass off in his bat cave. He had done it. His plan worked. He played all of them like puppets. My years of planning actually worked in the end. Some might wonder how he pulled it off. Well, it wasn't easy. But it worked out in the end. Abito was the one who delivered the scrolls to all the clan heads. Scrolls that contained info on both Kaharu and Hamura's dirty deeds. It was tough, sure, Danzo did lock out all the info on both Kaharu and Hamura in his secret base. And honestly, Abito wouldn't have gotten it because he didn't know where the old bastard hid it. But when Danzo wanted to get out of Kanoha, he had made a crucial mistake, he had taken out all the info to blackmail his fellow elders. It was there where Abito made his bats copy every single paper and take all of the info for himself. And with that, he added a few things, mixing in a few lies, while deducting others. He also put Danzo's decoy in a very potent Jinjutsu, good thing Kagami wasn't here, or he might have been able to figure it out. This was a last minute touch, so was the threat letter. And that wasn't all. To make sure his plan worked, he needed to have some control over the two civilian elders' actions. Luckily for him, both Kaharu Yudatane and Hamura Mitakato were only elite Jonin caliber shinobi. Putting them in a good Jinjutsu wasn't an option, mainly with how many close quarter seals they had on their bodies. But Jinjutsu isn't the only way one can control someone. Abito chuckled, sipping his coffee as he pushed back his sunglasses on his face, as it reflected the light of the lab. With this, you shall face your doom. He laughed maniacally. Robin and Nightwing who was by Abito's side sighed. Pulling all-nighters wasn't doing anything good for their summoner's mental health it seemed. But even they had to say, Abito had done a lot of planning for this to work. Abito had drugged Kaharu and Hamura with fear toxin, a potent amount. He did that a day before exposing their schemes. With Nightwing's delayed ability he had control over when they would get the effects. For Kaharu, it was easy, Abito only affected her subconscious emotions, giving her blind anger. That was the reason why she was angry and made a hasty decision. And for Hamura, well, Abito used his own secondary toxin ability that he had unlocked. It couldn't be used that well in battle, as it wasn't that strong enough yet. But it was enough to make the man blunder out his thoughts and speak his mind. So, Abito's fear toxin's second ability was in fact truth. With it, Abito could make the victim speak their mind, even if he or she was unwilling. The added part of Kaharu lying about Danzo's involvement with Sakumo's case years ago was just a benefit. He had to quickly turn off Amura's toxin effect then or else he might blunder. But luckily he did. And now they really bought it. And what was even funnier was that Arachimaru got what was happening and nodded along with it. Huh, that snake bastard thinks he will be free. Heh, like I will let that happen. Now, it was onto the second part of his plan. And that was killing Danzo. But, first things first, that is damage control. The Achiha compound was mostly empty, almost all of the active shinobi were not in the compound. The upper ranking members were all in the Naka shrine for an emergency meeting, while the rest of the active Achiha shinobi were doing their duty as the Kanoha police force. The underground room was full of people. All of the clan members sat on the ground, in front of them was their clan leader Fugaku Achiha. Almost all of them had complaints about the recent events, some felt angry, and some felt betrayed. Each clan head received scrolls containing all the misdeeds the two elders had done over the years. And the amount of Achiha shinobi that had either gone missing or killed because of the elders' schemes was no small amount. Many had lost their family members due to the elders. And everyone wanted revenge. Of course, Abito had left out half of the deeds that Kaharu and Hamura had done with Achiha shinobi. But it was done for a purpose, his clanmates were already a wild bunch, no need to give them more reason to go mad with revenge. 
Still, Abito had underestimated the clan's reaction. They were still angry about what had happened, but it was still repairable. This was why the clan leader of Ichiha called in the meeting. Fugaku-sama, give us the order, we will take our elite members and kill those sick elders. One of the higher ranking members of the Ichiha said. An eruption of cheers with flaring Sharingas appeared. Yes, we will burn their homes and kill their clan members for what they did to us. Said another. Even though the convicted village elders didn't have any children, they did have relatives and they were also going to receive scrutiny. Even though it might sound cruel, from the reports, almost a hundred Acheha, their clan members, died because of the two elders. And that was not adding the fact that Abito tampered with the reports to cut the numbers in half, and not adding what Danzo did for his own cause. We should kill them where they stand. How dare they betray our trust, even the Hokage will have to answer for allowing such filthy men to be his advisors. Another eruption of cheers occurred. Fugaku who was silent for most of the time, finally opened his eyes, his three Tomo Sharingan spun taking on a new pattern that seemed like a pinwheel. There were several gasps in the audience as they looked in fear at Fugaku's eyes. The Manjiku Sharingan. One of them said. A name that was legendary among the Achiha and their clan leader had it. And Fugaku finally spoke. We Achiha will do no such thing. The Hokage will make a proper decision and we will follow it. He said. We are tasked with the security of the village. Even though now there are other clans joining the Achiha police force, we are still the ones that are in charge. With the deeds of the two elders exposed, it won't be long before some people get the bright idea to do something foolish. If we don't get our act straight then Kanoha will suffer. No one spoke, one because they were baffled that Fugaku had the legendary Manjiku. Its power was immense, unmatched, and they could feel the fear crawling on their skins. No wonder those eyes were feared. And second, because they weren't expecting Fugaku to side with the village. One of them managed to speak, but clan leader what about what they did? The lives of our people that were lost due to their scheming. There is always a time to act, but that time is not now. Fugaku said. Also, I have solid information that the main culprit that we should worry about is not Kaharu or Hamura, but Danzo Shimura. The elder that's rumored to be the reason why the war started? One of them asked. What did he do? From what my sources tell me he escaped his house arrest, and he spread information regarding the two elders to create civil unrest among the clans, while he makes deals with the other villages. He even declared war on Kanoha before leaving. Fugaku said. Now all of the Achiha present didn't know how to take the news. But it made sense, why would someone expose such crimes to the public if there wasn't any benefit in it? Fugaku continued. His crimes against our clans are more severe as you all know, he was the most outspoken about our clan from the very beginning. And if we act out of line now, we will only prove his words right. He then looked over the Achiha. I was bestowed with the power of Manjekyo for a reason to make the clan great again. I'm confident in taking on the Hokage. But then what? It will be like the Mist Village, Konoha will fall, and everything will be in chaos do we really want that? The audience didn't know what to say. Their clan leader was confident in taking on the Hokage, the strongest cage in this generation. The power of Manjikyu was mighty indeed. But his later words also gave them an alarm on the subject. Acting up now would mean no good for them or the village. It will only expose their weakness for the enemies to pounce upon. That was not something they wanted right now. For all its worth, the Achiha might have prided themselves on the clan, but they also loved the village. They only disagreed on the one who was ruling it. The traitor Danzo he has done many deeds while he was an elder. And I don't know of the details, but it seems that Sakumo Haddock Senju is going to personally take care of him, along with the Toad Sage Jureya. Fugaku said. There was another period of silence amongst the audience. Whatever Danzo did to put off the White Fang that was truly foolish. His death was now near confirmed. We will send some of our own trained shinobi to aid in capturing the traitor. And I'm here to mainly talk about that. The Achiha clan leader said, his voice had authority in it. And there was no room for discussion. Fugaku took out a scroll, a small ceiling scroll. With a puff, something appeared out of it. It was a black glove with red markings. While some of them were confused by what it was, some were able to recognize it. 
These are ignition gloves Fugaku said. This not only will boost any fire release jutsu by 20 to 30 percent, but it can also be used to create D-rank explosions with it. I have tested them myself. Some of you might be familiar with Abito using them in Chunin exams. He was kind enough to share the secrets with us. Abito Ichiha. Every Ichiha knew of that name. A boy that isn't even 12, yet was the clan's prodigy. Well, one of them at least. They still had Kana and Ken. Still, Abito was different. Getting trained by Hirazin personally, there were open rumors on how Hirazin was trying to make him a Hokage candidate for the fifth seat. He was the pride of the Achiha in a way. But at the same time, his disinvolvement with the clan's activities was also of concern to those loyal to the clan only. Abito was only able to make 10 of them, something to do with taking a lot of funds to gather materials and being foolproof enough to not be taken apart and used by shinobis from other villages, Fugaku said, almost casually. But anyway, some of you might be a bit happy to know that only the users of Sharingan will be able to use them. Even if some of them were a bit hesitant about Abito and where his loyalty lied. They were very eager to get their hands on the ignition gloves. To boost any fire jutsu by 20 to 30 percent was no joke. With this in their hands, they would beat any Saratobi in fire jutsus, and that was saying something. With this the Achiha could truly be called the clan of fire. I have one question clan leader. It was one of the old Achiha, an elder of the clan, spoke. He was previously a Manjikyu Sharingan user, but now he was blind. Still, with his senses, he was able to see things better than normal shinobi. Even if time took its toll on him. Why did the boy not inscribe the fire release boost earlier? Sure, it took time to build the gloves, but a simple tattoo like the Anbu on our clan's shoulder or arm would do better. Casting a D-rank jutsu by a snap of a finger is good, but with the tattoo, it would also be permanent, unlike the gloves whom does this mean the boy doesn't trust us? The other members of the clan looked at the elders. His words were too close on hitting the mark. But Fugaku spoke, it's nothing like that, Izomo-sama. He said. The boy only fears that a permanent tattoo will make us more like the Hyuga clan. He said. While I might see it not happening now, but in the future, a future clan leader of Achiha might come and tamper with the seal for his own gain, and then the Achiha clan will be divided. Hearing his reply the old elder nodded. And the other members of the clan also agreed. They didn't want to end up like the Hyuga clan. To do that to one's own family, they felt sick even thinking of it. Though there were rumors that the new clan head was trying to abolish the seals. If that is all, then I would like to end the meeting here. Rather than focusing on elders that have already betrayed the village, the Achiha clan will uphold their duties and protect Kanoha from internal and external threats. Fugaku said. For the glory of the clan. For the glory of Kanoha. With that, the slogan was cheered among the crowd. For the glory of the clan. For the glory of Kanoha. For the glory of the clan. For the glory of Kanoha. When Fugaku left the Naka shrine, he couldn't help but smile. He was really glad that Abito's plan worked. Now the Achiha clan was focusing on other things than a revolt. As clan leader, he knew how his clan members tended to be over the top when it came to emotions, particularly revenge. But now wasn't the time for that. Amongst other things, Fugaku knew doing something irrational won't bring any good results. The Hokage would declare the public execution of the two elders any day now. The crimes were just being investigated a bit for the sake of investigation. Danzo will also be declared a missing nin by then. The only reason Hirazin wasn't doing it right now was because he knew Danzo had spies in the village and they might somehow inform Danzo, which the Hokage didn't want. Along with Sakumo and Jureya, a few elites from other clans also joined in the missing Nin hunt. God knows how many secrets an elder like Danzo possessed. If the man was somehow able to sell that information to other villages, he could get immunity in that village and live there the rest of his life. He needed to be stopped, or even better, killed. Fugaku wondered why he wasn't killed a year ago, when his involvement with the border incident was confirmed. The answer was simple. Hirazin was a bit weak when it came to personal relationships. Everyone knew that, and the Achiha clan members were fed up with it. And that was why Fugaku had to lie about him having the Manjikyu Sharingan. It was just a wide-scale Jinjutsu, one of Kagami's techniques. Fugaku knew he was nowhere near the level of Kagami Achiha, let alone Hirazin. 
But with this, the clan would be assured that their leader was strong. And they could find safety in that. Fugaku mused that all of it was the idea of a 12-year-old brat. No wonder why Hiruzen wants him to be the fifth Hokage. But Abito seemed adamant on making little Itachi the fifth one. Fugaku didn't know if it was a joke or if he was being serious. But he found it quite amusing how almost all of the capable shinobi that deserved to be Hokage tended to skip the seat. Even though Minato was getting considered for the seat of the fourth Hokage, along with Arachimaru. Personally Fugaku thought that Lord Jureya would have been a better candidate. But he was someone who didn't want responsibility. Some of his clan members also wanted him as the fourth Hokage, but he wasn't strong enough. He did have contribution, but he didn't have the strength that was needed to be a cage. Or at least Kanoha's cage. Fugaku was undoubtedly a cage-level shinobi, even if he didn't have the Manjikyu Sharingan. But he wasn't strong enough like Minatao and the others. And Kanoha needed the strongest cage to pull things through and keep the clans in check. As clan leader, he wouldn't be called to directly participate in the war. So, his secret of the fake Manjikyu Sharingan was safe for the time being. Still, with how much his clan members looked up to him. He would need to be more serious with his own training. In case something happens. He, Ken had suffered for it, and that was enough. If he wasn't so weak back then, his father and mother would have survived the ambush, that was also the reason why he loved his little brother so much. And when Fugaku got to his home, he found none other than his brother, Ken Achiha. And he sighed. Really? Sighing? You act as if I'm not here? Ken said. Fugaku tried not to roll his eyes, he was the clan leader after all. He had to keep an image. Why have you come here? He did love his brother, but with his brother being so much younger than him, a decade in age gap he could be quite annoying. Ken stood up and walked towards him. Because you didn't tell me that you had the Manjekyo Sharingan? How did you awaken it anyway? Fugaku said nothing. You are not ready for this Ken. He said softly. Stop acting like I'm a kid. Fugaku blinked, before an amused smile dawned on his face. Well, stop acting like one. Ken grumbled, like a kid, and then glared at him. Also, what is this he took out a pair of ignition gloves? Why did that jackass give me this tell him I don't want his stupid gloves? Fugaku sighed. Pride will take you nowhere he said, before narrowing his eyes, not when you are still weak. Ken visibly flinched, if it wasn't obvious, he didn't like being called weak. Make no mistake, Ken, Fugaku said, kneeling down to his brother's eye level and poking him on the forehead. You are just as much a prodigy as a Beto. You are not even 10 and you are already a Jonan. Even Sakumo's kid wasn't one at that age. You just need to be patient. Fine, Ken grumbled, his cheeks a bit red. It was so easy for the boy to be embarrassed when his brother was praising him. But I don't need his gloves sure I'm one of the elite members of the police force, but criminals don't take me seriously, with or without the gloves. Fugaku shook his head. You were always a bit jealous of Abito. He said, and before Ken could say something he continued. Don't try denying that, but at the end of the day, you are clan members, when given a choice I'm sure you both will sacrifice each of your lives for the clan and the village. Think of this as him offering an olive branch for you. Your fire release is already powerful, just imagine what it will be with the glove. Don't let your emotions blind you Ken, you are better than this. Ken nodded. He didn't like Abito, but he will take this. Who knows maybe he was wrong about Abito all along. What poor Ken didn't know was that his particular set of ignition gloves held a tracker and recorder to monitor his every movement. All for the sake of a better future. Danzo Shimura was free, the chakra seals were now removed. He could use his ninjutsu again. He was a free man now. And he wanted to stay that way. Taking away the ability to use chakra for a shinobi is one of the cruelest things one can do for a shinobi. Paranoia naturally came with the profession of a ninja. And without Chakra, Shinobi felt vulnerable, they became paranoid as if danger would jump out from every corner at any second if they weren't paying attention. And for a near-cage-level Shinobi like Danzo, it was even more damning. But he was free now. Danzo ran through the deserts and barren lands of his own country, with his four-root Shinobi with him. He could have just used his giant bird summon to give him and his whole group a ride, but he didn't. He was in no hurry. For the one-eyed former elder of Kanoha wanted to enjoy the moment. 
because it might soon be his last. Danzo was no fool. He had been in war, the first one and the second one. So, with how things were going bad every damn time for the past year, he knew things could end badly for him. He could die, or even worse be outcasted from his own village. So he had to prepare for the worst. Like any other student of Tabarama Senju, he loved the village. Even now, he would rather give his own life than to sell its secrets to the enemy. Hiruzen knew that so even if he found out that he escaped his house arrest, he believed that his old friend will not make any rash decisions. He might have not done the best of things, but he had done things that were necessary for the village. It was Hiruzen who was too narrow-minded to see his approach. He would make Kanoha great again. Allying with a literal backwater nation like the Mist. That fool. That country has less manpower than Hanzo the Salamander. The new Mizukage was nothing but a kid who was put as a puppet leader by his own clan, not even a cage-level shinobi. And Kanoha was allying with them. Sure, Kiri was the third largest nation after Kanoha and Suna, but still. Their shinobi manpower was downright idiotic. Of course, there were benefits as Iwa and Kumo momentarily stopped acting aggressive towards Kanoha. But they will come with full force later. It would have been better if Kanoha invaded Kiri instead and took it over rather than allying with them. It would have shown Kanoha's might to the fools that dared to harm the land. But Danzo was going to fix this. Even if it meant his death. Danzo created Root to be in Kanoha's shadow. He had done everything for it, and yet in just one year, his own army was reduced to only 20 in number. The reason for him creating Root was for mindless brainwashed soldiers that were willing to take on suicidal missions, where other normal shinobi passed on. Danzo believed that shinobi didn't need emotions or self-thinking, they just needed to follow orders. He had done everything, even brainwashing some of his younger clan members for the cause, and over the years it brought results. Some might call his method cruel or brutal, but he deemed it necessary. No one was willing to do the dirty work, so he needed to step up. Like always. Kanoha needed him. Danzo internally chuckled as he made his way to the land of rain. A megaker. His main reason for going there was simple, to convince Hanzo the salamander into joining hands with Kanoha. Creating an alliance with the land of fire. Hanzo once, a mighty shinobi, was declining in health. Not many knew about it, but Danzo did. His root shinobi weren't all in Kanoha, no, he spread them all around the shinobi world over the years, some of them sitting at jonin positions in other villages. That is how he gathered the biggest spy network in history. And he called all of them out of hiding in order to deal with this situation. It was an emergency, Kanoha needed to join forces with a megaker if they wanted to survive the full assault of Iwa and Kumo. Hanzo needed some help. And he would do that as a representative of Kanoha, in doing so, Hanzo would ally with Kanoha in the war. He would make sure of it. With this, Hiruzen was bound to clear out all charges against Danzo. And give him his powers back. The Land of Rain might not be a major nation. But it had history, and was between three other major villages. Everyone wanted that land. In fact in some ways, it was better than the Mist. The Mist no longer had any powerful shinobi. But AIM had Hanzo, who was feared and respected by many. And with this, Kanoha would have Kiri and Rain in its back pocket. Taking over the other major nations would be child's play. If the alliance between Rain and Kanoha is established, he was sure the Sand would want to join in as well. Then Kumo and Iwa would surely make a frantic decision to attack Kanoha. And then, even if Hiruzen wanted to end the war peacefully, it won't happen. Kanoha would easily be able to dominate its enemies and take them over. Sure, it would take time, but Danzo expected if the war stretched out long enough, a decade or so, then Kanoha would come out as the leading victor. Only then could Kanoha achieve its ultimate power. This will be a war to end all wars. Danzo would make sure of that. But for now, he had to reach the land of rain first. Time passed and Danzo and his four Anbu regrouped with all the remaining members of Root who he called upon from the other villages. They were a day away from a Megaker. Hanzo didn't know that Danzo was still under house arrest for treason. He had sent letters to the man telling him that he was coming here as a representative of Kanoha. So he had to bring a good force to sell that lie. And he had a total of 20 Root Shinobis with him. With all of them here, it would be easy to sell the lie. 20 Jonin level shinobi was no joke. He could have added three others, but he left them in Kanoha. 
one was for his decoy, the other two for sending him updated news on the current affairs of Konoha in case something happened. With 20 root shinobi armed and dressed, Danzo also wore new shinobi clothes. His right eye was patched with bandages as he wore a green kimono and his Konoha headband. With a whole year of not using his chakra, he was weak. Also, he was one eye short. His original right eye was taken from him when he was in the first shinobi war. After that, he had transplanted a Sharingan into his eye. But when he was in house arrest, everything related to chakra was taken from him. Even the Sharingan. Of course, Hiruzen was angry and downright frustrated that Danzo secretly had one of the Dejutsu. But the cage didn't make the news public. Still, without the Sharingan, and the one nifty ability of it, Danzo felt quite vulnerable. And transplanting a new Sharingan now would take a bit of time, time that he didn't want to waste. Hopefully, he wouldn't be fighting anyone. With that, Danzo and his route entered the land of rain. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.